morning ladies and gentlemen it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural function of our two day bodhi international online conference on innovation in english language literature and culture this academic conference is organized by the department of english national educational societies ratnam college of arts science and commerce and the bodhi international journal of research in humanities arts and science NES Ratnam College of Arts Science and Commerce affiliated to the University of Mumbai and reaccredited consecutively thrice with an A grade by NAC was established in 1983 and has since then steadily evolved to establish itself as one of the leading institutions of NAC higher education in Mumbai the college received best college award from the University of Mumbai and DBT Star Status Award by the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, New Delhi. Ratnam College occupies a place of pride among the 65 institutions of the NES SBB Group, founded by Dr. Or Varadrajan. The college is the result of vision. and pioneering efforts of the founder president who put his heart and soul into realizing his mission to make quality higher education accessible to the poor and underprivileged sections of society the college aims at inclusive education with emphasis on holistic development of the students by providing quality education and preparing them to contribute to social development The Bodhi International Journal of Research in Humanities, Arts and Science is an online peer-reviewed referred and quarterly journal. The journal is committed to bring together academicians, research scholars and students from all over the world who strive professionally to upgrade academic careers and to benefit society with their innovative ideas. The journal also aims at promoting in the disciplinary studies in the field of humanities arts and science it is an admitted and widely acknowledged fact that literature is a reflection of the society with its good values and its tribulations this international conference provides an interdisciplinary forum for the presentation of innovative views and research oriented results This conference is an academic venue for scholars and research students from relevant disciplines to enhance their research on innovations in English language literature and culture. The conference will bring together leading academic scientists, researchers and scholars in the domain of interest from around the world. to begin this nagal function of the two day bodhi international online conference i like to invite ms sumali bose head department of english nes ratnam college of arts science and commerce to deliver the welcome address thank you jitin a very good morning to all of you i on behalf of nes ratnam college of arts science and commerce mumbai and bodhi international journal of research in humanities arts and science an online peer reviewed referred refereed and quarterly journal is pleased to welcome you all to the two day bodhi international online conference on innovations in english language literature and culture pandemic is reshaping the researchers and through the virtual mode giving remarkable opportunities to contribute in the field of literature these two days will be dedicated to cover a wide spectrum of themes related to language literature and culture and each one of us will definitely be benefited from fruitful enriching discussions exchange of views and share experiences with other high level professors colleagues and friends representing many well known universities and research institutes together with members of relevant international organizations a glance through the list of presentations planned for the next two days reveals 
the amazing diver diversity of literature. Even though this conference is the marker of the success of our institution, it also allows us to meet some of the brilliant minds of the country and abroad. For this, I thank our patrons, that is founder president of NES and SVB group of 67 institutions, Dr. R. Vardarajan, and our director, Dr. Bala Subramaniam V, for enriching and providing opportunities to us always. I take great pride in welcoming and thanking our principal, Dr. Mrs. Mary Vimochna, Vice Principal, Dr. Mrs. Vinita Dhulia, and Dr. Lata Swaminathan of NES Ratnam College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Mumbai, for their motivation in every endeavor of my, de of my department. I heartily welcome Dr. S. Raja Rajan, Assistant Professor of English, Kanji, Mamuniva Government Institute for Postgraduate Studies and Research, Puducherry, for presiding over the function. I welcome Chairperson Dr. K. Kavya Rasu, Editor Roots International Journal, India, and Assistant Professor of English, Vivekananda College, Kanyakumari, Tamil Nadu, and Resource Person Dr. Mani Mangai, Mani Senior, Le uh, Mani Senior Lecturer, Department of English, Faculty of Modern Languages Com and Communication, from University Putra, Malaysia, as keynote speakers. I'm equally delighted to welcome chairperson for plenary session, Dr. C. Arun, Assistant Professor, PG Department of English, Government Arts and Science College, Rilapuram, Tamil Nadu, Dr. B. J. Gita, Associate Professor of English Studies, School of Social Sciences and Humanities, Central University of Tamil Nadu, and Dr. N. Mathley, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Sri Vasavi College, Tamil Nadu, as a chairperson for paper presentation. I would like to welcome and express my deepest appreciation and gratitude to Dr. S. Balakrishnan, Chief Editor of Bodhi International Journal of Research in Humanities, Arts and Science for making the extraordinary conference a possibility. Thank you, sir. With all these words, I'm extremely delighted to welcome all the renowned speakers and eminent delegates, paper presenters, participants, and students who took out their valuable time and have joined us today. We are honored to have you all with us. I can assure that the conference will be productive and worth your precious time. I would also like to offer my regards to all the people who made this conference functional in such hard times. Once again, I welcome and thank you all for your benign presence. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to introduce Dr. S. Rajarajan, Assistant Professor of English at Kanchi Mahamuniwa Government Institute for Postgraduate Studies and Research, Puducherry. As a member of faculty in English, he has put in 27 years of service in teaching and research. He, has, he is a committed teacher and an ardent researcher. He began his teaching career in the year 1993. He has delivered many lectures at various educational forums. His areas of research include Indian writing in English, language and linguistics, African American literature, mythology, and so on. He has been supervising pre-doctoral and doctoral research for about 15 years. He has published 64 research articles in the journals of national and international repute. He also serves as a member in various academic bodies. With a great pleasure, I invite Dr. S. Rajarajan to present the presidential address. Thank you, Jitin. Thank you, Madam Smalling Bose. Uh, good morning, uh, respected dignitaries. First of all, I would like to extend my uh, warm and humble thankfulness to the management of NES Ratnam College and also Bodhi International uh, Conference. And I also uh, very much thankful to the principal and the vice principals. Uh, fortunately, uh, Madam is here, Lata Swaminathan. 
and other principles that replace principles. Uh, my sincere thanks also to the conference core and uh, working committee members. I feel uh, many of us are here. And again, I feel my, uh, very happy to give my special thanks to our Dr. Balas Brahmaniam, the patron of this conference, who is also my friend who gave this wonderful opportunity. In fact, I was fixed yesterday evening around 4 o'clock to deliver this lecture. Uh, immediately, I accepted the invitation for one reason, uh, language, literature and culture, which is part and parcel of our life. That is, uh, being an English faculty, uh, we are ready to deliver you. Suppose if uh, Madam's area, Lata Swaminathan's Madam's area, I have some reluctance to accept this invitation uh, because the area is commerce. So uh, really I am thankful to the entire system, though the uh, thing is given in all of a sudden. And dear students, scholars, faculty members from this college and also from various uh, educational institutions. So the subject, that is the thrust area of this conference, what we call language, literature, and culture. In fact, in ambiguity term, uh, which comes first? It's very difficult to uh, uh, identify which comes first. But we can nicely place the order through the culture. Language is supposed through the language. Uh, now we are having the literature. We can design, but all the three things, in fact, is inseparable. That is very, very important. We cannot run the show uh, without culture, without language, without literature. Everything is part and parcel of our life. Uh, fortunately, uh, linguistics is not placed at the end. Otherwise, I feel very difficult to uh, deliver this lecture because the linguistics is entirely different. Uh, uh, when we discuss about language, we should be very careful about the, the grammar side also. Okay. So actually, though I was uh, placed in the what is called the presidential address, I would like to share my own experience in the field of literature uh, because uh, my madam is uh, going to deliver the inaugural address. So uh, madam will take care of the conference. Uh, what is called. Uh, the main uh, thrust or other things. So today I would like to share a few things in connection with what is called the language and literature. There is no need to uh, recall uh, how this language has been developed or what is called the evolution of language and into various theories, what is called uh, Babo theory or Fufu theory or Ding Dong theory or gesture theory. No need right now. Uh, I would like to quote a few uh, sentences or few words from our Robert Browning, how the language has been played very well and also how the literature also been uh, aesthetically developed. That is very, very important. See, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, certain words gives vibration uh, very prominently uh, even the poet failed to understand at the time of composing that such kind of words. We people, that is we, that means uh, as a reader of English literature, as a reader, uh, that is a critic, we now uh, used to profound many theories in connection with uh, what he said already. That is the uh, thing. So one poem, that is my last duchess. The moment when I spelt the word, uh, some people, non-literature, uh, may have the doubt whether L-O-S-T or L-E-A-S-T. See, immediately, being a literature student, everybody knows my last duchess means L-E-A-S-T. Suppose if it is a non-literature student, they, they will be confused in my pronunciation. Sir, what do you mean whether L-O-S-T or L-E-A-S-T? That, uh, that is the role of what is called the language. See? Uh, if my articulation is poor or if my uh, stress is uh, 
uh, not properly uh, given uh, the meaning of the title itself starts with some kind of confusion and also what brownie wants to say will be completely collapsed if the uh, word has not been properly placed so the language first problem what is called the last or last whereas the literature is so naturally uh, available in brownie's poem uh, i uh, we have to identify whether the poem is the emotional or aversion see emotional or aversion and what is the culture in this poem actually i want to discuss both almost all the three in this uh, uh, poem what is called the language what is called the literature what is called the culture the culture here whether this fellow is going to marry again another lady that is the question uh, this question is not actually is a very big question in some parts of the world but it is always a very big question uh, country like india because in a country like india we are very sensitive regarding this uh, what is called the uh, marriage or another marriage etc so this man that is our poet gives the word uh, what is called i am not reading the poem i just want to share few things from the poem in order to connect what is called the literature what is called the language what is called the culture so i am not taking the class uh, it is the poetry class or i am not going to uh, deal the poem entirely right from the top to bottom it's not so i just would like to share few things from the poem because uh, uh, the scholar can identify it, the uh, students can identify it, how to read literature as a literature so it's very very important uh, without knowing the right way or the the right path uh, it's very difficult to enjoy the uh, poem or prose or novel whatever it is so here one word he that is in the middle of the poem uh, the poet composed this sentence i gave commands see they are very much structured that is uh, worried about the whether the uh, sentence uh, morphologically or syntax or semantically so being a what is called a language student you will be very much uh, disturbed by means of what is called whether the sentence have the correct connections but the poets are licensed they are they they can you use their feeling they can express their feeling uh, like our words so what he said is correct it's a very powerful spontaneous see overflow there is no need of any uh, restrictions how to use the sentence where to give the pause where to it's not so just a simple sentence what is called i gave commands you can get many number of meaning that is the influence of what is called the literature though the language is over but the literature starts that is aesthetically you are going to dig many number of meaning through the words what is the meaning of i gave commands the next sentence immediately all smiles stopped together the immediately next sentence all smiles stopped together that she stand that she stands a sicker line just imagine if the sentence has not been properly read if the sentence has not been properly pronounced by myself you can't get the real meaning what he wants to convey as far as the sentence structure is concerned somehow we can accept uh, so sir he is not a so uh, that is first uh, time is grammar some mistakes are there no poet poetry and poets are always licensed to you whatever they feel uh, if you read a keats poem again you have this problem but that is why it uh, take the sentences from the poetry not from prose or novel because in prose and novel most of the time the sentence has been properly structured so we don't have any problem of understanding the meaning but in poetry it's very very difficult to understand what he wants to convey the message see that is very important i gave comments the word you can get many number of 
meaning i gave comments means through his through his people through his subordinate he killed the lady see that word is not found see he the word is not found but the meaning is uh, underlined that the you can get the meaning through the word uh, but the exactness what we call the synonymously you can't get anything you can get only the meaning through what is called in the sense of something read in between lines in, in another uh, thing what is called uh, in uh, press uh, uh, structure grammar used to say deep structure it is not you can't find the meaning in surface structure you can find the meaning in the deep structure so this is one evidence i would like to share in brownie's poem how the words are connected how the meanings it is very very important how the meanings varies from reader to reader that is called the literature see what do you feel in mahabharata can't felt my, myself that is the taste you uh, not only you anyone can say very well uh, in mahabharata uh, duryodhanan is the villain is the character but i won't accept duryodhanan as the villain is character in my own sense see i used the derrida's uh, deconstruction theory i immediately accepted the certain things uh, duryodhanan is the right person for his royal seat so i won't accept your view so all these things are actually permissible license uh, in our field that is in literature so uh, really we should feel proud about uh, to have this not only this platform uh, to have this subject as ours and we can share our feelings wherever whenever see i actually i was fixed yesterday evening around 4 o'clock i am here because my love on the subject only there is no other meaning in it i just came i want to share few things uh, that is a platform is given to me now i have the chance to see some scholars some teachers and uh, whether my points or views are agreeable or not i just throw the cup so that is the influence of literature but whereas in language now we are going to see the role of language that is why i start first literature in order to bring the audience inside the zoom room Uh, now i have that uh, that is a freeness to uh, share few things about what is called the language so according to chomsky uh, is a very famous sentence nowadays it was uh, quoted as quotes uh, what is called colorless green ideas just uh, don't use the board otherwise if the board is available uh, you can feel the real meaning of the sentence what is called colorless green ideas sleep furiously it is a sentence grammatically see it is a chunky statement grammatically the strength, the sentence is well structured but you can't get any semantic value all of it sir many number of definitions many number of criticism many number of views even today suppose if you open the wikipedia you can find many layer of ideas or meanings for a meaningless sentence it is very important chomsky uh, the, that is composed this sentence and uh, the moment when you saw the sentence you feel something is jumbled so immediately you want to arrange it in such a way in order to get the meaning it's not so he purposely colorless green ideas sleep furiously see that words how he arranged the colorless green see first problem axiom one is colorless another one is color colorless green sleep in the sense peacefully but here sleep in the sense what is called it? furiously that means with uh, some kind of disturbance the sleep is not proper nightmarish see all this kind of the ideas are actually occurred in his mind and composed the sentence and he wants to convey some message to you how the phrase structure what is called how the traditional grammar is constructed and what are the problems in traditional grammar what are the problems in phrase structure grammar suppose if you touch the phrase structure you can get many number suppose the sentence is the man 
uh, eats what is called mango or something else the man first of all we identified man as a common noun man as animate man as a human man as a what is called male gender suppose if you are going to uh, what is called analyze or uh, if you are going to operate the word in such a way at one stage you will completely lost the flavor of the sentence so that is also very important according to ts eliot he is very nicely he said very nicely you can't get the uh, flavor when you uh, divide the things into pieces see uh, in in his uh, traditional individual talent he used to say uh, the flavor is different for example the tea the flavor is you can't to find the, the amount of water the amount of what is called the milk the amount of sugar or the amount of what is called the tea dust or the heating element element the fire it cannot be seen you can feel the flavor through the nostrils through the mind you it is informed it's a very good tea but the tea cannot be gulped the tea should be sipped like that literature is also cannot be easily you can't gulp it you can't mug up it it can be felt through the language it is very important through the languages people are here uh, one of the closing sentence in west wind uh, that is shelley's west wind uh, he applies the word if the winter come can spring be far behind so the grammar is uh, he mistakes sir uh, this fellow starts with uh, what is called the type 1 or type 2 or type 3 if class Uh, but the other part is completely ruined how can i understand the meaning sir it's not so highly philosophical you can get the meaning into several that is uh, not in a particular way or not in a particular meaning you can operate even for earlier students we used to say sir if uh, april goes uh, we can clear it in the december uh, see you can uh, operate anywhere if the winter comes can spring be far behind though the sentence is grammatically wrong not what is called in the sense of what is called if pluses is not properly placed the first part of the sentence is in the sentence the second part of the sentence should be in future but the first part of the sentence is in what is called a dependent clause and the second part of the sentence is what is called a simple but in the second part is what shelly use is not in simple it is in interrogative see can spring be far behind so it should be written only the spring cannot be far behind if it is written the sentence is correct but uh, shelly made a mistake he is so poor in grammar he is what we call Uh, literature is always go hand in hand with uh, language inevitably but it cannot uh, it cannot be perfected that is very very important uh, uh, that is why i take the things only from poetry side not in the prose uh, what is called bacon's or addition uh, or lord mccalle i have not taken the things from the people because uh, everything is written in a very logical manner so i don't want to touch that area but i just quote uh, few things from the what is called the so powerful message is unbelievable even today when you read the poem uh, shelly or keats uh, keats said one word what is starting in his poem a thing of beauty is die forever so whether the thing is t h i n g or t h i n k both are same you can get the meaning very well whether the pronunciation may be wrong t h i n g i n k or t h i n g you can get the meaning equally well a thing of beauty what he said is a, a thing t h i n g it is also possible you can get the meaning very well in things whatever the beauty that lies within your mind within yourself 
that is the message is given by uh, kids very nicely from the starting a thing of beauty is joy for us uh, i think i am actually permitted to deliver only 20 minutes uh, madam am i going beyond the limit or am i within the limit madam okay yes sir am i going on the right track uh, beyond yes sir oh, yes yeah. sir definitely sir i would like to add uh, it right thank you thank you so uh, the the feeling that is the the message delivered by these poets definitely gives some powerful message even 200 or 500 or 800 or 1000 years but you should not be uh, worried about what is called the language language is actually changes natural now language uh, whether the language is in the that is uh, yesterday I, I, uh, to my students i take the morphology and the syntax class one of the sentence in phrase structure they mentioned 1957 1965 1986 again and again i uh, through the tree diagram uh, i consult the that is only in the website what's the what they want to convey 1957 1965 1986 that means changes are natural rigidity is there in language rigidity is there uh, we are we never allow that is the problem of traditional grammar we never give any compromise in connection with what is called sir the sentence is not properly structured uh, i can't understand if it is uh, structured this way it is easy to understand that is the feeling of our students see but language definitely uh, should be uh, according to linguists they won't uh, accept it's natural it is because of the environment that is the language is here develops because of the environment in, in, in total around the world 7000 languages are operating but we are using 23 languages almost half of the population half of the world. Earth. What is the meaning in it? Seven thousand to twenty-three numbers. So everything is in connection with what is called environment. Literature is also like that, but the literature has some kind of same feeling. What is called the generation after generation. Whatever the message they want to convey uh, in the period of Mahabharata, still now they convey the same message. People like Derrida or myself. May change the vision or version with our own sake, but the entire system may not be collapsed. So, uh, I think with this, uh, I would like to end the speech. Uh, I advise the students, I advise the scholars, and, and also I share my feelings to my own faculty group, those who are in front of me. Uh, it's a really a wonderful area to understand. Uh, there is no meaning to ask which comes first, that is a chicken or egg. Uh, you don't bother about uh, both come as, as, as their own order. So there is no meaning to find out uh, whether the egg comes first or chicken comes, that is, comes first. Uh, it is in the absurd theater. But uh, here we, we are not in absurd uh, situation. Uh, all the three things, culture, without the culture, language cannot be developed. How can we speak? How can we write? So we have some kind of culture. So without the culture, language cannot be established. Once the language is established, what is the next stage? Literature is inevitable. So all the three things are actually in, in have their own connections. A basement, and it is a what we call the basement is the culture, and the foundation laid what is called the language. If the foundation is good, the building is strong. That is called the literature. I think that is enough for this session. Uh, thank you for giving this wonderful opportunity. Again, I thank the entire uh, audience in front of me and also the noble souls behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your thank you. Clean wow. speech. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce. Dr. Lata Swaminathan, Vice Principal and Head, Department of Commerce, NES Ratnam, College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Mumbai. 
she has an experience of 27 years in teaching marketing human resource and general business management to undergraduate and postgraduate students she actively involved in supervising and managing operational planning and development and directing the day to day academic and associated operations of the school and college her involvement in research through publications and presentation of papers is substantial she has presented 14 research papers in various national and international conferences and had co-authored six books she has a comprehensive exposure in content development with skills in preparing contents relevant to course curriculum in ib cie icse undergraduate and postgraduate programs of the mumbai university she also serves as a member in various academic bodies she has conducted numerous workshops for developing soft skills in teachers and students it's a pleasure to invite dr lata swaminathan to deliver the inaugural address good morning all of you am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you thank you so much It's absolutely my pleasure to be here a part of this wonderful conference and to represent my parent body the National Education Society and Saraswati Vidya Bhavan group of institutions headed by our founder president Dr R Vardharajan and director Balasubram Dr Balasubramaniam and of course my wonderful team at Ratnam College headed by our principal Dr Mary Vimochana wise my colleague who is also the vice principal Dr Vinita Dhulia and uh, having here dr mrs somali who has been very instrumental in organizing this uh, 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 conference with the help of uh, bodhi international journal of research in humanities arts and science um, it's uh, i i feel extremely overwhelmed to see the wonderful participation that has come up in this conference and uh, i it is absolutely my pleasure to say a few words on this occasion where i would like to probably Uh, represent the college and the parent body to know how important it is for us to be as a part of this um, conference now i uh, send my greetings on behalf of my entire team to dr s raja uh, raja rajan then we have with us uh, dr kavya rasu and um, we also i think have dr s balakrishnan who is the editor and uh, dr M mani mangai mani who would be joining us i am not she's there already yeah dr mani mangai welcome to you nice to see you here and uh, the keynote session of course will be following this so i welcome all of you all the dignitaries and all the keynote speakers resource persons and the participants who i think have joined us from across the length and breadth of the country because while i was just going through the list that somali shared with me saying that 34 uh, papers have been received for this conference i could just see it coming right from jammu and kashmir to kanyakumari and i think that's just wonderful and also from the west of india to the east you know so it's so wonderful to see all of you here and very interesting to see lieutenant dr maithili who is a part of this conference i think uh, of a very uh, you know a bit, uh, which is mainly of a literature and language genre It's nice to see a lieutenant amidst us. So, if you are okay, Dr. Maithili, could we just see you on the video, please, for a minute? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, I'll just when I chat the session, I'll be on video, ma'am. Thank okay. you. Thank you All for right. your credits, ma'am. Okay, Thank but you so very much. nice, very nice to have you with us. So I think I can just uh, visualize the kind of diversity that this conference has brought in, and that's absolutely wonderful. And uh, it, you know, actually suits the theme of the conference, which talks about uh, innovations in literature, language, and culture. So um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of you know aspects of this themes that we will be seeing in the conference through the sessions that are going to be hosted today and tomorrow and uh, mr dr rajarajan of course you know he spoke very eloquently and very technically on literature and language which i'm sorry i may not be able to do but i could just speak about in terms of 
from the common man's perspective of literature and language and culture. And uh, so I'm here to just uh, say a few words on my thoughts about this theme and the relevance of this theme in today's uh, context, basically. So um, uh, Dr. Rajarajan spoke about Shelley Browning and uh, some of the authors who have been, I think they've uh, absolutely become immortal in the field of literature because of the work and the kind of literary contributions they have made um, uh, to the society. And of course, they, I think they all are uh, today remembered as very uh, you know, great writers because of the lasting artistic merit that their work has. And I think that exactly defines literature. And when we speak about language, I totally agree with Dr. Rajarajan when he said that language and literature, of course, both are so connected with the environment. So we have seen a lot of new words in English being added to the Oxford Dictionary. I think that's all nothing but an evolution of the language in our modern society. And one thing what intrigues me, which I think probably may intrigue you all also, is that the WhatsApp language, which I think uh, probably we all need to do a little more research to understand how it's evolved and how it's contributing to our modern days of communication. And I think it's becoming a very integral part and we cannot deny the existence of the WhatsApp language. So maybe there'll be a little more of, uh, you know, seminars and conferences held in future to understand what this language actually means. Now, when we talk about innovations, innovation is basically um, nothing but, I mean, according to me in language and literature, innovations would be unorthodox thinking and its application in both literature and language. So basically we have five primary musical notes, five primary colors, five primary tastes, but the innovations happen through the combination of these very basic things. And I think when we talk about language and literature also, so we have some basic genres and styles and probably a combination of various genres, styles uh, would uh, bring about innovations in uh, literature and language. And uh, literature and language has not only reflected the culture of that period of the society, but has also somewhere been instrumental in changing the thought process and the worldview of people so that we evolve as better human beings or more sensitive human beings. That is what I would like to say. And uh, Dr. Rajarajan, I just want to tell you, if I had not taken up commerce, I would have surely been a literature student, you know, because I love literature. And I think uh, while I was in school, I think I read almost all of the literary classics and I've been greatly influenced by Jane Austen. I think I just love her style of writing. And she was one uh, author who actually, you know, why probably I could connect. I mean, like, you know, this is how we like a particular writer's style because of the connection that we establish with the writer. So why I connected with Jane Austen was because somewhere she tried bringing in this, uh, you know, idea of um, the dependence of a woman, uh, you know, in marriage to gain a social standing, basically. Yeah. And that was yeah. so relevant at that time. Like when we were in school, I think that was so important for a girl. But look at, no, no. Look at it today. I think today that is not at all important for a girl. <laughs> and the whole scene has changed, hasn't Change. it? Change. Right? Yeah. 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 So uh, I think a lot of people are able to connect to literature because of the various experiences or various perspectives that they have in life and which they are probably able to uh, you know, realize through those literature. So literature not only depicts, but I think somewhere it helps us to fantasize the kind of life we want, fantasize the kind of image that we want to create for ourselves. And so it is very gratifying, actually. So some of the innovations that uh, I feel like, you know, which has happened in literature in recent times, especially with in Indian authors, I think uh, I would like to talk about Arundhati's uh, you know, the God of Small Things. I think that has been a wonderful writing from her side. And uh, uh, Shashi Tarur's, you know, the great Indian novel. I think that is also a wonderful thing, which actually brings a lot of innovation by uh, using the Mahabharata in the context of the independence, you know. So I think there's a lot of innovation that happens through the imagination of the writer and trying to combine uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, two 
absolutely or juxtaposing two concepts which probably may not seem to be related in any way so that's exactly what is not only creative but i think uh, bringing in an innovations in style in themes and genre in the world view and in the perspectives which um, i'm sure uh, helps the society to get a little more sensitive about every thing happening around us so i really salute those people who actually are able to create such a beautiful piece of art through their writings so it's not only about writing a novel but i think even the beautiful writings that we see in blogs you know some of the blogs are so beautiful and through magazines and through uh, you know uh, any um, written uh, written article uh, i think all those things uh, are very contributing to the Uh, evolution of the society in many ways and trying to reflect some kind of innovation so i think this is what i understand about uh, language and literature and i presume that this is what would be explored in the themes sub themes that have been uh, um, designated for the today conference and i am 100% sure that all those who have joined us for this conference would have a absolutely literary feast uh, and uh, would be a you know very good uh, in intellectually enriching for all of you and um, when you go back i think you'll be taking away a lot of uh, i would say perspectives a lot of uh, um, uh, say styles that probably you can uh, relish and uh, you will also uh, enjoy reading uh, and uh, maybe writing even more than you did before So I think with this I would like to thank all of you for being a part of the conference here and a very hearty welcome to all of you on behalf of the entire <laughs> NES and SEB family and we thank the uh, the Bodhi International Journal of Research in Humanities Arts and Science for collaborating with us for this uh, event and we hope that this is just the beginning of our collaboration and probably we could achieve together many more milestones so thank you very much and have a wonderful Uh, day today as well as tomorrow thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am so now i like to invite ms radhika gangadhar lecturer department of english nes ratnam college of art science and commerce mumbai to give the word of thanks am i audible now ah radhi yes. audible ah right thank you. thank you sir thank you jitin um well i am both humbled and delighted to now propose the word of thanks for today's session of the two day bodhi international online conference on innovation in english language literature and culture organized by the department of english nes ratnam college of arts science and commerce mumbai in collaboration with bodhi international journal of research in humanities arts and science an online peer reviewed refereed quarterly journal it is rightly said the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched they must be felt with the heart gratitude is one such thing and so i would like to begin by showing our deepest gratitude to our chief patron founder president of nes and svb group of institutions dr r varadrajan without whose blessing this conference would not have been possible your unending faith in us sir inspires us to do better and more we also thank our patron director dr v sub bal subramanian for his guidance and encouragement throughout our heartiest thanks to principal dr mary vimochna for her constant support and thought provoking insights and to vice principals dr vinita dhulia and dr lata swaminathan as well as iqac convener dr sunita chahar for their continuous backing thank you lata ma'am for infusing your energetic aura into this conference thank you so much our sincere thanks to you dr rajarajan for your time for your, for sharing experiences and for touching upon the significance of culture language linguistics and literature 
so emphatically and delivering a stimulating presidential address. On behalf of NES Ratnam College, I extend heartfelt gratitude to Dr. K. Kavirasu, Dr. C. Arun, and Dr. N. Maithili for agreeing to preside as chairpersons for the keynote address, plenary sessions, and paper presentations. All the same, we are thankful to Dr. Mani Mangai Mani and Dr. BJ Gita for accepting our invitations as resource persons for the conference. We thank each and every one of you for taking our time out of your busy schedules and gracing us with your presence. We humbly thank the chief editor of Bodhi International Journal of Research, Dr. S. Balakrishnan for his cooperation and collaboration and hope that this association will continue for years to come. We also thank Ms. E. Priya, coordinator at Bodhi International, as thanks to her, all communication to and fro has been seamless and effective. Thank you, Epsi Jitin, for hosting this conference so effortlessly. Last but not the least, we are extremely grateful to the head, Department of English, NES Ratnam College, Mrs. Sumali Bose for executing this idea of this conference. Thank you, ma'am, for providing researchers a platform where they can exchange ideas and present their views. Once again, on behalf of NES Ratnam College, I, Radhika Gangadhar, thank all my colleagues, our eminent delegates, speakers, paper presenters, participants, and students from India and abroad alike for their efforts to make this conference a grand success. With these words, I declare the vote of thanks as concluded. Thank you and God bless. Over to you, Jitin. Thank you, ma'am. So, excuse me, just a minute. Somali, could I take uh, your leave? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so thank you, th ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining. And uh, we hope to meet in person sometime once the pandemic is over. And enjoy these two days of intellectual feast. Okay, thank you and have a great day. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Bye -bye. you, ma'am. Madam, I am also leaving. Sumali, madam, I am also leaving. Radhika, Thanks I'm a lot, leaving. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is, thank you. Now we are moving to the next session. I'd like to invite the chairperson of this session, Dr. K. Kavirasu, editor, Roots International Journal, India, and associate assistant professor of English, Vivekananda College, Agasthi Swaram Kanyakumari. He is also the joint secretary of South Asian Language and Literature Teachers Association. As a member of faculty in English, he has put service in teaching and research. He is an ardent lover of nature and was confirmed as a green ambassador by Heber of Stable. He has delivered many, le many lectures and conducted numerous workshops in various educational forums. His specialization includes eco-criticism, English language teaching, and Indian writing in English, and so on. His love towards research is tremendous. He has presented about 39 papers in various national and international conferences. He has also been a resource person and chairperson in conferences and training programs in India and also in abroad. He has published 26 research articles in ISBN and ISSN volumes and has edited nine books and six journal volumes. He received the best Young Researcher Award in the Language Category Prize. He is also widely known across the country through his blog, Dr. KK Seminars and Conferences. With a great pleasure, I welcome and invite Dr. K. Kavirasu to chair this section. Now I am handing the section to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jitin, for, uh, for uh, nice words, sir. And uh, First of all, I welcome all to the two-day Bodhi International Online Conference on Innovations in English Language, Literature, and Culture, which is jointly organized by the Department of English, NES Ratnam College of Arts and Science, Arts, Science and Commerce, Mumbai, and Bodhi International Journal of Research in Humanities, Arts, and Science. These two days, today and tomorrow, that is the 30th and 31st of July, 
definitely is going to be a literary feast for you. Yes. It is very evident uh, with the saying, well begun is off done. The good start from Professor Raj Rajan has proved it. And uh, now we have uh, amidst us Dr. Mani Mangai Mani, Senior Lecturer, University of Putra, Malaysia, to deliver the keynote address as a resource person. To tell about uh, Mani Mangai Mani, Madam, uh, of course, uh, she is a, a very good friend of us and also an ardent scholar. In her uh, 30 years of teaching experience, uh, she has specialized in African and Caribbean literature. And uh, now she's uh, very strong in South and Southeast Asian literatures. Her research experience is deep rooted with her quest for research. And so far, uh, she has authored about 10 books and published 36 papers in internationally reputed journals and has guided uh, one score of uh, scholars also. She has also delivered about 40 lectures in conferences and invited lectures across the world world and uh, I always envy her because uh, she is being a strong-willed person both physically and mentally yes physically in a sense she is holding a black belt uh, second dan in taekwondo and a black belt in karate and uh, mentally through her involvement in uh, past life so she is a person who leads a balanced life for her uh, uh, contented lifestyle. Okay. So we are happy to have such an eminent personality amidst us as the keynote speaker. Madam's address today is on the title, Remembering Pramodhya, the People's Voice. Yes, Pramodhya. No doubt, this is the voice of the Indonesia. Pramodhya often reflects the struggles of rising human dignity, critical attitude in expressing the social change often makes him in conflict with the state power. So consecutively, you can see the Indonesian government has banned his works for a long time. But internationally, he is uh, welcomed positively. And uh, I welcome Dr. Mani Mangai Mani to share her insights uh, through this keynote address. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavi. How are you? Nice Fine. to see you. Happy to see you. OK. Namaskar. Namaste. All right. Uh, can you please enable the screen sharing, the host? Yes, yes you can. You can, madam. You can. I, I can share. You can share. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. First of all, before I begin, um, good afternoon to you from Malaysia. It is already afternoon here and good morning to all of you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, the Department of English, uh, NES Ratnam College of Art, Science and Commerce, Mumbai, and uh, Bodhi International Journal of Research in Humanities, Arts and Science. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the title of my presentation today, uh, uh, my keynote speech today, is Remembering Pramodia, the People's Voice. Um, I have always been an ardent fan of uh, Pramodia, and I feel that uh, people should do or embark on more researches on his works. Yeah. Now, before uh, we look into the um, uh, writings and uh, his message to the society the, uh, and humanity. Let me tell you briefly about Southeast uh, Asia. Okay, this is uh, Southeast Asian countries. Okay, now at one time uh, in the uh, beginning of the 16th century, Southeast Asian countries were sought after by the European colonizers as this region was rich with spices, yeah, especially pepper. So the interest in spice resulted in the colonization of this region by various superpowers. 
we had the Dutch in the in the Indonesia in Indonesia. You had the British in Malaysia. You had the French. You had the uh, Spanish in Philippines. Yeah. So many superpowers wanted to uh, have a share in the piece of cake here. All right. Now, and due to that, yeah, these countries went through vigorous political turmoil before and as well as after the independence of their nations. So it is to be noted that most of these countries got their independence during the second half of the 20th century, that is from the uh, around 1900s onwards. And during World War II, the region was invaded by the Japanese Imperial Army and was included in the Greater East Asia Prosperity Sphere. Thailand was the only country, country paired, yeah? Uh, was allowed to maintain a nominal independence by making political and military alliance with the uh, Empire of Japan. During this period, communism too planted its roots in these Southeast Asian countries. The Japanese army occupied most of these countries. Many of the anti-Japanese army recruited during this period later turned into communist parties. For example, we have a party MPAJA in Malaya. Malaysian People's Anti-Japanese Army, which later became the Communist Party of Malaya. Okay. Now, the World War II and the Japanese occupation in this region gave many of these countries and their people the courage to stand up against the uh, uh, European colonizers, form nationalist parties of their own, and fight for independence. They started to demand for independence. The fall of Malaya to the hands of the Japanese within two months and the maiming of the British army stunned the Asians. Valor and might of the Japanese and Asian race against the mighty European brought in realization that the colonizers are not indispensable after all. And they started to realize that Asians are actually strong and they no longer have to comply to the Western colonizers. In short, the Japanese slogan, Asia for Asia, Asiatics, brought in confidence and self-dignity to these people. Now, with the rejuvenated nationalist movements in wait, the Europeans returned to a very different Southeast Asia after the end of World War II. Now, Indonesia, or Republic of Indonesia, is a nation that uh, con is, consists of 13,600 islands, and only about 6,000 islands are inhabited, and it extends to a radius of 5,000 kilometers. Before the coming of Islam to this region yeah, in the 1800s, the religion and culture in this region was a fusion of both Hinduism and Buddhism. In fact, the biggest Muslim nation in the world today, traces of Hinduism and Buddhism can, st can still be seen in their culture and customs. Uh, for example, the island called Bali is one place that is inhabited by people who follow Hinduism. Okay, this is Bali Island. Yeah, you see this is a Hindu temple there. Okay, they pray like the Hindus in India. Okay, Indonesia declared independence in, uh, on uh, 2nd August 1945 after the Japanese surrendered and subsequently fought a bitter war against the returning Dutch and Sukarno became the first president. He was nominated, uh, sorry, he was he was a prominent leader of Indonesia's nationalist movement during the Dutch colonial period and spent over a decade under Dutch detention until released by the invading Japanese forces. He led Indonesians in resisting Dutch recolonization efforts via diplomatic and means until the Dutch acknowledged uh, the Indonesian independence in 1949. That was two years later, uh, uh, four years later after the uh, uh, declared the independence. In the early 1960s, saw Sukarno veering Indonesia to the left by providing support and protection to the Indonesian Communist Party, PKI, at the expense of the military and Islamists. He also embarked on a series of aggressive foreign policies under the rubric of anti-imperialism with aid from Soviet Union. Now, during the Cold War period, Countering the threat of communism was a major theme in the decolonization process. Indonesia had a strong communist movement. 
The Communist Movement in Indonesia, PKI, or Party Communist Indonesia, was active throughout the mid-20th century. The PKI was a legal party made up of unarmed civilians operating openly in Indonesia's political system. It was the largest non-ruling communist party in the world. It was banned in 1966. Yeah. So in one of the most bloody single incidents of violence in, Cold, in the Cold War Southeast Asia, General Suharto seized power in Indonesia in 1965 and initiated a massacre of approximately 500,000 alleged members of the Indonesian Communist Party. And Sukarno, who was the first president, was put under house arrest. Okay, And Suharto took over the government. Now, Pramodia is one one writer who has witnessed and experienced all these atrocities in his country. Generally, writers who hail from the Southeast Asian region are people who had witnessed the atrocities of the European colonizers and their newly elected leaders who fought in the name of the ideology introduced by their Western masters. Most pointed with the policy adapted by their new independent government. The writers from this region can also be categorized as the post-colonial writers, as Southeast Asian literature has always been influenced by colonization and the impact it brought to the nation until the birth of an independent nation. However, due to the difference in standing ideology with the leaders and mainstream political movements, the works produced by some of the authors from this region are not read in their own country, and Pramodia is one of them. Yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on. Now, why do people write? Yeah, let's see why people write. Now, the reason for people uh, for writing, I have divided it into four categories. First, they write to entertain. Yeah, entertain means they when you after you. You finish reading a novel or a short story, you will feel very entertained. Justice will be done. Your hero will win. The villain will lose. All right. Uh, for example, stories written by uh, J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter. You feel very happy, very entertained after reading these books. Second reason is to teach. Now, this will be uh, very artificial in nature. Okay, it is written to propagate something. All right. Now, three, to pour out his or her feelings to express himself. Somebody wants to pour out the feelings. They are very unhappy. Yeah, they want to pour, pour out their feelings. So lots of monologues will be there and it will be playing with your emotions. After reading this kind of novels, you will not feel very happy. And the final one, the fourth reason I find is that they want to expose something. They always want to expose something. OK, it can be it, it, it is written in a fiction, OK, but they will be rewriting history. They will be telling you something, something that the history has failed to record. OK, end of if once you finish reading this kind of books, you will find that injustice will be exposed, but justice will not be done. So don't expect the uh, uh, antagonist to be punished in this kind in this kind of novels. Yeah, so those are the four reasons. Now, so it is apparent that writers write for various reasons. In literature, we normally write and choose books that belong to the third and fourth category. The books produced by them also depend on the area or region they come from. Any student of literature will notice that most famous writers whose books are considered worthy of being studied and qualify as a literature masterpiece does not come from a peaceful and happy background. Yeah, writers write because they are not at peace with their surroundings. They are constantly tortured with many wrongdoings, immoral behaviors, and injustice that taints the society, government, and the country as a whole. And they refuse to watch in silence or let it be. Their main intention is to create awareness among their people. They become the people's voice and write out of, cons of their concern for their people as they believe that they have a, a moral obligation towards their people and their nation. So they do not hesitate to pour out their 
frustrations and disappointments through words without any reservations or worrying about the consequences that they are about to face. Thus, their pens become their weapons to highlight the people's plight, as well as to fight various injustices in the so social and political system. Now, this is Pramodia. When a person writes without reservations, they become a threat to the nation that they belong. And one such writer is Pramodia. An Indonesian by birth, he's one of the famous writers from the Southeast Asian region who has stamped his place as the true people's writer. He was born in 1925 in Blora, in the heartland of Java, okay, which was then part of the Dutch East Indies. He was the first born son in a family of nine children. His father was a teacher who was also active in Budi Utomo, the first recognized indigenous national organization in Indonesia, and his mother was a rice trader. All right. And Pramodia went on to radio vocational school in Surabaya, but had barely graduated from the school when Japan invaded Surabaya in 1942. And during uh, the World War II, Pramodia, like many other Indonesian nationalists, Sukarno and Suharto, among them, initially supported the occupying forces of Imperial Japan. He believed the Japanese to be the lesser of two evils compared to the Dutch. He worked as a stenographer for a Japanese agency, news agency called Dome in Jakarta. He developed his skills. As war went on, however, Indonesians were dismayed by the austerity of wartime rationing and by increasing harsh measures taken by the Japanese military. So many Indonesians were cons uh, conscripted by the Japanese into forced labor brigades. Now, in the power vacuum that followed Japanese uh, surrender in 1945, uh, Indonesia, led by the country's first president, Sukarno, declared independence. Consequently, the Netherlands launched another four-year war to recover its colony, and Pramodia fought for a time in a guerrilla group. This touched off the Indonesian National Revolution against the forces of British and the Dutch. Now, in this war, Pramodia was in the war, and he was eventually stationed in Jakarta. During this time, he wrote several short stories and books, as well as propaganda for the nationalist cause. He produced his writings for his people and nation, but unfortunately, all his books were banned in Indonesia. As a consequence, the, the vast majority of the younger generation of the Indonesian grew up without knowing their rich past, which was depicted in all his masterpieces. And it is saddening for all of Pramodia's works were actually dedicated to the younger generation, whom he deemed as the hope and future of Indonesia. Now, the single voice that echoed throughout his works is living a full life, a life full of dignity. He always spoke about dignity. He emphasized on living a steadfast life filled with virtue, knowing one's true nature, carrying out one's duty to the society and mankind, upholding humanity, understanding the importance of their national language, that is Bahasa Indonesia, and having a country free of corruption. The phrase was not in Pramodia's native language of Javanese, but in Indonesian, the language used to unify the numerous ethnic and linguistic groups of the huge Indonesian archipelago. It should be noted that Pramodia wrote all his books in the Indonesian language, that is Bahasa Indonesia. In the Mute's Soliloquy, Pramodia described his father as a Javanese who had a near mystical feeling about words and explained the name Pramodia was constructed from the syllables of a revolutionary slogan, Yang Pertama di Medan, or First on the Battlefield. Now, George Santayana says this, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Subsequently, Santayana, Santayana's pro proclaim about the importance of past would become an encyclopedic statement which counts for the past in all disciplines. Reading Pramodia's novel will give an idea on how rich the economy of the nation was before it was taken over by corrupt leaders. After the 1965 coup, the government was overthrown by General Suharto and the country's progress came to a halt. 
yeah, it started regressing compared to other countries in the region. True enough, today, Indonesia, Indonesia is one country with the highest inflation rate in the Southeast Asian region. For example, uh, one uh, ringgit Malaysia equals to 3,300, oh, sorry, 438 rupiah. Indonesia is also con considered as a highly corrupted country and ranked 90th out of 176 countries. Yeah. Another researcher, David Lamont, he asserts that by studying the past, the present is better understood, the future is anticipated. Davies' conclusion is that if there were no past, there would be no present either. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Indonesian literature, the main contributor to the Indonesian literature is forgotten. Pramodia Anantator is one writer who had experienced the Dutch colonization, the Japanese occupation during World War II, and two corrupt presidents of Indonesia through whom he had suffered intensely. All these events, the gist he squeezed from them through his sharp and analytical mind and his dreams of a better Indonesia are penned in his novels. But as I said earlier, unfortunately, the people never got the chance to read his works. <clears throat> now, according to Lamont, it is critical for the practitioners of all disciplines who would like to have significant achievements in the future to effectively incorporate their own experiences and the experiences of the people in the past. Otherwise, he warns, there are not only, they are not only condemned to remain in the same stage as the past, but also likely to repeat mistakes of the people of the past and fall far behind them. So studying Pramodia's works gives the readers the glimpses of the past of Indonesia under the colonial Dutch rule and the untold sufferings of the people, especially the peasants. As quoted by Lamont, analyzing Pramodia's works, and the dominant voice of the past enables the readers to do a sound judgment of the knowledge. He believes that this knowledge not only belongs to the contemporary generations, but must also be transmitted to the future generations. In all of Pramodia's works, there is an emphasis on how men of power specifically target younger generations. Seen as a threat to their position, the power crazed authorities will wage a full scale physical or at times subtle co war against the younger generation. They will abuse the mental and physical potentialities of the young youth with the intention of silencing their voices, cooling their zeal for Im improvement and breaking the de their desire for change. In the first years after the struggle for independence, Pramodia wrote several works of fiction dealing with problems of the newly founded nation as well as semi-autobiographical works based on his wartime memoirs. In all his works, he expressed his unhappiness about the government and the disappointment with its failure to fulfill the independence which was exchanged with so much blood and tears of many. Yeah. Later on, he went to live in Netherlands as part of the cultural exchange program. In the years followed, he took interest in several other cultural exchanges, including trips to Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Pramodia was imprisoned for almost 17 years by various leaders because, because of his writings and for being outspoken. First, he was imprisoned by the Dutch for being anti-colonial and for his, for his involvement in the Indonesian Revolution in 1947. And he remained there until 1949, yeah, two years imprisonment, the year Netherlands recognized the Indonesian uh, independence. And from his cell in Bukit Duri, he wrote his first published novel known as The Fugitive or Pemburuan about an Indonesian who fought the Japanese. And uh, okay, this is the Buru Island. And uh, this is the Buru Island prison where he was imprisoned. Now, on this prison colony, yeah, on Buru Island, he was not permitted to have paper or pencil for the first 10 years. Imagine a writer who is not given paper or pencil. Doubting that, that he would ever be able to write the novels uh, by himself, what he did was he narrated the novels to his fellow prisoners. With the support of the other prisoners who took on extra labor, he reduced his workload. 
uh, Pramodia was eventually able to write the novels down, and the published works derive their name uh, uh, as Guru Quartet from the prison where he produced them. It's known as the Guru Quartet. Yeah, the English title for these uh, uh, novels. Uh, the first one is the uh, This Earth of Mankind. You have Child of All Nations, uh, Footsteps, and the final one is House of Glass. Now, the Guru Quartet, okay, the Guru Quartet includes strong female characters of China, Indonesian and Chinese ethnicity, and it addresses the discriminations and indignities of living under colonial rule, the struggle for personal and national independence. He became the voice. He always championed the voice of the women. He always championed the rights of the women in Indonesia, especially the Nyais. Yeah, Nyais. It's spelled N-Y-A-I. Nyai. Now, Nyai is a concubine. It's a Dutch concubine. So many, many of the Indonesian women were taken to, were forced to become the Dutch concubines. And in this novel, there will be a, 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 a Nyai. Okay, her name is uh, Nyai Ontosoro, uh, who, whom uh, he will describe as a very dynamic woman. Yeah, so uh, the uh, Buru Kota talks about this woman and uh, the journey of Minke, a nationalist. Now, later during the year uh, 1960s, Pramodia started to build up reputation as a literary and social critic. Uh, he, he joined the left wing writers group, Lekra, associated with the Party Communist in Indonesia. But he never joined PKI. He just he was just with the writers group. Okay, um, his writing style became more politically charged, as evidenced in his story "Corruption" or "Corruption," a critical fiction of a civil servant who falls into the trap of corruption. He was disappointed with the new government, and this book was aimed at the corruption in Indonesian society. He realized that the government's economic policies were too Java centric and people were suffering. This created friction between him and the government of Sukarno. So, from the late 1950s, uh, he started teaching uh, literary history at the left wing Universitas Res Republica. As he prepared the materials, he began to realize that the study of Indonesian language and literature had been distorted by the Dutch colonial authorities. So he sought out materials that had been ignored by the colonial educational institutions and which had continued to be ignored after independence. He also continuously criticized the government. Okay, this earned him enmity with Sukarno, whom at first Pramodia generally admired. In 1960, he was arrested by the Indonesian military and jailed at Sipinang prison for nine months. This was the second imprisonment. Pramodia, whose works had already begun to appear in foreign language editions, was not killed, but was arrested in October 1965, imprisoned again in Nusa Kambangan of the of, uh, southern coast of Java. He was beaten uh, very badly. He became partially deaf on one year for the rest of his life. His library was destroyed and he lost almost 5,000 books. For the first few months in Musa Kambangan, he wrote the mute soliloquy where he, he has stated, torture was the prisoner's, prisoner's constant diet, he says. In 1969, he moved to the Buru, uh, Buru Island. Okay, in the mute soliloquy, this book, Okay, it is an autobiography based on the letters that he wrote for his daughter from imprisonment in Buru, but were not allowed to be sent. So in Arus Balik, uh, he also wrote many columns and short articles criticizing the Indonesian government. Okay, in this book, again, he relates his sufferings in the prison, working rice fields on a penal farm. Pramodia and his fellow prisoners suffered from extreme malnutrition. And Pramodia said he began to eat rats and lizards and worse. Yeah, Pramodia describes his experience in prison. He says, in 1949, I wrote a story about a refugee who tried to keep her children alive by feeding them stray animals, cats included. Now I found myself doing the same. Eating snakes was common. Some of the men ate woodworms too, disposing their head first and then eating the fatty lower part of the body sometimes raw, 
Dogs too found their way into our stomachs. The humiliation, the beatings, the forced labor, these things made the situation more worrisome, he says. In the memoir, he also wrote about the condition of the prisoners. Yeah, he says, the bodies of men who could stand were wet with dew, but many more were unable to get up. They were either dead, unconscious, or had no strength left to stand. A sour smell of blood and human waste clung in the air. Promodia was kept under house arrest until 1992, but Promodia, fearful that he would not be allowed back into his country if he traveled abroad, did not dare leave Indonesia until Suharto was self, uh, uh, was swept from power in 1998. He loved his country so much that he was afraid that they would exile him forever. During this time, he released another book, uh, The Girl from the Coast, Another semi-fictional novel based on his grandmother's own experience. Now, th there were three volumes of this book, but they were destroyed uh, in the fire when the government attacked his library. He also wrote a book titled Perawan Remaja Dalam Cengkaman Militer. That means Young Virgins in the Military Greek. A documentary written in the style of a novel showcasing the plight of Javanese women who were forced to become comfort women during the Japanese occupation, where they were brought to the island of Buru, where they were sexually abused and ended up staying there instead of returning to Java. Pramodia made their acquaintance when he himself was a, a political prisoner there in the 1970s. Yeah, Pramodia was uh, hospitalized in year 2006. Okay, for complications brought on by diabetes and heart disease. And he was a heavy smoker of cloth, cloth or critic, uh, cigarettes and had endured uh, years of abuse while in, in detention. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you Google and if you, if you can find uh, videos of Pramodia, you will always see him with the cigarette, with the cloth cigarette, yeah, critic, we call it critic in Indonesia. And uh, he died uh, in uh, 2006, yeah year 2006 at the age of 81 creating 34 works of fiction and non-fiction this is his grave okay i went to visit his grave when i went to went to java okay i i really i could not meet him when he was alive but uh, i only managed to uh, go visit his grave now, Pramodia earned several international awards and accolades for his works, but none from his country. Sad. Yeah? His books have been translated to 37 languages. He was often mentioned as a candidate for the Nobel Prize for Literature and was frequently discussed, even after his death as Indonesia's and Southeast Asia's best candidate for Nobel Prize in Literature. Pramodia's writings on Indonesia are similar to those of Salman Rushdie's on India in addressing the international and regional currents caused by political events in history and how these events flowed through his homeland and buffeted his, its people. Pramodia also shares a personal history of hardship and detention for his efforts of self-expression in the political aspects of his writings and struggled against the censorship of his work by the leaders of his own people. Of his long imprisonment, Pramodia once remarked, he said this, you know, he said, is it possible to take from a man his right to speak to himself? Yeah, he said that since he was denied pens or any kind of paper in prison, so to prove he could not be silenced, Pramodia told the story of Minke, the hero of Buru Quartet, to his fellow prisoners every night. Pramodia's true nature and his mindset can clearly be seen from one particular aspect in his personal life. Ladies and gentlemen, his name was originally Pramodia Ananta Mastor. Yeah? But see how humble he is. He felt that the family name Mastor, yeah, his father's name, seemed too aristocratic. Yeah? The Javanese prefix Mas refers to a man of the higher rank in a noble family. So he omitted the mask and kept Tor as his family name. Yeah? This action of his goes a long way in revealing the principles that flows in his vein. It is not clear if he is a socialist, communist, a Marxist, or a secularist. He is not even religious. 
Pramodia's works on colonial Indonesia recognized the importance of Islam as a vehicle for popular opposition to the Dutch, but his works are not overtly religious. He rejected those who used religion to deny, to deny critical thinking and on, on, and on occasion wrote with consider, considerable negativity to religiously pious. The only thing that we are clear of this man is that he is a humanist. Human, their well-being and their rights has been the pinnacle of his struggle. He sees humanity above race, religion, social class, and gender. Through his novels, Pramodia exposes the multiracial Indonesia. Pramodia's full literary genius again evident, is again evident in the remarkable characters that populate the novels and in his depiction of people's painful emergence from colonial domination and the shackles of tradition. The people in his works are not mere characters. They are depiction, they are the depiction of real living human that he had seen in his life. Their pains are not mere fiction. They are, they are the real torment he saw and felt for his fellow men. It is not for them, if it's not for them, he endured all the hardship and the stay steadfast in his writing. He refuses to stay silent, imprisoned for more than 17 years in total for his opposition to tyranny, Pramodia dramatizes with grace and valor the injustices and glory of human life in his many internationally acclaimed books, which are banned in Indonesia, his homeland. He is not a warrior to wage war for them. He is a social thinker. His shield is his sincerity in wanting to champion their rights, and his weapon is his writings. Thus, he fought for them by depicting the plight of the masses, by unleashing his wrath against the injustice brought upon them and highlighting the social unfairness caused by the power crazy leaders. He had hoped to bring awareness to the heart of his people. I would like to uh, bring your attention to what is in, uh, inscribed on his, on his uh, grave, yeah? the, at the bottom here. Yeah? There'll be an inscription, it says, Pemuda Harus Melahirkan Pemimpin, which in English means the youth should hail as, as leaders. He wanted that to be put on his grave. Yeah. So you can see how much uh, he was uh, worried about the youth. Yeah, He wanted the youth to lead the country. Okay, and he often asks, yeah, is it possible to take from a man his right to speak to himself yeah it is this awareness that would prompt them to regroup their energy to launch the act of cleansing cleansing their heart cleansing the society and most of all cleansing their nation to create a better indonesia and a better world for everyone all right uh, with with that i end my session again um, my sincere hope is that uh, those of you in india I hope you can venture into the Indonesian literature and uh, uh, do uh, do embark on researches on Pramodia's works. Yeah, they are very interesting. Yeah, uh, very down to earth, and um, he he is the real voice for the silenced people in Indonesia. Thank you for listening. Um, I I would like to thank again uh, the NES, NES Ratnam College and uh, the Bodhi. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. And uh, of course, definitely we have to thank uh, Dr. Mani Mangai for uh, enlightening us on uh, Pramodhya, the soul who was not recognized uh, in his land, but was bestowed with prominent awards, like uh, Dr. Honoris Casa from uh, the University of Michigan, Chancellor's Distinguished Honor Award uh, from the University of California. Yeah. Uh, Chevalier D. Lauders Zarts his letters from France and uh, 11th uh, Fukuoka Asian Culture Prize from Japan, the Norwegian Authors Union Awards, the Pabul uh, Neruda Award from Chile, uh, and so many awards uh, like that. And uh, no doubt, uh, Pramodia played a vital role in the development of a modern Indonesian literature, which is now being recognized across the world because uh, it was uh, 
the indonesian literature was uh, not uh, been prominent uh, for some time and uh, now only because of him we can say that uh, the indonesian literature has been uh, looked at by the whole world community yes i'm reminded of uh, eliot's words time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past if all time is eternally present all time is unredeemable as dr manimangai mani rightly observes without the knowledge of the past the knowledge of the contemporary generation cannot be transferred to the younger generations and so nothing innovative can be created so a wonderful uh, uh, speech and you have uh, uh, summarized or you have given a kind of uh, that vision on uh, pramodya uh, for us and uh, thank you so much madam and uh, is, if there is any question we can uh, have there are a few compliments also from the chat box um, yes um dr manjula goel says uh, nice insights on colonialism and of our uh, beautiful pictures of indonesia and maps as well as yes madam to add uh, to what uh, dr manjula goel says uh, i also know that madam loves travel and uh, she uh, always uh, explores uh, various uh, untrodden paths and uh, so you can find all her untrodden paths are always beautiful and it is not unpleasant so that is something which i Thank always you. envy about her also yeah, i miss yes. traveling now dr K uh, dr kavi <laughs> yes i i miss india mostly <laughs> Uh, soon soon you will be back here madam we all still miss yeah, you yeah <laughs> i hope so yeah i hope so okay thank you thank you so much madam and uh, let us uh, hand over the session to the mc mr jitin thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir i'm moving to the next session Uh, i will invite uh, dr c arun assistant professor pg department of english government arts and science college tiruvannelu vilupuram he is a committed teacher and an ardent researcher he is a member of english language teachers association of india he also serves as an editorial board member of international journal of academic library and information science his specializations are english language teaching comparative literature indian english literature translation studies american literature film studies and criticism he has organized many conferences and webinars he has also been research person and chair person in conferences he has presented about 36 papers in various national and international conferences he has published 19 research articles in various international referred journals and 10 research papers in isbn books he has edited 10 books and a journal volume and has also published a book named 50 short stories from o henry reed told so it's a great pleasure to invite dr c arun to chair this section over to you sir yeah thank you am i audible yes sir you are audible thank you thank you jitin janna thank you very much uh it's a great pleasure for me to join in this session I respected uh, dr s balakrishnan the chief editor of bodhi and roots international journal organizing team of uh, nes ratnam college of arts science and commerce mumbai and dr k kaviyaras editor roots international journal and uh, the team members of both the international journal of research in humanities and dear participants from all over the world and uh, other faculty members from various institutions and the resource person dr bj geeta associate professor from central university of tamil nadu tanju i'm very happy to welcome you all in this uh, wonderful session on behalf of both the journal once again i thank dr balakrishnan 
yes, Bala Krishna sir, who gave me this uh, uh, the beautiful opportunity for me. So it's an uh, immense pleasure for me to introduce our valuable, resourceful, eminent resource person, Professor Dr. B. J. Gita, Associate Professor of English from Central University of Tamil Nadu, Tanjo. So I'm um, for our milestone, you know, Madam has uh, rich and vast experiences uh, in the field of teaching and uh, research. Madam has published 61 research papers in the various international PR reviewed and UGC list journals. Uh, Professor Gita has also published two academic books, namely Enrich English, Literary Quiz. In addition, Madam has, has contributed 13 chapters in the edited books. She has completed successfully one UGC project, uh, which is entitled Role of English Language Portals in Importing Company Communication Skills of College Students of Salem District. Further, a professor has published 26 articles in the different conference proceedings. It is a great thing to know that she has organized 13 seminars and conferences in the national and international level. She was also invited as a resource person and has delivered a lecture in the various seminars, conferences, workshops, and faculty development programs. It is a milestone to know that further she evaluated as an external examiner for five PhD theses from different universities. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Gita uh, was also PC uh, doctor committee members and the convener of different colleges and universities. Uh, it is very happy to know that her area of research are uh, Indian literature, American literature, literary criticism, comparative literature, and English language teaching. Madam, once again, on behalf of the organizing team, I welcome you and request to give a wonderful lecture in this uh, wonderful platform and this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, I welcome you all. And so we are also eager to listen to Madam's lecture. Thank you, Madam. This is over to you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, good morning to one and all present there. Um, first of all, I would like to record my sincere thanks to uh, Dr. Balakrishna, as well as uh, the uh, organizing committee members of uh, NUS Ratnamas and Science College for uh, inviting me to deliver this uh, plenary session in the international conference. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Um, just a minute. Is it visible? Yes, madam, you are visible. Your slides are also visible. Is it okay now? Yes, madam, you can go yes. for presentation view also. Okay. Okay, so um, today uh, my topic is eco-criticism. Uh, this is one of the emerging areas um, and uh, most of the universities, they prefer to introduce this uh, course as uh, the core paper and uh, elective papers. And most of our Indian University also introduces this paper uh, because we know today there is um, 
a glaring um, awareness regarding um, uh, green studies, eco-criticism, and the studies about nature. We know the reason that is the pandemic is one important reason that uh, how it has made us to see towards nature, to return back to nature that has become something very, very mandatory for the present uh, uh, situation. So um, I have planned, drafted my presentation, um, uh, three units. The first unit will be focusing on ecocritical definitions uh, and its um, aim and objectives. It also will focus on first wave uh, of uh, first and second wave of eco-criticism, and uh, it will also focus on eco-critical consciousness. The second unit will be focusing on anthropocentrism and speciesism specifically. It will also focus on landscape uh, studies, um, how uh, nature has um, shifted, the paradigm has shifted to culture, and uh, it will be focusing on uh, the sense of place, and how uh, nature is being stereotyped and uh, how nature versus culture is being uh, studied from eco-critical perspective. And the third unit will be focusing on deep ecology, bioregionalism and veganism. So these are the, uh, again, uh, the bifurcation of eco-critical studies and the emerging areas, concepts and ideologies pertaining with eco-critical studies. Okay. So to begin, uh, I would like to begin with um, a poem, an epic poem like uh, written by Ammon. The title of the poem is very strikingly garbage. Garbage is something that we never look at. Garbage is something that, that has become something, you know, um, we don't want to look at it, something that has been uh, concealed from the sight of uh, human beings. We don't, don't want to give any kind of attention towards garbage. So this is something called the baseline of T.S. Eliot. And he nailed the uh, bell for uh, the wasteland that has been, uh, you know, the land that has been converted into wasteland uh, during our industrial and modern uh, digital world. So garbage is a poem uh, which speaks about from the perspective of garbage. So this is something, something that is being uh, dedicated. Just a minute, I have a disturbance. Mana class longer, ma. So um, sorry for the disturbance. So. Um, so this is something from the perspective of uh, uh, um, uh, bacteria and uh, tumble bugs and uh, the scavengers. And these are the species we never pay attention to. These are the species, they can be considered as makers. They make something new from the thrown out, thrown out things and uh, they make something that is Please don't disturb me. So they make something out of the trash, something new that is being uh, created out of uh, trash. Sorry, sorry. So um, uh, garbage is something that has uh, that is being thrown by human beings without any consideration, without um, um, uh, looking at its, um, you know, um, you know, it, it becomes something unwanted. It is something thrown out. So this is the poem which is dedicated to these pieces, which make something new, as well as how they make something new. So this is actually dedicated to poetic composition. The poem has two elements to be addressed by Ammon, how poetry, which has been created out of language, language is a sort of trash, and how something new is created by the poets, by the makers, just like how these bacteria scavengers 
and the tumble bugs, they create something new. They refresh this world. Uh, without these species, in fact, our world will become something, you know, or, you know, or something that is you can't imagine. So as we know that we are living in this Anthropocene, uh, the era of Anthropocene, where anthropocentrism is something which has made the wasteland, the trash land, everything. So we are piling all our wastages and uh, industrial waste, every sort of waste, and it is stinking and it becomes something brownish and creamy white. And these are the, you know, the arrogance of human beings throwing the garbage. And we become so indifferent to look at the garbages. We never have any pleasing sight towards the garbages. We never look at the garbages. Do we ever do that? We throw it out something and we just uh, whisk away from the places. Do we ever care about to look at these garbages to, uh, to see that what kind of process is happening? We should respect even our own garbages. So this is a sort of a poem dedicated to these species which are invisible, which are immaterial, which are not valuable to human species. But in fact, these are the species they produce something valuable. They, uh, in fact, they uh, want to say that they refresh this world. Otherwise, it becomes so sticky. So this is something a very striking poem. Uh, I found uh, this poem will be very relevant to introduce my topic. And the second the striking uh, information that I came across in an essay called The Natural History of Selburn which was written by Gilbert White in 1789. He is actually a naturalist. And uh, in, in his group of letters, this whole uh, essay is nothing but uh, a compilation of uh, his letters, which he wrote in uh, 1789. And in that, he made a reference to, in 1756, uh, he made a reference to one particular village, Selburn village, which is existing in England, where he made an address about the event, the phenomena that happened in the vigor of Selburn. Uh, the vigor of this place, um, you know, he planted the trees uh, around the slaughter house. In opposite to his uh, residence, there was a slaughter house. Uh, there is a slaughter house and he doesn't want to put the blood the vast, uh, the, the, the meat waste just being thrown into, uh, into the ground. So that was something, a very sickening sight for this river. So to hide this slatter house, he planted some lime trees around his uh, residence. So this is something, uh, a term called arboreal. Arboreal is nothing but living amidst nature. So he wanted to create a temporary a kind of uh, you know, um, arboreal existence, just like other, uh, um, you know, animals that live amidst um, wilderness. He wanted to uh, do that in order to hide this. But do you think this kind of concealment is a permanent concealment? Are we um, uh, don't want to see the bloodsheds and uh, the butchering of animals? Because as consumers of the meat and flesh and uh, uh, you know, this is something that is happening uh, in our day-to-day -day life, that so many animals are uh, being killed, butchered, and slaughtered, and this is something, uh, they raise the question, this concealment is something that is uh, no use to these uh, animals, the species that we consume, and uh, so uh, this is something very interesting uh, incident, after this vigor has done that, the uh, the civil society has planned this particular village in such a way that they wanted to place all the slatter houses away from the town site. And uh, this particular uh, event also has uh, uh, motivated uh, uh, our own romantic poet Shelley to become a vegetarian. So we have some interesting snippets uh, pertaining with this particular essay as well as the event that happened in Selburn. So even today, this city seems to be very uh, greenish and uh, very uh, environmentally friendly because of uh, the efforts made by Gilbert White, um, being a naturalist. And, uh, and another thing that um, this particular uh, event also 
made me to question one more issue, made me to reveal one more uh, uh, concept like faceless meat. We are consuming meat and the other uh, sort of uh, you know, um, uh, animals that we consume. They don't have the, their own faces to reveal themselves, but we consume these faceless um, uh, species for our own pleasure, for our own, uh, you know, uh, filling our own appetite. So that is a concept which is uh, speaking for the animals. So it comes under animal rights. So this concealment is something that never going to uh, conceal the face of the animals which are in uh, uh, no, peril. So concealment is something that is happening between nature and human beings. So that is an effort made by uh, you know, uh, human beings very consciously. So this is something that um, uh, makes the eco-critical consciousness uh, or it uh, uh, invokes such consciousness to human beings. And so because of this kind of contributions, deliberations by writers like Gilbert White, naturalists like Gilbert White and the poems like Garbage, that, uh, you know, that invokes such questions to think about differently about nature. Nature is not something that is given freely to us. When I say freely, I just remember even Barry Commoner's uh, theory, Law of Ecology. He proposed four sorts of uh, laws where uh, the first law of ecology speaks about everything is connected with everything else. So this entire ecosystem is something which is connected with, you know, uh, they, have, they have a very close uh, 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 cycling, you know, web cycling. So they have their own symbiotic balances. If any one species is being disturbed or any one um, ecosystem is being disturbed, whether it is aquatic system or uh, any land or uh, any other types of uh, uh, species is being disturbed or it become extinct, it definitely affects the symbiotic balance uh, for which they have been made. So symbiotic balance is something that is because of every equal proportion is there for all the animals. So according to this ecological propositions, we are the most unwanted species on this earth. Without us, the earth can live, it can prolong and it can exist because uh, uh, human being, homo sapiens started the uh, uh, inhabiting this planet Earth roughly 4.5, I mean, uh, I mean, roughly 10,000 years. But the age of this planet Earth is 4.5 billion years. So you must have to, uh, you know, think about how new we have been to this planet Earth and uh, the planet Earth had been there and it has been there without us also. So, so it is our proposition, our equation is something that is very, very negligent. In fact, we are the uh, you know, super consumers of uh, all the natural resources compared to the other species that uh, they contribute something. In fact, all the species, they contribute something. So with this introduction, I would like to start my presentation. I think it has become a very elaborate presentation. Of course, I was talking about uh, Barry Commoner's uh, ecological laws. The first law is that uh, everything is connected with everything else. And uh, the second law is everything must go somewhere. So this again, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce this law again uh, here. Uh, uh, human beings, they produce so many unwanted artifacts. Uh, for instance, plastic is something which is not relatively uh, you know, and natural resources of uh, this planet Earth, it is out and out a cultural product of human beings. When I say it is a cultural product, naturally it is to be understood as an artifact. So it is an artifact without which you can exist. So it is not something that like other natural products, which is very mandatory for human existence or the existence of uh, this uh, planet Earth or other species. But we started producing so much of unwanted plastics and uh, we must know the way to destroy them also. But we don't have such bacterias to, um, you know, as I said, the bacterias are the makers. Uh, 
uh, they actually regenerate this planet Earth. But we don't have, unfortunately or fortunately, the bacteria to decay the products, uh, the synthetic products that has been uh, created by human beings. So where to dump this artificial or uh, artifacts, which is not at all, uh, you know, is not related to this planet Earth. So where we have to dump this? So this planet Earth is not a place to dump them. So where exactly? So that is why the second law speaks uh, speaks about this. And the third law is nature knows everything. So we should not take nature as something to be tamed or to be something that is very silent and uh, a silent spectator, not like that. Nature knows it has its own cyclic process. It has its own regeneration process. And any attempt made by man to disturb the cycle, to disturb the, uh, you know, uh, the functioning of natural process is something that disturbs the cycle itself, the ecosystem itself, the biosphere itself. So that is what we have been facing, the ozone layers and other sorts of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, ocean, uh, uh, water rise and uh, soil depletion, everything you know, um, erosion, everything because of our uh, deforestation. So men made effort disturbs, disturbs and nature knows its own, um, you know, uh, mending, uh, you know, efforts and everything. And fourth lie is something that there is nothing called as free lunch. So this is something, a kind of, um, you know, uh, a kind of a nail that has been uh, um, uh, you know, blown on the face of uh, uh, human beings uh, uh, to nail on anthropocentrism. Uh, it is a kind of a voice raised from the perspective of deep just because it says that, uh, you know, you don't have, you, you cannot consider nature as something that has been offered to you as a free meal. No, it has its own validity. It has its own, uh, you know, uh, reservations. So nature is not something that should be considered as a muted, uh, silenced uh, being. It should not be. So with this, I start my presentation. So this is the definition. I hope that most of you must be aware of uh, what is eco-criticism with all as the start. Anyway, but uh, I will give uh, the definition and how it has started. The term eco-criticism is being applied for the first time by uh, Michael P. Branch in his essay called Literature and Ecology, an Experiment in Eco-Criticism, way back. Uh, in 1978. Uh, so, um, I, but despite the fact that Boyd, uh, it was used by William Rukert in 1978, it remained in dormantry for so many long years. Uh, also, we have another term which is associated with eco criticism is ecology, and that was uh, used by Paul Krober in his essay, Home at Brasmere Ecological Holiness, in 1974. But these two terms, both eco-criticism as well as ecology, they remained dormant for so many long years. But only at 1989, uh, by the efforts of uh, Cheryl Brodfelty, it became revived. It started uh, coming to academia, coming to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, eco-critical consciousness impact. So, uh, as, a, uh, as an initiative, uh, substantially, she has started ASLE uh, along with the uh, Herald Forum. And uh, this ASLE is Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, which has its own uh, in-house uh, journal called Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment, which was started in 1993. So what is eco-criticism according to Cheryl Glotfelty? It is a relationship between literature and the physical environment. And this eco-critical study is something which is similar to feminist studies. In feminist uh, criticism, which examines the application of language uh, in the performing art like literature. 
how language is has been used by uh, main writers uh, in the product like artifact like literature so from a uh, gender perspective with the gender consciousness this has been examined in feminist literature or feminist criticism similar to that eco criticism is also making all efforts to um, find the relationship between literature and physical environment and this is again quite similar to marxist study also uh, in marxism um, it brings the awareness of modes of product and uh, it also focuses on the superstructure the economic class of uh, the society so eco criticism makes such uh, connection between literature and the physical environment and it is something that is earth centered approach to literary studies and of course eco critical studies also examines human perception of wilderness so wilderness with emphasize i said here because wilderness uh, you know as a raw nature is different in different uh, conceptions that we will uh, we'll see when we see the landscapes so wilderness literature is also there when you when you go to new literature canadian literature australian literature and uh, any indigenous literature this wilderness has some uh, has a different connotation and denotation uh, with the people uh, who have inhabited this particular wilderness so landscape is something that differs from uh, you know uh, uh, people to people culture to culture and reorientation also so this eco critical studies also perceives the wilderness and how this wilderness has changed over the period into different landscapes like pastoral land villages urban cities so this kind of paradigm shift is also studied so landscape studies or eco critical studies cannot be done individually it has to be studied studied with the culture because it is culture which brings all the changes to the land to the wilderness so culture as well as eco critical studies they go hand in hand it is in this way it becomes interdisciplinary also so we know how popular culture has its own uh, you know contribution towards uh, uh, converting this um, landscape into something called uh, super uh, uh you know urban uh, cosmopolitan or a metropolitan or a digitalized uh, world so we have to think in different paradigms how nature is placed in different paradigms and what is the thing that is happening with what are the changes what are the transmissions and how it has become transcendent that is to be studied from the eco critical perspective so this is um, another uh, uh, eco critical definition how eco critical studies makes a political uh, you know mode of studies keeping some political agenda brings out certain uh, political agenda or revealing certain political agenda between uh, you know the policies that has been observed the policies that have been uh, uh, you know evoked or invoked or uh, studied or analyzed so eco critical studies makes this political studies and uh, it also brings certain synthesis uh, this is uh, this is a quotation from greg arred a uh, very famous uh, eco critic and uh, he says that uh, it it is a political agenda and uh, it has its own insights with the critical movements eco feminist socio uh, social ecologist and environmental justice and it seeks a synthesis of environmental and social concern further we have to see uh, laurel boyle a very important eco critic and according to laurel boyle eco criticism is just like what cheryl lotfelty has said that it is a relationship between literature and environment 
But there is some difference in Laurel Bowles' definition about ecoprofessionalism when he says it is done with the spirit of commitment to environmentalist practice. So that is how it differs from what the Cheryl Blatt has said. So here the environmentalist praxis is given more weightage uh, to analyze the relationship between literature and environment. And we have our own Victorian poet who have sensed uh, nature in different perspective. When he spoke about how human beings, they make all sorts of interactions with the natural surroundings, uh, with the natural spaces and places, consistently to produce some meanings. So we attain, we gain, or we observe, we, we gain some meaning when we engage with the natural spaces. So it is through natural spaces only or surroundings only or natural objects only that human beings are able to produce meanings. So this is some observation made by Matthew Arnold. Similarly, John Ruskin's famous pathetic fallacy also makes similar uh, engagement with the nature. Nature is, seems to be, according to John Ruskin, as something which reflects uh, our emotions. So our emotion seems to be being reflected through our environment, and that is something which can be termed as eco-consciousness. For instance, he spoke about the storm cloud of the 19th century, as well as the modern plague cloud. These are the, some of uh, the important, uh, you know, um, uh, climate-related, uh, um, you know, um, uh, the topic that he has discussed in his essay, the cloud, uh, the strong cloud of the 19th century, as well as the plague cloud, uh, where he spoke about the damages of industries done on climate changes. So uh, he spoke about the plague cloud as, according to John Deskin, the definition of plague cloud is a dry black wave, bitter wind, and bleached sun. So this is how he made his observance uh, about uh, the cloud, uh, the climate changes that are affected because of industrial um, revolution. And also the American uh, transcendentalist like Emerson also say, uh, voiced such uh, nature oriented uh, uh, concept like nature is something that always wears the colors of the spirit of human beings. So these are the, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, the back uh, background or uh, how we can you know, uh, get certain uh, inputs from such great thinkers regarding nature or eco-criticism. Let's see the objectives of uh, eco-critical study. Eco-criticism examines uh, from the standpoint of eco-critical justice, species justice with a focus on socio-political frames for reading literary and cultural facts for the following reasons. So, it focuses on environmental justice, species justice, with a focus on socio-political frames. So let us see what is the role of place in our life. We never think in that perspective, but eco-criticism emphasizes to examine, to re-evaluate the places that is we are surrounded with. So, which is physical as well as cultural, symbolic, and material. So, place is not only refers to physical places, but also the cultural places. And when I say cultural places, to celebrate certain rituals, we go to some of our villages. It is culturally oriented. The rituals, the place, and uh, the culture, everything is, um, you know, uh, you might have seen how some indigenous people, they they celebrate certain into particular festivals in particular places. Not only indigenous people, we also do that. We go to some particular temple uh, to offer our uh, you know um, you know rituals and practices and customs and everything. So place is symbolic. It is material. Material when you possess it as a sort of your wealth to show up your wealth. It is a material product. So it is also a physical product as well as cultural product and symbolic and material product. And again, eco-criticism makes you to see how nature is being stereotyped. Most often it is being stereotyped similar to how women are being stereotyped.
so it has more uh, uh, similarity and um, you know uh, uh, the voices um, uh, which is uh, you know echoed uh, by feminist we also see similar sort of uh, subjugation done to nature nature is often associated with women so the silence of women can be seen in the silence of nature that is the kind of equation given to nature's silence so that sort of analysis observation is done through eco critical studies so students who are doing or taking up uh, eco critical studies they can study any uh, text that they are going to select from these are from these perspectives so from uh, from the perspective of environmental justice or species justice and uh, socio political frames these are the different lenses or uh, theoretical frames they can make use of when it comes to land they can uh, study from the perspective of physical or cultural or symbolic and material perspectives and how nature is being stereotyped and um, uh, from the linguistic aspect also nature can be studied like how the expressions and signs of nature as an environmental consciousness is embedded in the given text so these are the different possibilities to look at uh, the text and it also gives space to to see the constant tension between nature and culture as opposing binaries whenever you speak about nature the immediate binary is culture only because nature is being cultured that uh, uh, in the later slides i will explain to you so this is also one of the major uh, uh, you know uh, major area of a study and it also focuses on the hierarchy of man over other species and uh, over no humans in fact and it also speculates on various inequalities ideologies through which uh, this hierarchy is maintained for instance anthropocentrism where human is creating the center the center is for um, you know man is created and other species is being uh, pushed to the periphery or marginalized and the next thing is it also focuses on cultural aspects like patriarchy and sexism and uh, this becomes how the hierarchy hierarchy is superior within human species so among the human species how hierarchy is maintained based on race color culture and uh, economic factors and race um, and communal factors it also speculates on the assumption of rationality and reason as the highlight of human behavior so we we observe or we celebrate this anthropocentrism because of uh, you know uh, the qualities of or the uh, you know rationality and reason seems to be the prime factors to uh, develop such arrogance against the silent the silence of nature understand so human uh, further uh, it also helps us to understand how human as a coherent bounded or self contained entity and this anthro uh, Uh, eco critical study questions it speculates or it questions and enquiries about this um, you know um, um, what to say that um, the coherent bound or self contained entity you know self declaration of uh, uh, you know um, giving focus to uh, human beings and their prominence um, anthropocentrism to be simple and it also studies the other uh, uh, you know concepts like colonialization post colonialization industrial modernity and capitalism and post modern studies because how this nature is being manipulated um, uh, to uh, meet the needs of a modern uh, you know uh, millennial uh, uh, citizens so nature is being converted into subjugated into or subverted into or nature is becoming a sort of an agency to uh, you know implement the arrogance of anthropocentrism can be seen so can be studied uh, using uh, eco critical lenses further it also checks underlying ecological values how ecological value is being underestimated or not uh, considered into account 
and uh, what is meant by the word nature itself is something which is very complex some of the natural uh, uh, eco critics they they found that the term nature is very very complex to define as such and that is why to understand nature because when you say wilderness it entirely different from when you say pastoral land or when you say urban cities so it has uh, we have nature in the urban cities also but what is the equation of the nature in urban cities or pastoral village with the wilderness of the wood so how to term them are they different natures and nature to one in one culture is different from nature in other culture so defining this term nature itself requires a lot of you know um, theoretical analysis so that is one thing that is uh, being done uh, can be done with the eco critical studies and it also questions whether the examination of place should be a distinctive category are we aware of this kind of landscape uh, you know uh, you know what to say that landscape consciousness because we know we have done much studies like gender studies class differences racial differences everything have we ever done landscape consciousness or have we ever uh, uh, aware of these kinds of landscapes and the culture that is uh, entwined with these kinds of studies so that is something can be studied these are the different avenues i am just uh, uh, focusing on here and it also makes uh, a kind of uh, uh, a post structural literary representation and cultural representation from the environmentalist point of view and it can be reread as a canonical text because we have it questions or a re uh, you know uh, it establishes a sort of uh, re-examination to be done with the canonical text, the established text from the perspective of earth-centered approach. So that is something done. So it re-examines and, uh, uh, and it questions all the established notions and the text, uh, the so-called canonical text. And from the feminist point of view, ecofeminism is something which has been uh, a parallel study of ecocritical study and it has been uh, done it has been uh, um, now very emerging study also we can say so eco feminist critics also they study about nature uh, parallelly with the feminist approach to question the uh, the centering of patriarchal society or male chauvinistic society and the position of women and nature and how they have been subjugated and how uh, that is a, a kind of uh, parallel silence that is exist or that has been uh, uh, you know they have been silenced in fact so the victimization so that is being done uh, to both nature as well as women is being studied so further um, it makes interconnection between nature and culture so when you study about nature naturally you will be studying about culture because it is through culture culture is um, you know um, etymologically it refers to growth and uh, in anthropocentrism it refers to knowledge so the, a study about culture that is cultural studies uh, entwines uh, a study about human behavior attitude everything so he uh, when you study about human behavior attitude beliefs morality art forms and everything literature is something a part of the cultural studies and this um, you know uh, the behavior and articulation or re human representation is done through the mediums uh, through the medium called the language so we use language and uh, the performing art like literature and eco uh, sorry nature becomes a something a kind of an artifact how this raw wilderness is being manipulated or exploited in the form of culture so these are all the uh, interdisciplinary areas where you have to study focusing on all these disciplines or uh, you know um, 
um, courses. So that is what the nature is something when you study about nature, you have to also see about or focus on culture. When you study about culture, how nature is being, culture is also studied because it is part of our artifacts. So it is done through language and literature. So what exactly eco-criticism does is it keeps one foot in literature and other foot on land and makes use of theoretical discourses and does a sort of negotiation between human and the non-human. So this is uh, the quote from Claude Felty again. And uh, eco-critical studies also discovers nature as absence, as silence, as gendered, how these silences, absences, absence referent, there is a term called absence referent that I will speak to you when I speak about veganism, that is embedded in the text and that is um, construed as environmental representation and uh, aesthetic and political analysis can be done to this kind of representation and uh, how gender is being focused, class, race, all this is uh, embedded in the text can be studied. <clears throat> now, coming to um, a representation in uh, How Green Was My Valley, way back in 1939 by Richard um, Levelin. Uh, he, uh, I, I, I take a quote, a quote from his uh, text, uh, How Green Was My Valley. He uh, empathizes with the nature and uh, calling her as patience. No, no, she, uh, he admires the patience of nature. And he says that there is patience <clears throat> in the earth to allow us to go into her and dig and hurt with the tunnels and shafts. And if we put back the flesh, we have torn from her and so make good what we have weakened. She is content to let us bleed her, but when we take a bleed, she has a soreness and an anger. So she waits for us and finding us bears down, makes us part of her, flesh of her, with our clay in place, in place of the clap was <clears throat> thoughtlessly half smelt away. So this is a very important quote. I found it very relevant to understand eco-critical studies. So that is uh, how um, unsympathetic or uh, uh, stoic we have been to nature. That here nature is being per, uh, personified as a woman, and how uh, you know her uh, you know her uh, flesh is being torn, and uh, she is bleeding and she is soaring due to our industrialization, urbanization, or culturing of the land. This is one important quote that helps me to define what is eco-criticism in a better way. And one more quote from Kate Rigby. <coughs> Excuse me. So culture constructs a prism through which we know nature. So it is through culture only we understand nature. We begin to internalize this prism from the moment we learn to speak. So when a baby began to speak, it is being culturized. The baby understands nature only through the culture, the culture in which he or she is being brought up. The moment that is that we are introduced into the logos, the world are shaped by language. <coughs> so nature, is studied through the prism called culture. That is what uh, we understand uh, from this quote from Kate Rigby. And further, nature is thus robbed of its inherent significance and is subverted as a mere cultural and linguistic construct. This is another important uh, quote from Barry. <coughs> so, how linguistically it can be interpreted is what uh, we have to understand. The next slide will show us cultural, uh, sorry, eco-critical consciousness. We tend to develop this eco-critical consciousness when we read the text, the following list of texts, excuse me. Thank <clears throat> you. 
it all started with uh, uh, Rachel Carson's uh, The Silent Spring. She made such a uh, telling uh, impact on environmental studies when uh, fertilizers were used abundantly in American society. She went against these industries, chemical industries, uh, for using this uh, uh, you know, chemical uh, fertilizers. And uh, after this work was published, uh, the industries were banned. The industries were banned. Similarly, another important work is Raymond Williams, The County and the City, and uh, Annette Colandis, The Lay of the Land, which is spoken from the perspective of feminism, how land is similar to a female, uh, uh, the body of the female. And our own Jonathan Batt, uh, the father of uh, uh, British eco-critical studies, uh, and his romantic ecology seems to be very important work. And uh, Leslie Marman Silko's ceremony is again a very important uh, fiction. Um, um, those who want to uh, understand or those who want to familiarize themselves with eco-critical studies, these are the fundamental uh, uh, you know, uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, text that they have to familiarize themselves. And uh, another important work is Sola Strong, which is uh, written by uh, Linda Hogan, and uh, which spoke uh, for the people, the tribal people of uh, American uh, society, when they race against for constructing a dam across a river, they wanted to, you know, uh, revolt it. So against uh, industrial capitalism. So this is what, uh, or this is how uh, ecocritical consciousness can be kindled, can be developed. Now coming to the differences between uh, American ecocritical approach and uh, <clears throat> United Kingdom's critical approach, because uh, even the title, the title for this uh, uh, course or this discipline varies. When it comes to uh, eco-critical uh, uh, approach, it, uh, Americans, uh, they prefer this eco-critical approach. Whereas uh, uh, British uh, environmentalists, they prefer uh, green literature or green studies. So that is a variation. And uh, even in their approach, uh, they vary. Uh, nature, how they approach to nature. Americans, they celebrate uh, nature, for instance, starting from transcendentalism uh, till today. Uh, <clears throat> they want to reflect upon nature as a sort of uh, a romanticization of nature. Uh, of course, we too have in uh, British literature much of romanticization of nature. But uh, when, when you take up American approach, it was more like a celebratory in tone. Whereas in British, it is minatory, minatory against uh, environmental hazards done by governmental, industrial, commercial, new uh, colonial forces. For example, Jonathan Bates, The Song of the Earth 2000, which argues that colonialism and deforestation have frequently gone together. So when uh, uh, Britishers, <clears throat> uh, British Empire, they expanded their colonization. They also did much, much damage to the forest uh, in the form of deforestation by, uh, you know, uh, in the name of civilized, you know, uh, bringing civilization uh, in the colonized areas, in the colonized countries, in the name of, uh, you know, uh, civilizing the people or constructing huge uh, buildings and uh, bringing down a lot of infrastructure. In fact, they went for deforestation. So colonization has close affiliation with the deforestation. And this has been pointed out by Jonathan Bates uh, in his the Song of the Earth 2000. So that is why uh, the British stone is always very minatory. Minatory means a kind of a warning uh, given to the exploitators. Now, how eco-critical study has emerged in America that uh, we'll see from, uh, it all started with the transcendentalists like uh, Emerson, uh, Margaret Fuller and Henry David Thoreau. They seems to be considered as the pioneers of eco-critical studies. 
And according to Emerson, he has published his work in Nature in 1836, which is his manifesto. And in this particular essay, he speaks about the principle of the philosophy of transcendentalism, where he proposes his hypothesis to account for nature by other principles than those of carpentry and chemistry. Emerson talks about uh, the mystical unity of nature, uh, and he also urges the readers to enjoy a relationship with the, the environment. So that seems to be a pioneering effort. Also, uh, another uh, transcendentalist uh, called Margaret Fuller, when she was, uh, she was the first women student of Harvard University way back in 1843. When she was studying in uh, Harvard University, she wrote this Summer on the Lakes. And this, uh, this work, you know, it reflect her own perception about nature and how nature has become a sort of, uh, you know, uh, molded, it has molded her personality during her formative period. And she has uh, abundantly, uh, you know, uh, contributed or uh, she made a kind of uh, relationship, a deep relationship with the natural elements. And she perceived and reflected upon in her own uh, life, in shaping her own life as well as her personality. So it is a very important work as far as uh, uh, eco-critical study is concerned uh, in America. And our very important uh, writer, Henry David Thoreau's Walden is a very important um, and a vital uh, contribution as far as uh, nature study is concerned, which he has done uh, uh, staying in uh, near this uh, Walden Pond in Massachusetts for nearly two years. And he wrote uh, uh, about his own experience. I went to woods because I wished to live deliberately, to friend to only the essential facts of life and see if I could not, I could not learn what, what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover, and that I had to leave Walden. So this is um, taken from Walden. So he, he actually uh, experimented with his own, uh, uh, you know, solitary existence amidst uh, natural surroundings near this Walden pond. And he made observance, observation uh, with the keen eyes um, and he pointed out his philosophical reflection uh, with the high scriptedness, uh, how uh, he made that uh, remarkable creatures and uh, uh, happenings around this pond and the places is something that is highly philosophical. And in fact, he, uh, this experience has hailed him as the saint of nature. Uh, uh, the later American naturalist, they call, they consider uh, Toru as the saint of nature and uh, because the kind of experience he has narrated in this particular piece of writing is something which is inevitable as far as nature writing is concerned. So his encounterance with the natural world and the way he discusses his experience and what he emphasizes in this work is living in harmony with the nature is something purifying one's own soul. So in fact, many later critics, they accepted as far as American tradition of nature is concerned, Thoreau seems to be the master, uh, master pioneer of uh, nature writing. Coming to um, uh, just as we have different waves of feminism, uh, we also have uh, first wave of eco criticism, second wave of eco criticism, third wave, and uh, today what we have is fourth wave of eco-critical studies. So what was happening in the first wave of eco-critical studies? Let us see now. Laurel Buell, uh, in his text called The Future of Environmental Criticism, which he wrote in 2005, where he made this kind of categorization. So only in this work, The Future of Environmental Criticism, he made this categorization of first wave of criticism, eco-criticism, second wave of eco-criticism, like that. So, according to Lawrence Bouvel, in the first wave of uh, eco-critical studies, it is characterized by its emphasis on nature writing. 
nature writing as an object of study and as a meaningful practice. This is what the entire tendency of first wave of ecocritical studies. And in this, it is uh, the focus, the central point is, um, you know, it, 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 environmental crisis of that particular age is also focused, seeing um, nature as a duty of both the humanities and the natural sciences to raise awareness and invent solution for a problem that is both cultural and physical, the primary concern of first wave eco-criticism was to speak for nature. So this is a quote from Bhuvel again. So this wave, unlike uh, the second wave, third wave, and uh, other waves, it kept the culture, cultural distinction between human and nature, promoting the value of nature. So the intention, the tendency, the approach of this particular wave of eco-criticism is to promote nature, celebrate nature, and uh, to study about nature. That seems to be the prominent intention of these writers. Solitary observation of nature and society and engagement in social matters also set into motion. This wave also sought to connect readers' awareness to environmental ethics. That is uh, another uh, kind of concept called environmental ethics uh, that speaks about the land ethics and other species ethics, every other ethics it speaks about. So, <clears throat> so this wave makes such connection with the environmental ethics. It ignores urban spaces and heavily populated areas maintaining the culture of natural dualism. So it is not uh, focusing, might be in the fourth wave of uh, eco-critical studies, it is focusing on urban civilization, urban uh, nature, landscape and uh, every other things. But in the first uh, eco-critical wave of eco-criticism, it maintained itself, you know, it is, uh, uh, it ignored such uh, developments. <coughs> and, uh, Interestingly, uh, Kovacic, uh, he formed uh, a term called a zero wave. He is also one important uh, eco, -critical, uh, uh, eco critic. And he uh, made the, such a division, no? before such a division, uh, first wave, second wave, before such divisions, there existed a zero wave. So that is the uh, interesting coinage uh, by Kovacic. Now, coming to um, second wave of eco-criticism, here, interestingly, eco second wave of eco-criticism is, uh, can be studied uh, or understood better from one particular work written by Joseph Meekers, uh, uh, particularly his work called The Comedy of Survival, which he wrote in 1974, where he proposed a version of his argument um, the uh, dominating eco-critical and the environmental philosophy. So he put forth eco-critical dominance as well as environmental philosophy as a concept, the key concept of second wave of eco-criticism, particularly in his work, The Comedy of Survival. Particularly, this can be studied better when he made the uh, categorization into uh, tragedy and comedy uh, you know, he made the observation on tragedies and comedies starting from Dante's period, uh, Dante's Shakespeare up to the modern writers like E. O. Wilson. He studied how tragedy can be defined from the perspective of eco-criticism, how comedy can be defined from the perspective of eco-criticism. <clears throat> According to him, what is tragedy? Tragedy was exclusively the creation of Western civilization arising out of its heroic myths, while comedy was very nearly universal, occurring wherever human culture is making it literary ecology, the study of relationship between the literary arts and the scientific ecology. So he made such a clear distinction between what is tragedy, culturally uh, you know, uh, observed tragedy or defined tragedy from the perspective of eco-critical studies, and what is comedy <clears throat> and glorification of separation of culture from nature and elevation of the former to uh, moral predominance is being focused 
uh, in this particular period. And this is the period where uh, focus uh, or um, the emergence of anthropo study is also done. So anthropo study, uh, anthropocentrism is identified as the tragic conception of a hero. See, what is tragic uh, tragedy? It is uh, the story about the tragic hero. So anthropocentrism is something which is very, very um, pivotal for defining a tragedy. So with that, it, uh, there is no tragedy without a tragic hero in, uh, from the uh, you know, uh, definition of Aristotelian uh, you know, um, poetics. So the plot is something that is spinning around the uh, fall and ebb of the tragic hero with his reconciliation or whatever it is. So we know what his tragedy is. So anthropocentrism seems to be the key factor, the key concept that uh, permits um, this tragedy to happen. So tragic conception of a hero whose moral struggle are more important than mere biological survival. So when we give more importance to tragedy, tragic hero, it becomes much oriented with focusing more on anthropocentrism and pushing to the marginality about biological survival, ecosystem, or other species, everything. Then the science of animal ethnology shows that a comic mode of muddling through and making no love with war has superior ecological value. So in this second wave of eco-criticism, they also understood how War brings a lot of damages, not only to human material, but also to the ecological system, nature and everything. So making no love with the war seems to be the echo of this particular uh, second wave of eco-critical uh, um, studies. Then, uh, productive and stable ecosystem minimize destructive suggest aggressions, encourage maximum diversity and seek to establish equilibrium among their participants, which is essentially what happens to literary comedy. So productive and stable ecosystem is what seems to be the voice of this particular period. And uh, Joseph Meeker viewed biological life and cultural life as a reciprocal invoking Oscar Wilde's dictum that life imitates art at least as much as art imitates life. So Oscar Wilde, the famous quote, quotation, life imitates art at least as much as art imitates life seems to be reciprocally received when it comes to um, eco-critical studies, particularly um, this period. Now coming to uh, anthropocentrism. What is this anthropocentrism? How it all started? Who are the people who have sanctioned this anthropocentrism? How it has got so much of a telling impact over other species? Who are these anthropocentric um, you know, uh, people and the boys and everything? So we have different sanctions from different uh, representations. For instance, from religion, from tragedy or literature or from tradition and culture and also from uh, philosophers and other uh, great thinkers, they, their wordings are, for instance, scriptures that has accepted, that has given the sanction to celebrate this anthropocentrism. Let us see few examples from all these uh, varieties of representations to make a uh, human being as the center of this uh, planet Earth. So for instance here, Yes. So uh, from uh, the text, the, the scripture Genesis, um, look at the uh, quote, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man expo exploit nature for his proper ends. So religious sanction is given to human beings to exploit nature. The religious scripture itself says it is for Adam and Eve. Nature is created. So God has given his permission to exploit nature. So when you say this, naturally you are celebrating anthropocentrism. So religious sanction is given to human beings. 
So one sanction we have seen. The next sanction is how literature, utilizing um, 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 the tool called language, how we can, the discourse of, uh, you know, establishment, the discourse of uh, subjugation, the discourse of uh, marginalization has happened utilizing language. So classical tragedies, they reinforce the anthropocentric assumption that in nature exists for the benefit of mankind. This is something resisted by or revolted by the deep ecologist. Nature is not something that is existing for the benefit of mankind, but how the classical tragedy, just now we have seen that how tragedy uh, celebrates the tragic hero or uh, bringing him to the center, focusing, uh, making him as the mainstream <clears throat> voice of uh, amid, amidst other species. So literature gives such a space. And uh, let us see how the pastoral tradition, the different tradition also celebrates anthropocentrism. For instance, the pastoral tradition is a form of escapist fantasy, valorizing a tamed and idealized nature over wild, no less than urban so how nature is being tamed or nature is being idealized in the pastoral traditions. We have our own villages where we go for farming, agriculture and everything, how we are converting the natural land in order to feed ourselves, to uh, clothe ourselves, you know, to give shelter to us. We uh, you know, cut the trees and everything. We deform it or reform it, whatever changes we bring in in um, in, in nature, in the form of culture, uh, to establish human civilization is what is uh, another sanction that we have to look at. And again, the mathematician like, um, you know, a philosopher like Protagoras, way back in the Greek uh, uh, society, he said, man is the measure of all things. So you need not take any other samples for measuring the quality of life that is given in this world. Man is the measure of all things. So this particular, uh, you know, uh, maxim or, uh, you know, uh, caption says, validates that man himself is the measure of all things, nothing else. So this again, marginalizes other species. And uh, uh, Leonardo da sees the Vitruvian man, the picture on your right side, uh, the squaring of, uh, uh, the circle. Um, this picture, uh, uh, this is uh, a proportion, mathematical proportion of the human body, which becomes the basis for the most fundamental geometrical uh, structure and shape for constructing temple and big mansions. So this is the uh, uh, geometrical structure which has been utilized by the architect. Uh, uh, the engineers and other people in the ancient society exclusively in constructing temples, churches, and everything. So this is a mathematical the squaring, of, uh, squaring of the circle. This is uh, termed as squaring of the circle. So here in this construction also, human body becomes the center. Human body is taken as a geometrical structure for constructing uh, uh, um, uh, a building called a church and other uh, spiritual places. And our own Pope has uh, <clears throat> validated the proper study of mankind is man. So all these kinds of different sanctions uh, in his essay on uh, <clears throat> man, he has says the proper study of mankind is man. So that puts an end to you know, any other argument why not we celebrate anthropocentrism? So this is the uh, uh, <clears throat> legitimacy that has been sanctioned to celebrate this anthropocentrism. Then in anthropocentrism, what is done is human is the center of the world. So when you keep human as the center, naturally that invites hierarchy to be maintained. So what happens that leads to species hierarchy. 
we are ranking the species according to their uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, senses so human hierarchy is something that is based on anthropocentric uh, hierarchy so other species serve human needs this is how anthropocentrism looks at other species so other species are there because we have religious sanction we have other sorts of sanctions to make use of nature it is only for our own exploitation that has been uh, these uh, natural resources have been created and it has its own intrinsic value of the human to discriminate against other species so intrinsic value rationality coherent bond you no know, those things i have already uh, told you you know that positions him at the center it has you know human beings they have their own intrinsic values through their culture through their civilization through their rationality and uh, the articulation the even the physical structure the use of thumb and everything that makes him more dominant madam excuse me madam yes uh, madam the time is uh, now 1 13 actually 1 mm-hmm. o'clock please okay. can you can you give the brief sir madam yes yes okay Thank so you. moving on to next yeah yeah sure um so these are different landscapes i i wanted to discuss with you due to lack of time i just uh, show the screen can i get 10 more uh, minutes uh, yes madam yes madam uh, yeah. because we have we have to start the, the next sessions in the afternoon session but i think uh, okay fine have... fine i understand i understand i okay so these are the different landscapes um, um, like wilderness and uh, the scenic sublime and uh, the countryside and domestic picturesque so uh, this is uh, also termed as okiastic study uh, even in tamil literature uh, we have thinai studies we have different landscapes and different uh, culture oriented with that particular landscapes this is how uh, the landscape and the literature produced in that particular for instance i'll take one example here the wilderness uh, mostly we find american transcendentalist uh, writers contribution their epic their saga for instance literature like paradise last frankenstein moby dick uh, akilbari finn all this uh, written using this wilderness and in the case of um, uh, scenic sublime we find uh, again huckleberry finn paradise lost here forest lake mountain cliff waterfall seems to be the landscape and countryside when you come to countryside we have the landscape like hill field wood and we have romantic poets their contribution and in come to domestic picture we have park garden land lanes we have domestic fiction poetry and all that so literature varies culture varies according to the landscape so um, let us move on to um, nature culture um, nature is something that is conceived as a part of cultural practice uh, deity and derrida has argued that there is nothing outside of text but kate sopper defined nature as it is not language that has a whole in its ozone layer so i have told you already that how nature is being converted transmitted into uh, a sort of a cultural artifact and it has been operated accordingly by human beings so i don't want to spend much time on that because of uh, time lack of time and i wanted to introduce you to the new concepts like deep ecology uh, i had inter- i mean I, when i was preparing uh, i wanted to introduce you how deep ecology can be applied to some of the major literatures for instance um, um a tempest i wanted to discuss with the deep ecology i just show you this picture particularly the next picture where you can see uh, <clears throat> uh, caliban caliban is the representation of raw nature uh, how prospero looks at him and uh, you know prospero's uh, definition of caliban is something the deformed head scaly skin you know he is more uh, 
aligned with the aquatic life, look at the feet of uh, Caliban, um, all that. So, um, so he's a deformed head. So he represents the wilderness. Uh, so from deep ecologist point of view, uh, you cannot reform or deform nature. Nature is all by itself. When Caliban refused to civilize himself after learning the language from Prospero, he doesn't want to follow or doesn't want to change himself. So that is the response of um, you know, retaining his own um, natural self. It is the voice of the wilder nature. So very interestingly, uh, that one. And the next concept is bioregionalism, which is nothing but nativism. You should know or you should be aware of your own region. How many of you know thoroughly about the birds that are living in your region, the animals that are living in your region, the kind of landscape and the river bed or pond, or whatever, you know, the kind of flowers. We never look at them. So try to develop that kind of awareness or consciousness that will you know, make you understand your own spaces. So this is something against globalization. This is something against monocultural uh, celebration. Bioregionalism invites pluralistic representation, uh, domestic representation, your own regional representation. So next is uh, veganism. This is a very new area. Uh, a cultural representation or orientation uh, in the Western societies. I don't know whether how far it has been introduced in India, but uh, veganism is something that is um, there uh, in the Western society. It is nothing but observing a non-animal product uh, in our conception, in our uh, uh, you know artifacts and everything. Um, this veganism is uh, much closer to um, the rape of animal or butchering is something being associated with feminism and eco-feminism. For instance, if you look at this picture, you can understand how women body and animal body is being butchered, uh, being put into gaze, being consumed. Uh, I need not say much about this picture. I think you can understand how this veganist, uh, the vegan, Vegan is a fellow who observes this veganism and uh, it has been uh, uh, getting popularized in Western society. And the next picture also that will show the sexualized women or the absent referent. So I was in the first uh, slide, I shown you faceless meat. That is what is absent referent. The absent is the animal uh, face, the animal if you have the animal, you will not have the meat. So only in the absence of animal, you will have, you will have the meat. So that is the uh, connotation we have to understand. And um, that's it. Um, I thank the organizers for giving this wonderful opportunity to um, um, speak um, address um, uh, in this uh, international conference. Um, if you have uh, any queries, you can ask me. I extend my thanks to Balakrishnan, Dr. Balakrishnan, Dr. Kavi Arsu, and NSS Ratnam Arts and Science College for giving this wonderful opportunity to address before the participants. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, madam. Thank you. And see this uh, nice, madam. May I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Nice presentation, madam. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, because uh, what we, we have learned that audience can learn that uh, what is eco criticism. The madam has started with the garbage poem and the essay, uh, The Natural History of um, Selburns by that Gilbert White. At the same time, we know that what is eco-criticism? It's a study of relationship between literature and physical environments. Even 
we can listen that the, the cat is also visited physically in our sessions we enjoyed a lot at the same time madam touched upon that uh, matthew arnold john ruskin and uh, emerson uh, henry david thoreau and everything so in this sessions uh, there is no words uh, i can say it's a mind blowing session nice presentations and and uh, i hope the audience could uh, understand and i think this if there is any questions please audience you have any questions yeah there is an there are uh, appreciations in the chat box uh, the insightful presentations and everything i think yeah i think there is no questions in the chat box uh, thank you madam thank you very much madam it's my pleasure even, thank you even, i thank can you. learn much about the eco criticism uh, thank you so much thank you thank you yeah thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you jitin thank you ma'am so this is the end of the morning section i thank each and every dignitary staffs and participants for your involvement participation the paper presentation will begin in the afternoon section short short play at 2 pm the participants can join the presentation section session using the same zoom link the paper presentation list and the information regarding will be sent through the whatsapp group and i request the participants to follow the instructions given thank you thank you very much uh, thank you jitan
வணக்கம் ப்ரோ சார் ப்ரோ சார் வணக்கம் அமரேஷ் வணக்கம் டாக்டர் எஸ் வணக்கம் டாக்டர் எப்படி இருக்கீங்க நல்லா இருக்கேன் நானு மார்னிங் பிரசன்டேஷன் ரொம்ப நல்லா இருந்தது ஏ ஏ ஓகே சோ थैंक यू थैंक यू so much அமர் அமரேஷ் அமரேஷ் சார் இஸ் ரெடி நெக்ஸ்ட் ரூம் இதே லைன்ல வராரா இல்ல வேற ஒரு லேப்டாப்ல வராரா இல்ல அவர் அவர் லேப்டாப்ல வருவாரு நான் வந்து சும்மா பாக்க உட்கார்ந்திருக்கேன் என்ன என்ன நேம்ல வராரு டிரன் அமரேஷ் டிரன் இன்னும் வரல இன்னும் வரலையா அது வந்துட்டாரு அது ஹீரோ வந்துட்டாரு டாக்டர் ஹலோ வந்தாரா அது பாருங்க ஹலோ அங்க அங்க ஹீரோ வந்துட்டாரு எப்படி இருக்கீங்க அமரே சீருங்க உங்களை அம்மா பார்க்கன்னு சொன்னாங்க ஒரே ஒரு சருங்க அம்மா வணக்கம் 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 நல்லா இருக்கீங்களா நல்லா இருக்குமா நீங்க எப்படி இருக்கீங்க நல்லா இருக்கான் தம்பி நல்லா இருக்கீங்களா தம்பி பேசுவாரு வணக்கம் ஐயா வணக்கம் ஐயா வணக்கம் வணக்கம் அமரேஷா வணக்கம் சொல்லு cannot hear cannot hear you cannot hear you amresha cannot hear hello ma ah amresha vanakkam vanakkam iya vanakkam iya vanakkam vanakkam solla patti patti paathu romba nalla avudhu chaapteenga chaapteenga pa வேலங்க மாட்டது வேலங்க மாட்டது அமரிஷா டாக் ஐ அம் ஸ்பீக்கிங் தம்பி ஆ கூடி சீக்கிரம் பட்டி கேஸ் எல்லாம் குறஞ்ச பின்னாடி கண்டிப்பா அங்க தான் மோதல் வந்துட்டு இருப்போம் பட்டி ரொம்பنا வெச்சு பார்த்து கண்டிப்பா அங்க தான் பட்டி வேற எங்க சரி சரி அது 10 நாள் வெளியா <laughs> 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 என்ன 
Hello, Balakrishnan sir. Good afternoon. I am not able to connect uh, through the laptop, sir. Actually, and the host will let you soon in waiting message. The card is. Madam, good afternoon, madam. How are you? Yes, sir. Fine, sir. Uh, madam, uh, what is the uh, name the of your uh, laptop? Doctor N Maithili. No, no, madam, it is not here, madam. Please check once again. I have actually uh, left the meeting, and again I am uh, asking permission to join. Madam, probably the. Sir, is just a minute, sir. Please check the please check the Zoom link, madam. Connect to audio. Turn off. Okay, join. Good. So just check, sir. Madam, Maithili, uh, Lieutenant yes. Doctor N. Maithili. There is only one name. That too, you are in. I have a uh, search for uh, his name. You can check. Sir, is there any login by the name Vij Shrikant, sir? Please wait, madam. Let me check. VG, am I right? Yeah, Shri Kant. Actually, my son was writing his exam. VG Shri Kant. Yes, yes, it is here. Shri Kant VG, am I right? Yes, I'll just uh, change the mail and I'll come in, sir. Okay, no problem. You can uh, change your name. Yes, you are admitted. You. <clears throat> Okay. Madam, please check your uh, audio and video. Am I audible clearly, sir? Yes, you are audible, madam, but you are not uh, visible. Yes, now now you're visible. Yes, sir. 
Hello, so I'm audible. Yes, madam. Sir, I am audible. Uh, madam, a kind request, Dr. Maidili, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, please insist the presenters to uh, enable their video. We need to know the presenter. The presenters should uh, enable the video and audio when they present, okay? Okay, sir. Okay, okay, madam. A very good afternoon to all the presenters and the dignitaries who are in the meeting and the paper presenters can enable the video while you are presenting the papers. So for this paper presentation session, I invite uh, Lieutenant Dr. N. Mike Lee, uh, Assistant Professor of English, Sri Vasavi College, Erode. She possesses enriched uh, research experience focusing on translation studies, post-colonial literature, and ELT. To her credit, she had produced 11 PhD, uh, MPhil scholars and four PhD scholars currently uh, working on their uh, research work. She is acting as the NIRF coordinator and IQAC member of the college. She has also played the role of Chief Super, uh, Superintendent of Bardia uh, University examinations. In addition to her academic career, she also serves as the Associate NCC Officer of Senior Wing at uh, Sri uh, Vasavi College, affiliated to 15 Tamil Nadu uh, Battalion NCC. Arab at working with the students to successfully uh, to successfully, she prepares them for personal and professional success in today's world. To her credit, she has organized seven uh, seven day international web uh, web workshop on translation studies and three day workshop for students, as it's convenient. As an organizing secretary, conducted an international conference in collaboration with Bodhi International Journal on social per perspectives in language and literature. Published more than 15 ISSN, ISSN published uh, papers and 30 ISBN papers. Has presented 15 papers in international level conferences and 35 papers in national level conferences. She has chaired sections and also acted as a keynote speaker in conferences. She has been the guest speaker for various academic platforms. She is one of the editor of an ISBN book critical essay on translation studies and co-editor for ISSN journal, special issue on translation studies. She, uh, she has received awards like Award of Excellence, the best performer of the year 2015 in NCC, best teacher award from Kalaitai Arakatlai and merit for excellence in flag area, briefing the lecturer, I IP from Officers Training Academy, Gwalior, Madhya, uh, Madhya Pradesh. She has received Outstanding Women Achiever Award at International Women's Day Celebration in 2020, Sri Vasavi College, Erod. A committed faculty member, passionate about working to further enhance an educational offering of an institution. So I proudly uh, welcome you, ma'am, uh, for this uh, paper presentation session. I uh, request the participants to present the papers. First, uh, request Deeran Amrisha Kadirasan, Faculty of Law, University Malaya, Malaysia, to present this paper. Yeah, just a minute. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your introduction. So, we are moving to the paper presentation session of this, of this two day international online conference on innovations in English language, literature and culture. So just two lines in connection with this topic, language, verbal or nonverbal, is the central to the survival of mankind because it is an important tool for communication, negotiation and the transfer or preservation of the literary as well as the cultural heritage of people 
from one generation to the other. So this relationship between language, literature and culture is so strong to the extent that a change in one ultimately affects the other two. Every language is directly mirroring the culture itself. A language either enriches or improvises the culture itself. Therefore, the influence of language on the culture and literature of a people has dire consequences for the sustenance or development of their indigenous education. Such serves this international conference. In this regard, I would like to congratulate the team, Kavir sir, Balakrishnan sir, and his team, and also NAS Ratinam College of Arts and Science Commerce, Mumbai. And I wish the presenters a good day of knowledge gathering and enrichment. With this few note, I would like to start the paper presentation session. The first uh, presenter can go ahead and everyone is given four to five minutes for their paper presenting. You need not read the paper, kindly understand. You can sum up your hypothesis and what you want to prove through your research paper, which will be a really useful session to all the one who have gathered here in this literary forum. Thank you. You can start, sir. Dhiran, sir. Thank you, doctor. Um, doctor, could you enable screen sharing so that I can share my slide? All right, so is my screen visible? Yeah, yes, proceed. All right. All right, so first and foremost, before I begin, thank you so much, Doctor. And a special shout out to Dr. Bala for once again rendering me this privilege to be part of the Bodhi International Conference. I've said this before and I'll say it again, it never ceases to be a privilege to be part of such conference. And of course, we cannot meet face to face since the pandemic is at its peak at the moment. But nonetheless, the fact that we are here today is by God's blessing and for that I am grateful. So without further ado and without me rambling in my intro, my name is Diran Amalesha, currently studying in the University of Malaya, and of course, as you can see on the screen, from the Faculty of Law. Racism in law and literature. Now, most of you may be scrutinizing as to why these three words are my intro. Well, it is simply because I will not be scrutinizing directly from literature. Literature is what I will be using as an asset to ensure, as an asset to ensure we get a visible picture as to what racism is within the law. And just a side note, there will be three objectives that I will be scrutinizing. So with that, we plainly and bluntly racism within the field of law and from the perspective of Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, the attorney who wrote this book. The second one would be impacts that would arise if racism and the law were associated with one another. I will be using two literature materials for my second object objective. And lastly, how much has changed? After all, what is it? when it comes to research, it is to see change and it is to scrutinize as to what the differences are. This is why these objectives will fall hand in hand. So with that said, we'll start with my first objective from the book, Just Mercy. Racism and the Law, a story of justice and redemption by Brian Stevenson. Most of you may be wondering, why am I using this book of all the books? Why am I scrutinizing the United States of America when it comes to racism and the law? Well, it's simply because in this modern era, the law is universally accepted as something that practices equality. There is no room for injustice. Of course, some nations do codify injustice from the perspective of race and religion with excuses such as and so on. But the United States alone is one nation that has come so far where they are open with racism and they try to curb it as best they can. So what is this book for? It is simply because this is the one book which I believe and personally feel has extracted the essence of racism from within the law and has depicted it in a way where it is extremely obvious. With that said, we will scrutinize the main character of that novel, which is Walter Macmillan. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be wondering, could this be just another situation where a black man was deprived of certain fair trials and certain procedures and so on and so forth? Is this just a coincidence? 
Of course, on first glance, that's how the law will portray it to be. Because the law is, after all, built on, it, on the grounds of equality, not discriminating people by race and religion. But this one book had depicted that there is essence of racism within the law, even in the modern era. Walter Macmillan's conviction started in 1988, just after 1968, the end of Martin Luther King's era, which would presumably mean the law should be equal, yet the situation was extremely different for Walter Macmillan. As you can see on your screens right now, deprived of a fair trial to avoid conviction, multiple alibis who were Blacks, of course, who were law-abiding Blacks to be specific, were not heard for his defense, and he was kept in that row for six years. And surprisingly, he was considered innocent through the aid of Brian Stevenson, where it was proven there was so much evidence which were kept away due to coercion. What does this show you? Is the law wrong? After all, it was built on a perspective of equality. Or is Walter Macmillan just an ordinary person who faced injustice? He was at the receiving end of the law at the wrong place at the wrong time. I would like to incline to believe the second statement, unfortunately. Apart from just mercy, the list goes on and on and on. Here you can see Herbert Richardson, a man deceased, suffered PTSD, and he was sentenced to death in Alabama. PTSD is something that the law will take into consideration because the accused who is suffering from any mental defect will be prioritized to be scrutinized from that perspective. The same situation was not applied to Herbert Richardson. Is it because he's colored? Maybe this is a one-off situation. Fair enough. What about Emmett Till, a boy that was accused of sexual harassment, which was later proven to be innocent? But was there any change? No. He was beaten to death by two white convicts, two, by two white men, and they were released without any conviction by an all-white jury. Six years later, after his death, the woman that accused him of sexual harassment admitted that she had falsely done so. Is it because he's colored, or is he just an innocent person who was at the wrong side of the law? I'm inclined to believe the second one. What about Anthony Rayton? He was on death row for 28 years, accused of two murders, which he was proven to be innocent after that long period of time by none other than the man who wrote Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson, once more. Which going on in such perspective, it is hard to say and deny that there is perhaps a bit of racism even when the law has been portrayed to display equality and treat all as one. So racism and the law, with that such with that sort of trend, it's not surprising that lots of groups have done this and various statistics have shown that racism does exist. For instance, blacks who are guilty in comparison to white in the similar situation are 5.9 times higher to be held guilty in contrast to the white. And of course, what does this mean is that it is a dangerous legal system, the tool that is supposed to protect you from harm's way, the tool that is supposed to ensure everyone receives justice is becoming a weapon against it. Helped by four of these, he had mentioned that the criminal law is held to be equal, but its application neglects the rights of minorities. What I'm trying to simply say is, the law is like a river, and everybody presumes that when you walk below ankles, and it will be the same depth for all. Unfortunately, there are crocodiles in the river that target specific individuals. And this would mean it is hard to see where the law is being racist in modern era after the civil rights movement, after the era of slavery, because it portrays itself to be equal, but it is opposing that. Quick view at Burby Spain, who is also on that row, suffering from intellectual disability. These two may one day add on to the statistics if justice does not prevail for this man. So explaining the racist in good language, you cannot deny that be to a certain extent, impacts arising from it. The first one is none other than sense of belonging. Quick shout out to Dr. Mani, who expertises in this theory. That sense of belonging is one effect that will be displayed by minorities who face racism. Using the works of Carol Phillips, I saw two characters that link the racism they face with their nationality, Rudy and Martha, as you can see on your screen. So going through the works of Dr. Mani, and of course, the books written by Carol Phillips, I realized it is no surprise. It will arise within any minority group, and in this case, Blacks. If one is being ill-treated because of his skin color, he is going to question his belonging in one nation. But then, with the field of law being on my side, and of course, scrutinizing it from that perspective as I am a law student, I realized, in contrast to discrimination through the field of economics, politics, or even social life, in social life, of course, Nothing is more impactful when discrimination takes place through the law. Why? 
of course, your sense of belonging will be a huge question within you if discrimination takes place. But what if the one thing in your nation, which was accepted universally to protect you, no matter what your skin color is, is in fact practicing discrimination, is in fact drawing a fine line because of your skin color and it's not colorblind. I believe what Rudy and Martha went through, which was depicted by Carol Phillips, would be twofold if it was from the perspective of the law. In short, applying the situation to Rudy and Martha's situation, I believe the impact of one sense of belonging, his patriotism towards his nation would be twofold worse, which is why I, for one, and of course, I believe majority would agree with me, the law should not practice racism, no matter what the excuses be from the perspective of a social contract in the name of religion or race. The second impact is none other than the rebellious nature, which is depicted in Carol Phillips' book once more, Higher Ground by Rudy. Now, I'm not going to scrutinize from the perspective that rebellious nature arises from the minorities as soon as discrimination takes place because of their race. I'm in fact going to turn the cards against the minority groups here. How? You will see. Rebellious nature. Like Rudy, who displayed a rebellious nature, many minorities to be criticized in the United States display a rebellious nature when they face discrimination, be it from any perspective for that matter. But do you realize in the book, Rudy does not display any cards for the reason he faced discrimination. He shouldn't have faced it but he completely threw out the, threw the reason he was arrested in the first place. He was arrested for robbery, but that seemed like a small evil in contrast to the discrimination towards his race. That exact mentality of what you do is not wrong in to what others do to you because of your race is what is being applied in many movements today, be it the feminist movement or in my topic here, the Black Lives Matter movement. Of course, for the most part, the Black Lives Matter movement is held to be peaceful and they try and incline to follow what Martin Luther King had preached to be protesting on a peaceful basis. Unfortunately, things do get out of hand because there is no fine line. There is no guidelines when it comes to protest. Hence, so much violence arises when a racist incident takes place where the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement does arise, but it causes havoc. And of course, this in turn causes retaliation from armed forces and so on. Why is this so? Because it feels to display aggression. It feels right, similar to Rudy's situation, that what they are doing is considered all right in contrast to the greater evil of fighting racism. Hence, there happens to be situations such as burning tires, pulling down of monuments that are held to be ra ra racially discriminative images, and of course, attacking police officers at times. What impact arises here from rebellious nature sprouting out from it is it destroys the entire message as a whole. What you are trying to say is racism is wrong, but because of a few rotten apples that take it a little too far, the entire tree intends to get chopped down and the message and the moral stand of the movement is questioned harshly. Rebellious nature is all right if racism takes place because you have to stand up for what is right. But when it itself is portrayed as wrong because you have no fine line or a leash to know when to stop, it becomes a problem itself. Lastly, downgrading of the law. I think I can finish this in one sentence. It would be, if the law has a reputation for practicing racism, if there is statistics to back up such racism being practiced on a law that was built on the grounds of equality, even if the law isn't practicing racism in the future, anybody can raise the issue of racism towards the law like kryptonite, and it will be another issue for the law to handle to prove that such convictions or such stance by the law is for the purpose of what is right. Why does the law have to defend itself for such accusations, even if it isn't true, it is because it's already established such a crude reputation. Hence, if a law is practicing discrimination and if it's not codified word for word, someone can raise the issue that the law is being racist, be it from the perspective of the legislative body, the executive body, or the judiciary body for that matter, and the law is obliged to defend themselves. And if they don't, it would prove the accusation as reality, even if it isn't. This is why I believe the law should not have any essence of racism. Lastly, my third objective is how much has changed. Now, I have been talking about the law which has been established on an equal basis, a law that was built for equality purposes. But I do not deny that there has been laws that were racist, the Jim Crow laws, they would say, very, very obvious in the West, in the southern side of the United States. And of course, there were social contracts that were practicing racism openly. 
they would put aside the blacks and the whites. There were discriminations from the perspective of who can enter public transports, who can enter parks, and so on. Those laws were in the past. And the United States, if you ask me, has come a long way from that after the era of slavery, after the era of the civil rights movement. To show they do not tolerate such laws because if they did, these laws would not have died off or these laws would not have been a big no-no for both whites and blacks in the United States. Then why? Why is racism taking place in the law? Why did racism take place in the situation of Walter McMillan? Why did racism take place in the situation of Emmett Till? Why might racism take place in the situation of Pervy Spain when unequal laws, which no longer exist in the US, like what some countries are personifying by codifying it in their highest law of their land, still happen in the United States? Why is it present when the present law is not racist in the United States? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is simply because those who steer the law, those who are in control of the law, practice racism. If you ask me, the law in the United States is a ship that is built to sail towards equality in current times. Unfortunately, once in a while, some captains don't see it that way and they steer it in accordance to skin tone. They forget that they are violating the Fourth Amendment. They forget that the law is supposed to be colorblind. They forget the law is supposed to not take in consideration of faith, religion, no matter what your difference is. They forget the law is equality, not a weapon that slays equality, which is why I would not hesitate to say in the near future, the United States may be considered a nation of equality, but it will never be complete as long as there are individuals that practice racism within the law, which is why situations such as what happened to Walter McMillan took place, why what might happen to Pervis Spain might transpire. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I conclude but with all three objectives mentioned here, that the law in current times, well, not all nations, but most nations agree it to be on the basis of equality. You can look up the human rights that do not specify who deserves what more. But when it falls into the wrong hands, the law, which is an asset and a pillow that cushions you to prevent discrimination can become a sword. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Biran. Thank you for taking us through law, literature, and society with special emphasis on the domain of racism. It was a good paper. Next, we call upon Dr. Geeta, Assistant Professor of English, Government Degree College from Jammu and Kashmir. Ma'am, you can take up four to five minutes to sum up your paper. Okay, ma'am, I understood. Yeah, thank you. You can go ahead. Uh, is it compulsory to on the camera? Like, uh, no, it's your comfortable zone. Actually, we have a problem of connectivity here. No so, problem, ma'am. Okay, no, ma'am. Not necessary. Thank you. My camera will be off, but I will uh, present my paper. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. Geetal Khotra, Assistant Professor in English, Government Degree College, Samba, Jammu and Kashmir. My topic is Baka and Apostle of Transformation. This is actually the novel of Mulk Rajanan. And I, I have taken you know, this character as, as a form of a transformation. Mulk Rajanan's character, Baka, is the symbol of transformation. When Mulk Rajanan scripted this novel, Indians had been undergoing a worst phase. In this work, Anand attempted to expose all the shortcomings of Indian society and he made Baka his mouthpiece. Baka is a sweeper by birth and by profession also. In society, sweeper community has occupied the last ladder. The sweeper are hated only because of their work, but it is not their fault. Baka started his day routine in the morning by cleaning bathrooms next to their sweeper Ploni. Baka has a healthy body and progressive mind. He felt proud on his work, but he never understood why he and his community are being uh, despised. After cleaning the bathroom, he visited his friends. There, he also found not only upper class people hate their presence, but the two people who are slightly better than them, uh, they are still hated, hated them. As a community, they, they do not like them uh, because he's a speaker. His 
20 nature won him many friends. One of them was the Havildar Chatur Singh. Bakar respected him a lot because he was the only person in the entire world who looked him his equal. Baka was sensible by nature. He could not fear the insulted words, in, insulted words of a lady whom child was playing with him with his pocket stick. Actually, child got hurt while playing and cried. Baka could not see the pain of a child, could not bear the pain of a child because he cried, because he, uh, some part of body got hurt. Unaware of the child's status, uh, he carried him to his home. When child mother saw him inside the house, she was screamed on Baka and sent him away with false allegation. This behavior of lady made Baka to ponder over his caste and birth. Like he felt that why he why he is born, why he has taken birth from earth because he is he is not eligible for uh, eligible in this society. Why the God has created this people community? These questions really make him to understand his existence. One more incident: add oil in the troubled water. That is the priest of temple attempted to molest uh, his sister Sohi. Uh, she was working there. She uh, every day went there and uh, sweep the um, clean the entire temple. But this particular day, uh, the uh, the temple priest tried to molest molest him. On uh, actually, he uh, she called Sony to uh, to work him to work him on some pretext, and then Sony uh, went to uh, went to him. He just tried to molest molest her. Baka, who was passing through the temple heard the commotion and reached the main place from which the sound was coming. When he saw Sony, the center of the issue, he could not hold himself. He dragged Sony from the premises of temple and sent him away. These two incidents made Baka depressed and frustrated. His problems were not over. After Sony episode, he decided to visit market. There also he met a man who insulted him publicly because Baka just touched him. Baka was in mental pain when a fresh whiff of air revived his soul. He heard the speech of Mahatma Gandhi. Actually, Mahatma Gandhi had to observe public rally in connection with the touchability in that city. And by chance, Baka was there. He heard his speech. The speech just mesmerized him. The speech of Gandhi infused new life in Baka. And he realized one day would come when uh, the curse of untouchability will be over, will be removed from world, and everyone look to each other with respect and equality. The speech transformed Baka and his existence. Actually, Baka is a symbol of transformation. The seed, the seed of transformation has in his mind, but it automatically, uh, the, the seed will become plant, uh, with, with the pace of the time, with the slow pace of the time that it will be. So Mulkaraj Anand was one of those writers who introduced trans transformation, uh, transformation, the elements of transformation in society. And the Baka was one his one of his characters who um, who you know who introduced these elements in, in, in the stories. Like Baka was the first person who realized that uh, the society will be reformed one day. So that is all about my paper. Thank you so much. Yeah, very precise and well presented, ma'am. Dhaka as a symbol of transformation. Thank you. Next we call upon, it is a combined paper by Dr. Ranjit Krishnan, NSS College, and Dr. Rajalakshmi KL from Government Arts College, Kerala. I welcome the presenter to present the paper. Thank you. Yes, and uh, let me share my screen. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yes, you can continue. And I hope my screen is also visible. Yeah, yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, as you can see on the uh, slide, the topic is based on the Tamil film Karnan, and the title of my presentation is Karnan Saga of the Dispossessed. Myself, Dr. Ranjit Krishnan, Assistant Professor of English uh, in SS College, Bandara. So, uh, my basic argument is usually we never consider popular cinema as a major discourse. But nowadays, 
popular cinema has been used as a major tool by filmmakers to convey certain very serious issues. And I believe that this trend is very much particular in the, uh, in the Tamil cinema these days. So I think it's a new phase of Tamil cinema where you can see the emergence of a new crop of filmmakers, young filmmakers, and they have bridged the gap between the popular and the artistic cinema. Because in early days, we never believed that popular cinema can convey a very important meaning or rather uh, it can discuss a very serious issue. But nowadays, they have altered the formula, the pattern of popular cinema, and they have started to present the concerns of the oppressed. And through that, they have attempted to critique the stereotypical uh, representations of the marginalized groups in Tamil cinema. And I believe that this is the biggest change which has happened in Tamil cinema in the post-2010 era. And these are the three filmmakers who have revolutionized Tamil cinema. Uh, Vetri Maran with his films like Asuran and uh, Mari Selvaraj, Par and Jit films like Kala, Kabali, and Mari Selvaraj with two films. One is Pariyaram Perimal and the other one is Karnan. Moving forward, <clears throat> yes. and. In the films of these young filmmakers, we can see a reversal of roles. For example, in the early films, the Dalit people, they were presented as the subservient class, the servant class. They were often the butt of jokes, and they always received kicks from the heroes. But when we come to the films of this particular, these particular directors, we can see there is a reversal of roles. And in all the films, there is a rise of a hero which comes from the oppressed class. Remember the example of Kabali, Rajinikant as the hero, but that was totally a different uh, formula that was used in that film. The same in the case of Kala and also Periyaram Perimal and the latest offering by Mari Silvaraj, that is Karnan. And moving forward, so my basic argument is the next point. They have infused the Dalit politics within the frame of populism. So it's a very serious issue that needs to be addressed and uh, uh, through popular cinema, because people accept popular cinema a lot and through such a medium, they have initiated serious debates on numerous social concerns. Then, <clears throat> in that way, they have created a Dalit consciousness and the films, the most popular films which belong to this category are Kabali released in 2016, Kala, Periyaram Perimal, and Asuran. And <clears throat> in all these films, we can see a Dalit youngster becoming or turning to an assertive hero who questions the injustice uh, that was laid upon that particular community to which he belongs. So uh, coming to my primary text, Karnan, as you all know, it, is, it was released in 2021, directed by Mari Silvaraj, and it is loosely based on uh, the Kodian Kulam caste violence case in 1995, which happened in Tutukudi. And uh, my analysis of the film is based on the concepts of Dalit studies. And these are my major findings. And here, the village is named, named as Kodian Kulam, and Kodian Kulam is presented as a cultural space. And uh, if you have seen the film, there is another village named Melu. See the title mean the name of the village itself is Melu, which belongs to the people of the higher caste. So there is a, a, a tug of war going between Apudian Kulam and Melu. They have their own identity. They have their own cultural ethos. So Apudian Kulam is, can be seen as a perfect cultural space. And you may, you may think that this is a very trivial issue, denial of a bus stop. But just imagine that socio-economic mobility, the mobility of a community is restricted through this particular aspect. And also, <clears throat> you can see the emergence of local deities. And my point is, even the emergence of a deity happens from a lack. Uh, if you have seen the film again, uh, the younger sister of Karnan dies on the road and nobody is... Uh, ready to take her to the hospital and later after her death she becomes a deity and even she dreams of getting her village liberated and uh, uh, you can see the picture on the right side and then the concept of socio-economic mobility the community has been restricted from so many things and i believe that this is a microcosm of all the dalit communities that has been presented in this film so and coming to the character of Karnan, 
and uh, he is quite different from the other Tamil heroes because he does not have any uh, superhuman powers. And I believe that he is the face of the people. The same in the case of Perir and Perimal and also Karnan. And uh, we see all these characters fighting for a cause. It is not an imaginary cause. All these characters are rooted on the ground, realistic, and uh, the address, I mean, the issues they have raised is uh, really uh, relevant in the socio-political context of our country and also Tamil Nadu as a state. And moving to the, uh, the final two slides, and I believe that the film can be taken as a resistance to oppression, all kinds of oppression. And he conveys all these through the use of various symbols and metaphors. For example, uh, in the first scene, when uh, after completing that ritual, Dhanush, the character played by Dhanush, Karnan, he comes on an elephant, and that elephant is a symbol of prosperity. And that means uh, the, the community is realizing the birth of a new hero who can uh, save that community. And the other one is a donkey. Uh, the two legs of the do donkey is tied, which respects the moment. So uh, Karnan goes and liberates the donkey, and that is a huge, that holds a huge significance in the context of the film, because that was the first thought which led to uh, the thought of liberation, a kind of an emancipation from all kinds of clutches. And another major image, or rather metaphor, is the use of the police station. And even the police station is presented as a metaphor of caste dominance. Uh, for example, the names, when uh, the names are revealed, Driyodhan and Abhimanyu, uh, the police inspector, he is quite disturbed and he humiliates them basically for just a single reason, that is, they have tried to assert their identity. So I believe this film is highly significant in the case of all oppressed communities, all marginalized communities who struggle a lot to assert their identity. And coming to my conclusion, uh, I believe that Karnan is not a mere revenge drama. It has a multi-layered narrative, but so many themes uh, added to that. And you can, uh, my attempt is to open up the text for different possible readings. And maybe, though I don't believe that conveying a message is very much important for a film, for any piece of art, but still, I believe that all communities should be treated with dignity. That is the major theme forwarded by the film. And it represents white subaltern and uh, it's a struggle for human identity and also a battle against all kinds of discrimination. So uh, with the next slide, let me conclude. A beautiful statement from the film. Uh, he hit us because I wore a turban. He hit us because we stood tall. And uh, he hit me because I, Madhaswami's son, was named the youth. And see the last two lines. They hit us because we held our heads high. So we shall fight. And uh, let me conclude with these lines. Let the fight for dignity continue. And let's hope for the birth of an egalitarian space. And thank you all the Bodhi team for giving me an opportunity and a special mention for Dr. N. Michael e. ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, popular cinema is a major discourse to address the suppressed people is a welcoming note for a change. We invite Dr. Manjula Goel from Haryana to present her paper. You can proceed, ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. N. Methili. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my paper, which is on analyzing the subalternity of two feminine characters beyond region and culture in Vijay Tendulkar's Silence, the Court is in Session, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. The paper analyzes the subalternity of two female characters, which belong to different regions and cultures, and bring out the fact that women are great sufferer and sensitive part of society, whether they are in India or in Europe. They can easily be targeted for insult in the name of law and re religion. Binare in silence, the court is in session, is humiliated 
by her own colleagues in a mock trial of court and hester is the scarlet letter is humiliated for adultery by mounting on the scaffold in a marketplace and sent to prison by western puritan society silence the court is in session was first published in marathi in 1967 and written by vijay tendulkar and translated into english in 1974 by priya adarkar the scarlet letter was first published in 1850 and written by hawthorn an american novelist antonio gramsci coined the term spartan to identity the cultural hegemony that excludes and displaces specific people and social groups from the socio economic institution of society in order to deny their agency and voices in colonial politics a spartan is someone with low ranking in a social political or other hierarchy it can also mean someone who has been marginalized or oppressed it is a person who fits within the model of the oppressed as a being so marginalized as to not even have the voice of oppress feedback takes the term spartan from gramsci and describes the unrepresented and silenced women in her study can the spartan speak as the paper has taken two spartan and oppressed women from two different reasons they are depicted one by one in this research tendulkar portrays a picture of exploited and victimized women in indian context he is undeniably a great indian playwright and versatile literary genius miss binare is a dedicated school teacher she has always maintained strict discipline Apart from her teaching profession, Binare is a member of theatrical group named Sonar Moti Tenement Progressive Association. From Mumbai, that group come to a Spartan village, to suburban village, sorry, to present its play in the village hall. The title of the play is Mock Trial of President Lyndon B. Johnson. The member of the troupe are Leela Binare, Mr. Kashikar, Mrs. Kashikar, Balu Rokde, Sukhatne, Pongshe, and Kavya. after reaching there all the member of the troop decide to have a rehearsal before the final show binare the heroine points out to them that they had done that night's atomic trial seven times in the past three months but if they have rehearsal now then that night's real show will become dull then pongshe and karnika suggest to play mock trial on another theme as this will infuse a variety to the play and this time binare will be the accused as they want to explore the secret of a private life soon a mock court room with furniture is arranged pongshe takes the lead and kashika clear the throat as he is playing the role of judge and addresses the prisoner miss binare informing that she has been accused of the crime of infanticide under section number 302 of the indian penal code he asks her whether she is guilty of the above mentioned crime binare looks little shocked she dare in to fall in love and is cheated twice first seduced as a teenager by her maternal uncle and later quietly abandoned by professor damle her intellectual guru in her first incestuous emotional involvement of the punishment is inflicted in private but in the other which involved a married man she is caught in a trap by her own companions for her love affair has been exposed by her pregnancy Miss Binare is suspected of having illicit love affair with Professor Damle, who remains absent throughout the play. Society cannot tolerate this unmarried, expectant woman to court a canker on the body of the society. Unquote. But not even once is Professor Damle, a married man with children, condemned for being responsible for Binare's wretched condition. A critic N S Dharan says to quote Tendulkar brings them together under the banner of amateur theatre in order to highlight the hypocrisy latent in the microscopic cross section of the milieu of the metropolitan Bombay unquote. Professor Tamle with whom she is in love is not ready to accept his relationship with Binare openly before the patriarchal society and makes her unwed mother and leaves her alone to face the insult of this male chauvinistic society. Could you sum up, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you.
the same condition of hester in nathaniel hawthorne's the scarlet letter which was published in 1850 and the work wins a great recognition for the author this novel also shows the humiliation of hester pin by puritan society of new england she is a young handsome woman of gorgeous beauty a few years before the story begins she had been prevailed upon to marry an older man roser chilling work a medical doctor and a cold intellectual scientist who proved to be an utterly unsatisfactory husband she felt no love for him when he married her nor did she feign any in absence of her husband roser chilling work she fell in love with the brilliant popular young minister of the church arthur dimmesdale pearl her daughter is the offspring of that illegitimate communion and with her daughter Daughter in her arms, she was ordered to mount up the scaffold in marketplace to face the disgusting stares of town folk. She is debarred from the society. The intolerant and cold-hearted Puritan community condemned Hester to wear on the bosom of her dress at all times the letter A standing for adulteress. Like Pinare, silence the court is in session. Hester is also punished and humiliated alone, and her co-partner of this guilt. is totally absent from the punishment scene it reveals that the women are considered the subalterns and low status has been assigned to them by male chauvinism in every corner of the world whether they are in 17th century america or in 19th century india but hester gains strength with the humiliation meted out to her by new england puritan society she wears that letter a with great pride and ornate it with embroidery despite the fact that she is being punished hester does not kneel in front of her prosecutor and instead instead she shows that she has an extreme force of character and holds her head high accepting what happens to her without shedding a tear she even dares have her own secrets and refuses to disclose the name of her lover to conclude tendruta exposes the hypocrisy of the judiciary system where binare is accused in the court in the absence of professor damle and sinister implications of her companions in finding the opportunity to pounce upon her life cultures to explore her private life socially to be compare and contrast with the situation of these two women we find that binari is educated and independent professional teacher and court has made her silent for not giving her chance to speak for her own behalf or for justice and hester is compelled to wear the scarlet letter a and has undergone a social shame without knowing the name of her male co partner in this adulterous act here hathorn exposes the hypocrite new england puritan society which harassed and subjugated women in another region thank you thank you ma'am thank you for putting in the search for identity in a very elaborate way thank you for your paper next we invite dr savita sukuma from maharashtra to present her paper thank you ma'am ma'am uh, could you please sum it up with Five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Surely. I hope my uh, both my audio and video are uh, visible and it is seen. It is visible. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to everyone uh, the title of my research paper is eco masculinism emerging trend in eco criticism right so okay so eco masculinism is considered to be a branch of uh, masculinity uh, studies now we are all familiar with the theory of masculinity that has come up uh, recently and uh, there have been concepts like hypermasculinity uh, also that has been uh, discussed as part of it but as far as uh, the man and the uh, relation with environment has not really been a research so far so eco masculinism is seen to be a branch of uh, masculinity studies uh, basically when we try to think about a definition or when we try to think about giving some kind of a nomenclature uh, to this eco masculinism we can say that it is a study in the process that enables men to resist and challenge environmental destruction and become the caretakers of nature and earth uh, it can also be said to investigate the potential connections between masculinities and pro environmental behavior 
uh, the key word, especially in eco-masculinism, is about the connection between uh, masculinities and pro-environmental behavior. Uh, we are all familiar with eco-criticism, and uh, today I think the uh, Dr. Geeta Ma'am's uh, uh, very insightful, uh, uh, detailed talk on eco-criticism covered many aspects of it. So within that, we also came to know about eco-feminism, and eco-feminism actually uh, is a philosophy that studies the oppression of nature that is directly and indirectly linked to the oppression and uh, sub uh, subjugation of women uh, within ecofeminism when it was noted that largely uh, the environmental policies environmental decisions and also the environmental behaviors are being seen by women and it is seen that uh, women also notice the fact that a lot of these policies have largely been framed by men who have been uh, motivated uh, by their power, their hegemony, and also their economic aspirations, as well as the materialism. So eco-masculinism sort of grew out of this vacuum uh, in the sense that they, they realized there was very little research on the environmental behavior that was favorable towards nature as far as men are concerned. So it acts and becomes a counterpoint to ecofeminism. And within the discipline of eco-criticism, uh, as there are four waves, uh, eco-masculinism is somewhat uh, defined as the third wave of eco-criticism by Scott Slovich, who is a very important uh, eco-critic. Eco-masculinism uh, initiates a very good way and a very good method uh, to make man accountable and responsible for the environmental decisions and environmental destruction as well. All of us are familiar that in the Western concept of the environment and to a large uh, extent, even at a global level, uh, the concept of nature and environment is very much anthropocentric. And as a result, man sees himself to be the center of the environment and the ecosystem and all other non-human and human creatures as uh, submissive and below him. As a result, what has happened is this kind of a notion of man being the hegemonic male makes or was responsible for the environmental destruction and the environmental crisis that we are aware of like global warming, depletion of ozone layer, climate change, even though uh, even about carbon footprints as well. So eco-masculinism takes uh, some of its basic underlying philosophy from eco-feminism and saying and uh, tries to make a parallel by nurturing the feminine qualities in male, which can be cool, and which can also be macho, just as much as being a male can be. Now, this concept of green man is said to have the origin of eco-masculinism. Green man actually symbolized, uh, was a pagan god, uh, symbolizing nature and the relationship that man, as in male, had with the environment. Unfortunately, with the passage of time and the development of civilization, the feminine qualities in man were completely, uh, completely thwarted. They were completely made, uh, what we call as, uh, you know, uh, covered uh, in the in the process of acculturation and uh, social development. So. Men who have a soft spot or men who are cure, men who are sensitive are rather seen to be soft targets and victims for the hypermasculine as well. So the green man is embodied in all cultures and it actually signifies the cycles of birth, death and uh, rebirth and fertility as well. So this green man actually symbolized the feminine and which is part of the natural maleness. And uh, in our Indian uh, mythology, as well as religion, we know the concept of Ardhanarishwara, where you have a wonderful uh, blend of the Shiva and the Shakti. That is, which is there and which exists in every man as well as woman. But unfortunately, due to social acculturation, the feminine side has been subdued due to 
peer pressure and due to media influences and also due to the uh, due to the societal uh, impact yes yes ma'am yeah sure ma'am yeah so these are some of the readings in eco masculinism which i have given it for your uh, notice so you have um, uh, eco man which is a book written by mark alister uh, on perspectives on masculinity and nature then you have martin hultman and paul m puler both of them have uh, in fact written books these are quite insightful and they provide uh, a lot of detailed reading uh, on ecological masculinism now i take you to eco masculinists within the indian environmental movement and for these men that is whether it was uh, mohandas karamchand gandhi or sundarlal bahuguna or even chandi prasad bhat we notice that for these they did not have to wait for the environment to be destroyed on the contrary even before uh, such kind of uh, crisis environmental crisis took place they were initiating the environmental movement in their own right now mohandas karamchand gandhi with his principles of satyagraha and non violence and also the concept of cleanliness initiated the environmental movement which was informal in its own way both bahuguna and chandi prasad bhat have been gandhian to the core and they have been interacting at a more grassroots level and they have been fighting various um, uh, environmental capitalism i would say uh, uh, with non violence and also in their own silent ways now when we look at the western eco masculinists as i said they were largely anthropocentric but there have been few examples like the native american man who uh, considers himself as the steward or the caretaker of uh, nature and the environment so they have a peaceful existence uh, with nature and environment john mew uh, gifford pinchot and theodore roosevelt have also been involved with the wilderness and creating of the sierra nevada club movement then you also have the earth day and the earth first movements which have largely been uh, of course created and initiated by by male environmentalists but uh, uh, but still needs to do more al gore with his uh, wonderful book uh, an inconvenient uh, truth actually uh, took charge to address the issues of uh, a uh, climate change so if we need to make man more accountable and responsible for his actions which are environmentally uh, uh, destructive we need to make him understand that it is uh, it it is to realize it is to introspect the feminine side and try to take a look at the very nature at the environment that is meant to bestow the benefits to all including the human and the non human so with this i end my meeting uh, thank you everyone for patient listening thank you ma'am yeah thank you ma'am thank you for taking us into the new insights on eco masculinism that was a wonderful paper and next we would like to uh, invite it is a joint paper by the research scholar Shalina Sharma and Dr. Monica Jaiswal. I invite the presenter to present the paper. Just within five minutes, let's say yes for others too. Thank you for the understanding. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to correct this paper is mine, and I am doing my research work under Monica, Dr. Monica Jaiswal. This is not a combined paper. Okay. so beginning with i wish you all a very good afternoon respected dignitaries organizers speakers am i audible yeah yes please go ahead speakers and all the attendees i am a research scholar from iftm university muradabad and uh, i am presenting my paper on the topic fictional techniques of arun joshi Uh, respecting the time limit i will stick to the introduction and the conclusion part from my paper so here i begin with R uh, writing is a mirror and an understanding of life in the english writing has seen deferred subjects like opportunity battle and gandhism segment east west experience 
and alienation composed by different journalists, the presentation of the topic of alienation in the Indo-Dern, Indo-English writings opens another domain of comprehension of human instinct and conduct. It assists one with the noticing a person as far as his reactions and uh, as far as his reactions are concerned and our responses to the people, the climate and with his own self. Today, Indo-English fiction at last made its own remaining at the global level. At this stage, it would without a doubt be fascinating and helpful to know, examine the speciality of one of the major Indo-English writers. Indeed, the rationale behind this investigation is to notice and dissect the creative ability and inborn characteristics of a main Indo-English writer. The most self-evident and regular decision is Arun Joshi. He is by all accounts, the writer of the present world in India, who breaks the deep-rooted custom of Mulk Raj Anand, R.K. Narayan, Raja Rao, and has made a methodology of introducing his hero's involvement with human existence without losing that life itself. Consequently, the reason for this investigation is an endeavor to record this stupendous pattern in the Indo-English fiction. Every one of Arun Joshi's books depicts the cutting edge man's concern of the self in the expediently changing society. He notices and portrays skillfully the thought processes, feelings, disappointments, dissatisfactions, and clashes of his protagonists. As R.K. Dhawan properly states, Joshi explores different avenues regarding the mode of writing for examining man's issues, especially in the light of thought processes answerable for his activity in his mind. Joshi's protagonists are mostly, mostly pariahs or estranged people who uh, abruptly become mindful of their limit, profound quality weakness, inborn separation, and the insignificance of presence in a normless world. This mindfulness estranged him from the man and society around him and from each standard and conviction. The point of the investigation is to find when and why they got distanced from the unique self and how they grasp reality and accomplish the culmination of their self. Arun Joshi has contributed a couple of books to Indo-English literature, yet the entirety of his books are composed adequately and with artfulness. His commitment to Indo-English fiction as books, The Foreigner, The Apprentice, The Strange Case of Billy Biswas, The Last Labyrinth, The City and the River is restricted yet wonderful and acclaim commendable. Now I come to the conclusion. Uh, Arun Joshi is without a doubt, perhaps the most remarkable contemporary Indian writers in Indo-English writing. He is in reality a novelist of high request and his anxiety for individual people has granted a significant appeal to his works. His books test profound into the dim and deepest openings of the human mind and enlighten the secret corners and bring before us the inward, the psychological existence of his characters. Joshi depicts the contention of the contemporary Indian. His fiction is a mission for the embodiment of human living. Every book of his shows both progression and advancement. We find in his books the impressions of Indian ethos, the lessons of Bhagavad Gita, and hints of Western considerations and belief system. He, his novels center around the utilization of fictional techniques like the primary individual portrayal, witness storytellers, perspective, self-thoughtfulness, and inside speech or confession booth made in series of flashback and some kind of memories. 
Joshi utilized procedure uh, to push the human dilemma of present day man and a whole age or race. For this, he utilized humor and delicate incongruity. The investigation is an endeavor to dig into the maze of his dis uh, uh, fiction to discover the importance of the craftsmanship and the craftsman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for elaborately giving us an idea on Arun Joshi's work. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we would like to invite Reshmi Panwar from Uttarakhand to present her research paper. Yes. Very good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, yes. Proceed, please. Okay. Well, uh, today uh, in this conference, my topic is female awareness and the short stories of Ellis N. Munro. Ellis N. Munro is a Nobel laureate and a short story writer of Canada. She believes that the discrimination between the male and female is not the result of biological parameters, but is twisted and turned by the cultural structure of any country on the basis of gender. In her short stories, we find that she tries to comprehend the social and psychic mechanism that constructs that women should claim for more space within the existing social structures. Women should try to balance the social status in this structure. She does not use a conventional narrative in order to highlight feminist concerns. Literature of a nation reflects not only the country's unique quality, but its identity also. Great writings of great authors represent their country's cultural heritage and at the same time they transform the lives of millions of people who live in various counties and cities of the world. Alice Monroe is one of the existing women writers who has won the heart and mind of the people all across the globe. She has, she has enjoyed success after doing a lot of hard work Monroe's ethical concerns are reflected in the formal structure of her short stories. How characters represent the feminist concern of Monroe. The exploration of personality and the quest for identity has been the central theme in her short stories. Every analysis of her short stories reveals the emergence of the protagonists who are dissatisfied in their persistent quest for realization in life through their actions. In her fiction, a question for identity is a more crucial concern. Women don't want to be the secondary object and they know how to raise their voice against the supremacy of patriarchal society. When a question related to women's identity arises, there is always a relationship of hate and love with patriarchal society. She uses different kinds of style and form to explore the various problems of women. Her heroines struggle to come out from the problems and to take a new shape with new experiences and motivation for those women who are intertwined in their cultural and emotional predicament. She uses an uncluttered style of writing. She has total control on the narration style and the situation is created by her and her story. Her writing style does not contain any surprises. The themes are handled by her with great intelligence. She simply used déjà vu in her fiction. Basically, it is a French phrase which means already seen. It is the condition where a person has lived through the present situation before her short stories portray this because her past world of the characters is made available to us not through confession or revelation, but as an experience shared in recollection. Uh, she said in one of, his, uh, one of her creation, she loved a crisis, particularly one like this, which had a shady and scandalous aspect and which must be kept secret from the adult world. She became excited, aggressive, efficient. That energy which was turned to wildness was simply the overflow for great female instinct to manage comfort and control. Her task is to make her readers please in the same manner as a child is with a fairy tale. She makes every word bright and a glow as a bright moon in the evening. Nothing is inconsequential and irrelevant. irrelevant. She is able to capture the mood of the reader impressively in a few paces. She tells what is to be the human being and she has done more than any living writer 
to demonstrate that the short story as an art form. She is not a poor, uh, she, uh, the short story is not a poor relative of the novel. Her fictional work covered across the extent of Canada from Ontario to British Columbia. But most readers agree that her Ontario stories, deep rooted as they are in her own informative past, represent more reminiscent settings experienced in childhood and recollected by a perceptive adult memory. Many critics compare Munro's interest in small town settings to what American regional readers, writers make of rural South. When Munro is writing a story and she wishes to achieve the following, so she states in what is real, I want to make a certain kind of structure and I know the feeling and I want to get from being inside the structure. I don't know where it comes from. It seems to be already there and some unlikely hue, such as a shop window or a bit of conversation makes me aware of it. Her stories primarily concentrate on the small town in the Ontario and it can be suggest it can be used to suggest that exile occurs for characters who leave home for those who remain. Many of her stories look at the return of a female character who left and examined the social judgment and policing of national and regional identities and the maintenance of constructed boundaries. Perceptions of success and failure are bound up as much with wealth and status, with place and movement. These characters demonstrate a persistent fear of the loss of a poor identity and sense of belonging, which results in alienation. This can be linked to a transnational post-war identity about place and the self at this time. It also relates to the political and social perpetuations of the victim mentality as part of ordinary Canadian identity in order to maintain social control and the regulation of a nation, identity which is perceived as constant in crisis. Failure is particularly expected and orchestrated for female characters who are often doub doubly exiled due to gender as well as place. The possibility of gaining freedom from confining social norms and expectations is a persistent issue in these stories. Freedom is sought by these characters through movement, through escaping from home and sometimes from returning home as construction of home are shown to shift change over the time. Monroe's stories focus on local communities and interpersonal relationships rather than larger political structure. Her characters are constantly depicting as reacting to broader systematic systemic issues and her writing is linked to her cultural heritage, her personal circumstances also. Monroe's stories can be used to consider how this victimization is occluded from 20th century cultural and political discourse. Monroe began to publish more broadly in 1960s and 1970s. Her writings are viewed by critics as a reason used for political purpose of the strengthening of a Canadian identity. However, national unity is also an amazing idea. Monroe's story can be used to challenge binary uh, categorization of nation, region, city, and country, and wilderness. While it is true that she is less concerned with Canadian nationalism than the writing about individual women's life. Rashmi, Her I'm work sorry to interrupt. Ma'am, could you please sum up your paper? You are taking much Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, because of time foundation, so I want to conclude my paper. The being and distinctive quality of Monroe's fiction is the creation of a storyteller belonging to the age group of youth and pre adulthood who can effectively take an interest in the realm of both. In Monroe's story, the teenage girl exists as a blameless, weak kid who has restricted information of the world and necessities of a place of refuse. At times, to clarify the explanation, she has uh, Mundo places the families in far off provincial zones. Basically, her idea has to do how to carry up all the regular and day to day existence by changing her characters into political subject. Mundo can be viewed as conforming to this, though her stories also highlight instances where it is challenged. It is a suggestion of the endurance of dominant power structures and the way in which they influence individual behavior and attitudes. 
Many of Monroe's characters demonstrate a fear of unknown difference, which is bound up with an amazing our socially political constructed area. So finally, I want to close. Uh, I want to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. That was a paper justified to the title. Next, we would like to welcome Dr. Jabir, assistant professor from Haryana, to present his paper. Ah, uh, thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You can proceed. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, could you please allow me to present my paper without turning my video on due to some network issues? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. A very good afternoon to one and all, respected uh, Dr. N. Mithili, chairperson of this session. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Mithili, Dr. Sumali Bose, and all the organizers to give me a chance to present my views. The topic of my paper is a study of Ted Hughes Gode from ecofeminist lens. So, sticking to the time limit. Uh, uh, I will give some time on introduction and then I will conclude. Nature and culture being closely related, literature is now studied in terms, in eco-critical terms. Human culture is shaped by the symbols, myths, and rituals that constitute its very essence. The cultural dynamics in turn reflect upon the ecological relationship between man and nature. Earth being considered a feminine entity hints at the link between the oppression and exploitation of the earth and women. The voices of women and nature are constantly marginalized and ignored or misinterpreted by men. It is in such a context that ecofeminism gains momentum. In theoretical life parlance, ecofeminism is a fusion of two movements. It regards the oppression of women and nature as interconnected. Therefore, ecofeminism can be regarded as speaking against oppressions of nature, gender, race, and class. The term ecofeminism was introduced by Francois de Bon in 1974. Ecofeminists claim that patriarchal structures justify their dominance through categorical or dualistic hierarchies, that is heaven, earth, mind, body, male, female, human, animal, spirit, matter, culture, nature, white and non-white. Hence, ecofeminism seeks to do away with all the dualisms and binary oppositional forms. The movement focuses on the relationship between women and Women are more environmentally sensitive due to their traditional roles of nurturer and caretaker. These similarities in life-giving and enhancing qualities between women and nature make them equally vulnerable to male domination. Women, in fact, could be considered synonymous to nature. Domination of women had also brought on as a corollary, the subjugation of nature. Thus, it could be contested that if modernity has brought about a shocking moral treatment of nature, resulting in the near extinction of the world and humanity, it could be restructured only by means of the regeneration of women alongside the biological world. It is the standpoint of ecofeminists that women have a crucial role in solving ecological problems. Uh, I would like to now introduce the poet, Ted Hughes. Ted Hughes is a giant literary figure of England and the occurrence of Ted Hughes on the literary scene of England carries enormous relevance in the cultural and environmental reality of the post Holocaust world. Ted Hughes's preoccupation with the known human world is rooted in his distrust for the mechanical ways of the rational and modern and moral order of the Western civilization. Uh, Ted Hughes's treatment of female characters in the volume which I take 
गोदे इज गवर्ड बाय अ रिजिडली पेट्रियार्कल कॉन्शियसनेस the volume is characterized by an abundance of human characters it marks a total negation of the moral and intellectual orientation of the male and female characters that are products of the rationalistic and secularized western civilization the man woman relationship projected in the book is basically governed by an overemphasis on the sexual aspect of love the role and status of women that the recent feminist movements have defined is totally incomprehensible and unacceptable to use the women figures in gode are i dissatisfied wives seek alternative to some like sexual partners or mere innocent sacrificial agents towards the realization of the mysteries of her epic reality asserting itself among the males only through lump the world view that emerges in gode is the advocated by the people as against the quick and disruptive attitude of the males the female characters have tended to be active participants in spiritual mission of the sexiest priest Trading with him, they are ensuring the life of a masiha, the poet and ghost, logic for justifying the moral ineptitude of lump organized women. The relations in their responses to compulsions generated by the central figure that is lump's behavior. but most of them throughout the narrative are described as bodies and not thinking human beings at the same time sight of fertility god the females copulate with the central figure that is lum so as to ensure the birth of a masiha the harbinger of a new religious ethic and social order the degenerated role and status of the female in the modern world assumes a complex structure in gode where lump facility relationship comes at the center of the narrative the poet implicitly endorses the exploitation of the innocent girl with an unequivocal and mystic reverence for lump's immoral acts and designs that is why treatment of felicity is central to the proper understanding of ted hughes's attitude towards women in gode felicity is a typical product of a patriarchal system but unlike other women she has a special and personal relationship with the central character lum her supposed revolt and activism reflected in her planned elopement and marriage with lum is actually a most conventional kind of response in a male dominated world she exhibits a conventional innocence as a goddess and a submissive reliance on and actual of the prevalent male domination understanding fully well that she is a small anonymous creative about to be killed uh now i would like to be conclude the central position of eco feminism is that social justice by ending i quote all forms of hierarchical domination within patriarchal cultures is integral to environmental i quote again defending Uh, the holy balance and harmony by getting his marauding and shabbiness fine the entire center rate of gode is an image of wounded civilization pitted by a deep split between man and woman man and nature this is the world to 
this healing is achieved in the epilogue by by an essential of the consciousness of the central person ultimately the protagonist realizes that all the polarities polarities and opposites are in fact fractions of a single whole that is on each other and to destroy the opposite is nothing but a racial society Sir, you are not audible. I hope to everyone is not audible. Hello. Yeah. I think some network issue. Sir, you are facing some network issue. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now you. You can just conclude your paper in two lines. Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay. Yeah. The entire central narrative of Gode presents an image of a wounded civilization, illustrated by a deep split, the split between man and woman, man and nature, the sacrilegious and the sacred. This split is the wound to be healed. this healing is achieved in the epilogue by an essential transformation in the consciousness of the persona ultimately the protagonist realizes that all the polarities and the opposites are in fact manifestations of a single whole connected to each other dependent on each other complementing to each other and any attempt to destroy the opposite is nothing but racial suicide thank you ma'am Yeah, thank you, sir. Despite thank you, issues, you were able to make it up. Thank you. Next, we would like to have a paper by Tirshala Chetri, the PhD scholar from Christ University, Bangalore. hello yeah yes yes now you can proceed ma'am yeah good afternoon ma'am and good afternoon everyone so uh, my name is trishala chetri and i am a phd scholar from christ university bangalore and i uh, on behalf of my team will be present on the topic on legalization of prostitution in india And, um since today is a very important day that is 30th of july which marks note and understand the issues relating to prostitution and human trafficking uh, ma'am i would like to uh, uh, share my ppt so could you please make me the presenter ma'am yeah yes ma'am i'll hope you are also facing some network issues just see to your bandwidth and you can continue sir sorry ma'am uh, can you can you see it ma'am yes trishala we can yes, see it okay of prostitution in india a critical analysis so i'll be just take uh, pinpointing the certain important points because my ppt is very uh, elaborate so i will not waste too much time so let us start
um, without unduly violating upon the institutions of marriage and family. When we talk about uh, prostitution, certain views have been given by Arnold Lalkson, which states that prostitution forms an age old but very interesting chapter. And it is, uh, you know, the, the problem of prostitution is increasing day by day, despite of the of the uh, provisions and despite of the laws which have been framed. Uh, let us dwell deeper into the concept of what prostitution is. As we all know, prostitution is the oldest profession and it is also a branch of sex industry, you know, which involves sexual relation in exchange of payment of money or any other benefit. Uh, when we talk about status of prostitution, it varies from country to country. And uh, in some country, it has been legalized, while in cer certain countries like India, it's been restricted. And in some countries, it's illegal as a profession. Uh, let us dwell deeper into the facts on prostitution. Uh, there are currently 1.8 million sex workers in India, among which 10% are male and they are known as escorts and the remaining are the females. So we generally have a misconception that only uh, the females are the sex workers, but the situation is not so. Even the male, they are in this uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual uh, industry. Uh, this uh, globally, the average age of sex workers is 13, but in India it's 18 because, you know, the, the clients, they prefer younger uh, uh, sex prostitutes to offer to their clients. And uh, apart from that, uh, if you talk about industry, uh, prostitution is a very, very blooming industry where 73% of workers earn around 3,000 to 5,000 per month, while 27% of workers, they earn around 7,000 to 10,000 per month. Um, but however, uh, you know, if you talk about their psychological abuses, it's increasing day by day, like 75% of the sex workers, they face such kind of physical and psychological abuses, and 80% of women, they even get raped. Uh, you know, illegal brothels and um, are run in the metropolitan cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, and Chennai. And if we look into the reports uh, where the capital of Delhi highlights that more than 41% of women enter into the stream due to sheer poverty and 39% of women enter on their own will. So here we can observe that there is only a difference of 2% mark between the willingness and the force, uh, you know, the forced labor. When you talk about a uh, prostitution as an industry. Uh, there are various causes of prostitution like economic causes, you know, sex, uh, lack of sex education, ill treatment by parents, bad company, marriage and desertion. And such a prostitution also increases uh, various other uh, issues and stigmas like child trafficking, HIV diseases, women harassment, sexual violence, drug addiction. Uh, so in order to have a clear understanding, let us just uh, see the world map, you know, showing the legal status of prostitution in around the world. So these, this is a legal, uh, this is a globe where, uh, you know, uh, where the green color marks uh, depict that these countries where uh, prostitution has been legalized and the yellow mark signifies where the prostitution is restricted. Similarly, the red mark signifies that where the prostitution is considered as illegal and the black mark signifies that there is no law with respect to prostitution in these countries. Uh, so the, in these other countries where prostitution is restricted, that is in Bangladesh, Japan, Iceland, India, Nepal, Malaysia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, so there is a, this is a pie chart with, in order to, you know, which, which gives a clear understanding of the number and the percentages of countries with legal, illegal, and limited legal prostitution in India, where all the countries name has also been given. Uh, so this is for just for an understanding. Now let us uh, look into the legal status uh, about the prostitution in India. Now, when we talk about Indian Penal Code of 1860, it talks about, you know, section 366A of IPC talks about procreation of minor girls. Section 366B of IPC talks about importation of girls. Section 372 and 373 talks about buying and selling of girls for prostitution. So, however, uh, these Indian uh, the provisions mentioned in Indian Penal Code are very restricted in, in its application because these provisions are only limited to the child prostitution. Furthermore, uh, one of the important acts uh, with respect to prostitution is, uh, you know, prohibition is that the Immoral Traffic Suppression Act 1956 and the Amendment Act 1986, which criminalizes and prohibits prostitution uh, nearly in a public space with a span of 200 yards and the publication of phone numbers of call girls or a sex worker who is below 18 years of age or procurement and trafficking of women and children. 
if we look into the Indian constitution, like article 23, one of the Indian constitution also prohibits trafficking in human beings and beggars and other similar forms of forced labor. Article 22 declares that any contravention of this provision shall be an offense punishable in accordance with law. Now the question arises, should we legalize prostitution or not? There's always an ambiguity, right? So uh, if we legalize prostitution, uh, firstly, uh, by legalizing, government can earn a decent amount of tax, which will be beneficial for the country's economy. Secondly, legalizing will ensure a secure and safe uh, future for sex workers. You know, they'll be able to avail their labor rights, their individual rights, constitutional rights, and so on, and as well as the most important right, that is the right to choose. The government can also implement some rules which may include registration of each sex workers, licensing of brothels, dalals, you know, removal of middlemen and mandatory checks to ensure safety for the sex workers as well. Now, these measures can also be uh, will also lead uh, to decrease in, you know, HIV disease spreads, child and human trafficking, women trafficking, women harassment and sexual violence and rape as well. Now, uh, on the other hand, why we shouldn't legalize it? Now, legalization of prostitution would lead to gender inequality. And secondly, if, if it is taken as a profession, uh, then what happens is that they're, 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 the, the sex workers, there is an absence of choice and due to which drug addiction and economic problems may arise. And by legalizing such um, the profession, uh, this uh, prostitution as a profession, uh, they, the, the youngsters may, you know, they may uh, diverge themselves and they may lose interest in educational goals and, and other higher goals. So if you consider that handsome amount of tax that government will get after legalizing, uh, one question opposes that will they pay taxes even after legalization? So this is still a question. You know, and then there, there will be a spread of contagious diseases, there would be unemployment, uh, increased number of street crimes, unsafe sex, illegal street prostitution, and many more. So legalizing prostitution it will also provoke the religious sentiments of Indian culture as well. Uh, so if we, if we, if we uh, you know, uh, summarize all this, at and if we conclude, I personally feel that in the era of globalization where things are changing and provisions are changing with respect to live-in relationships and, you know, there are many other uh, laws, uh, triple talaq, as I think uh, this prostitution must be legalized. Uh, there's a very strong need uh, so that uh, in order to upheld the, the workers' labor's rights and their constitutional rights, um, what is required right now is a very, very practical approach, you know, uh, by according a legitimacy to the sex workers, millions of women who enter into this flesh trade uh, to feed their families will be freed from the clutches of pimps and brothel owners. So the rising number of eight cases in India and the number of innocents being forced in fle flesh trades are also very alarming. So there is a, it's an efficient need and time has come for the lawmakers and the policymakers to change this as soon as possible. So legitimize is the answer and I guess uh, you know we should uh, debate on this more and more in the years to come thank you ma'am yeah thank you thank you so much for taking up a topic of social costs next uh, dear participants we would like you to put up your presentation within three to four minutes since we have more number of paper presenters kindly adhere to the time sense thank you I would like to call upon Dr. R. Shuganti from Banariyama Institute of Technology, Erod, to present her paper. Kindly sum up your paper so that we get the gist of your research work. Ma'am, are you available? Dr. Yes, yes ma'am. Is it audible, ma'am? Yeah, you're audible. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon to all. I'm Dr. Sukanti Hepsiba, working as Assistant Professor of English in the Department of Humanities, Vanariaman Institute of Technology, Tamil Nadu. My topic for the presentation is about the magnificent use of parallelism in the Book of Job. Ma'am, could you please switch on your video? Ma'am, uh, there is a network problem here, ma'am. So uh, there is a problem. Allow it to the northern states where there are uh, network issues uh, prevailing. Please stick on to the uh, doctrine that has been given to you. Ma'am, ma ma please ca complete it within three to four minutes. Sure, ma'am. Definitely, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
So uh, there are a plethora of uh, literary devices and stylistic aspects found in the book of Job, which elevates the book to reach its heights. One of the most significant aspects found in the book of Job is the use of parallelisms. The abundant use of parallelism enhances the beauty of the book. There are three varieties of parallelism that is found in the book of Job. That is the synonymous of the repetitive parallelism, where the same idea is repeated in similar ways. The shown two examples of synonymous parallelisms where the similar thoughts are repeated. The first example depicts the agony that he undergoes before he complains to God. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. His friends do not believe in his integrity. They accuse him with various charges. Job, who is so long listening to their accusations, begins to go weary and not heeding much to his friends' his conversation turns to God and cries out to him. He believes that even if his friends do not believe him and hear him, God will do so. Job complains in agony as if he had been to make his last will and testament or if he should could not die in peace until he gives vent to his passion. So long he has remained quiet, but now he remarks that he will not refrain his mouth by speaking in anguish of his spirit and complaint in the bitterness of his soul. The second example shows Job's bitter mood caused by his mental struggle is simplified in the following parallelism. I cry unto thee, and thou dost not hear me. I stand up, and thou regardest me not. What afflicts him is most of all is that God appears to be his enemy and to fight against him. He feels that it is God who has cast him into the mirror and seems to trample him. This thought pierces his heart more than anything else. He cries unto him as one in earnest stands up and cries as one waiting for an answer, but God does not hear him and has no regard for him. The quoted verses are antithetical parallelisms. The first example talks about Job's helplessness. For God maketh my heart soft and the Almighty troubleth me. Job feels that God remains quiet for all his supplication, so he feels that he is taken away from the hands of God. Thus, he becomes very fearful that the Almighty troubles him, and so he makes his heart soft, that is, utterly unable to bear anything and is afraid of everything that stirred. The next verse focuses on God's dominion over nature. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up, and he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. God has command over the waters and bind them as in a garment and holds them in the hollow of his hand. He can punish the child, children of men, either by its defeat or by its excess. He sometimes withholds the water and they dry up. He raises the waters and overturns the earth, the production of it and the buildings upon it. Weeping rain is said to leave no food. Thus, God judges in any way. Extended thought or synthetic parallelism is seen in these verses. In the first words, verse, God's kindness and his relationship with man are highlighted. Job's friend Eliphaz praises God and says how he favors the poor and humble. The design of the crafty is to ruin the people. Tongue, hand, and sword are at work in order to perform it. But God takes a special protection to men who are poor and those who are loyal to his praise and have committed themselves to him. He saves them from the mouth that speak hard things against them and from the hand that does hard things against them. But he saves the poor from the sword and their mouth from the hand of the Almighty. In the second verse, Almighty's manifestation is expressed. God questions Job and tells him that Job has not contributed his share in creating this world. Has thou will him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? the creation of the vast expense of the visible heaven, which is seen this day, is a glorious instance of the divine power through fluid, yet it is firm. It is strong and his, has its name from its stability. It is what is worse and suffers no decay, nor shall the ordinance of heaven be altered till the lease expires with time, that though it is large, it is bright and more Curiously fine. It is a molden looking glass, smooth and polished and immaculate. Job yes, ma'am. Five minutes over. Yes, ma'am. Job's suffering is universal, yet with the right blend of words and the appropriate usage of expression, creates empathy and makes the reader feel oneness with Job's pain and sufferings. The book of Job is taken as a mere work of literary genius and is one of the most wonderful production of any age or of any language. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.
Next, I would like to invite Dr. Caroline Cynthia from Panarayama Institute of Technology, Iro, to present her paper. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. A very good afternoon to all. I would like to regret that I'm, I don't have my video on because as we have connectivity challenge here. Uh, sorry, ma'am, for that. Yeah. A very good afternoon to all once again. I'm Dr. Carolyn Cynthia, Assistant Professor of English from Banaryaman Institute of Technology. The topic for my presentation is on how flipped learning uh, as an inter innovative pedagogy, a gateway to teach English language effectively. I would like to begin or I would like to share why flipped classroom is a need of the hour. The impact of the recent slowdown in the field of education has replaced us with ICT-based teaching. It is a challenging task for the English language teachers to transact the learning materials into a task-based material. It is important that the teachers of English should invest in learning new skills to meet the needs of the learner. My paper focuses on how English language teachers can use flipped classroom as an effective alternate technology teaching methodology during this paranoia of helping English language teachers improve LSRW skills, which are generally taught to students in the classroom in a traditional way. Although traditional classrooms have their advantages and disadvantages, the advent of the ICD tools has greatly encouraged the teachers to make their classrooms interactive by making use of the available technology while teaching the language and on one such technology-based strategy is a flipped classroom. Teachers implementing flipped classroom strategy can create a personal touch to the needing learner needs of the individual. Personalizing lessons plans can be one of the effective methods teachers can implement in their everyday teaching. Framing an ICT-based flipped classroom lesson plan will open a new learning platform for both teachers and learners in the long run. A flipped classroom technically and technologically is different from the traditional classroom methodology. In this method, the learners are given the opportunity to work from home, do their homework and prepare for the class for the following days. Students of flipped classroom watch online lectures, online discussions, share learning space with a teacher in private. So now I'm going to talk why flipped classroom is used as an innovative method. The factors that make flipped classroom innovative are the procedures followed in the traditional classroom as they are the teacher gives the lectures, teaches sections of the subject, selects and presents ideas, trains students on the particular applications like writing and students are required to listen carefully and carry out the homework. Students can employ and mold their practical skills in the classroom with the help of the teacher. Also, the classroom in this method will be more like a workshop in which the student asks questions, avoid video content, evaluate their understanding and interact with each other through hands-on activities. For this happens successfully, the students are required to watch the videos at home before coming to class. Because of this, they have the possibility of viewing the learning videos at their own space. I would like to add a few points on the merits of the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom encourages self-paced learning where students can learn according to their own proficiency as there is no pressure for their peers to complete a task on time. It encourages independent study as it drives the student to search for information from books and other online and e-learning resources. The, there is also more transparency in the system as it gives an opportunity to the parents and the guardians of the learners to keep track of their progress of the flipped learners and to participate their learning from where they were working. I would like to conclude saying that the flipped classroom possesses the best qualities of both the lecture model and the active learning model. This might be the reason that it is gaining support at all levels of the education. One of the advantages of the flipped classroom model is that classroom time can be used more effectively and creatively as it utilizes online resources to move lectures outside classroom. Class time is freed up for the active learning endeavors such as discussion and problem solving rather than passive listening. Although there may be some practical constraints in the implementation of the flipped classroom, particularly in the context of the rural and semi-urban learners where there are problems of electricity and internet connection, this methodology has come to occupy the center stage in the modern contemporary education scenario. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. It was short and crisp and taken home the message also. Thank you. I would like to have Uzma Zavad from Uttar Pradesh to present his paper. Uh, 
Hello, am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yes, ma'am. You can proceed. Um, ma'am, I think my video is network is not connecting properly. Yeah, you can go ahead with your presentation. Please sum up your paper within three minutes. Okay, ma'am. I'll continue, ma'am. Okay, good evening. Good afternoon to all of you and one and all. My topic is clashes between tradition and modernity in China Chavez. Things fall apart. It's a novel of China Chavez novel. Things fall apart. And my topic, uh, and uh, he presents in his novels. The present paper delivers the Chavez views on the conflict of the Europeans and the African cultures and tensions which has been generated due to the conflict between them. The novels of China Chavez undoubtedly opens up many issues and themes which proves out to be a greater interest for the readers who have been shared the common experience of colonization. The novel shows the investment of the Europeans uh, in the land of the African people and how colonization took control over everything which was once owned and managed by the native people by the name of making them civilized. They controlled them by limiting their powers and injustice was put to uh, upon them in the name of religion. Achabe does not show any kind of imagination dwelling in dealing with his novels, but like Soinka, he was rather realistic and objective. He tries to rewrite the history which quite the opposite set up by the Europeans earlier. And keywords are mar marginalization, cultural conflicts, identity crisis, and multiculturalism. And the introduction is the novel of Things fall apart is the whole novel is in three parts, which vividly describes every paradigm of the novel. The first part describes how the African culture was growing and day-to-day -day issues of the Igbo command community. Sorry. The second part shows the coming of the Europeans who is trying to attract everyone in the village and changes can seen th seen through the changes in trading system, social code and making of the churches and finally the changes in the government. The third part shows how these changes have desolating effects by the colonial effects. Achaves notes every detail which have been changed before and after the colonial invasion. And in showing ego society before and after coming of the white man, he avoids the temptation to present the past as idealized and the present and the past as idealized and present as ugly and unsatisfactory. The novels of Chenno Achave in 1969. He wrote this novel in 1969. The story revolves around a person named Okon Kuo, who was a, who was a wrestler, a wealthy farmer an esteemed holding status of this of his people and a member of the select Igbo who was happy in living his traditional way of life, which suddenly changes drastically leads to his downfall. The order of the Igbo community is changed to or disrupted by the coming of the uh, white missionaries and the people who could not be able to adapt these changes like Okongo causes them to fall apart. And his novel famous, he proclaims, I would be quite satisfied if my novels, especially the ones set in the past, did no more than teach my readers that their past, with the, all its imperfections, was not one long night of savagery from which the first Europeans acting on God's behalf delivered them. Achabe's Genoa, 1975. Achabe, through sorry. Yes, Ma'am, you. Ma your voice is not coming properly. That's why. Ma'am, uh, sum it up. You can just put it in a gist. I'm asking you to close. Sorry, ma'am. Pardon, please, ma'am. Ma'am, please pardon. Continue. End it soon. Continue, ma'am. Yeah, yes. But soon. Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay. Okay. Achave through the imagination character of Gongo showed how, how even the strong will character unable to cope up with the changes in frustration, murdered a white man and later on commit suicide, which is in sin in his own tradition, and nobody even dares to touch his body after his death. The white man came into Africa by showcasing their religion as an 
instrument to make them believe as they are barbaric and uncivilized their conversion to christianity is the first step that proves out to be important in the process of colonialism okay thank you ma'am may i continue more ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you so much I would like to invite our Elakia Science. Good evening, everyone. This is Elakia, uh, Assistant Professor, Professor, Department of English from Srimad Tandavan Arts and Science College, uh, Autonomous Trichy. Continue, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm just turning on my PPT. The purpose of this, yes, ma'am. Four minutes, please. Okay. The purpose of this uh, presentation is to focus on the importance of film as a teaching tool for uh, uh, for teaching uh, books, especially poetry. It also emphasizes the use of uh, the exploration of the effect of popular song in the classroom. Today, students uh, live in a visual culture. Uh, driven daily by web pages, video games, television, and the film. Using um, popular songs in the classroom can involve students uh, who may not be learning some of the reading material. It also helps students uh, to uh, to better uh, understanding uh, what is being taught by being able to relate that object to some they are very familiar with. In order to take uh, textbook teaching to next level. Uh, teaching teachers need to take certain uh, steps to ensure uh, that uh, they use the films in the classroom in an appropriate and uh, legal manner. Uh, listening to such things will give students greater uh, learning. Here I have done uh, a comparison between English poetry songs. Uh, let's have a glimpse of that within a few seconds. I have compared uh, the poem written by John Dunn uh, entitled the, Ind uh, the Indifferent. I can love both fair and brown, her whom abundant smells and her whom want uh, batteries. Her whom uh, loves loneliness best and her whom lost under uh, place, her whom the country forms and whom the town, her who believes and her who tries. He, her who still uh, with, uh, with the spongy eyes and her who is dry cock and never cries. This poem, a male speaker, uh, begins uh, by asserting that he is capable of loving a woman uh, with a light complexion and a woman with a dark complexion. Uh, he can uh, love a rich woman and a poor woman. Mm, he can love a woman who likes being alone or a woman who enjoys social events. He can love a woman who is uh, ready to believe in men's claims and one, uh, one who must uh, test such claims uh, before believing. So I compared this, uh, uh, this uh, complex uh, uh, and uh, paradoxical lyrics with uh, a song in a Tamil movie. Uh, the song is Yenadu Sondamni, Yenadu Pagyumni, Kadal Malarumni, Karuvil Mulumni. Uh, which is from Kanathil Mutamental movie. The lyricist ex, uh, explained uh, uh, the complex uh, complexions in this uh, song as John Dunn explained in his uh, poetry. Next, I have compared the lines of uh, uh, John Dunn, death be not proud, death uh, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, Though for those are not so, for those whom those things though uh, just overthrow, uh, die not for death, nor yet can't though kill me. I compared this uh, po poem by John Dunn uh, with the lyrics of uh, ka lyricist Kannadasan. Save one of Savu Varada, Sangada me one of Sangada Mandati Radha. In that uh, uh, lyricist Kannadasan directly addresses death, like John Dunn addressed death uh, in. Uh, poem, Death Be Not Proud. Then, uh, to his poem mistress, uh, uh, which was written by Andrew Marvel, 
uh the lyrics are la poem lines are uh, uh, and hundred years should go to price thine eyes and uh, on thy forehead uh, gas uh, 200 ado reach grace uh, but 30000 to the rest um, age at least to every part and the last uh, age should shower her heart i compared this uh, uh, po- this lines uh, by andrew marvel uh, the lyrics of uh, the vairamuthu அவள் கண்களோடு இரு நூற்றாண்டு மூக்கின் அழகோடு முன்னூறாண்டு சாங் ஃப்ரம் தி மூவி உயிரை ஸோ லைக் வைஸ் வி கேன் கம்பேர் தி போயன்ஸ் ஆஃப் இங்கிலீஷ் லிட்ரேச்சர் வித் தி சாங்ஸ் இன் மதர் டங் தட் வில் தட் வில் மேக் தி ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் இன் அ வே ஒன் வே ஆர் அதர் இங்கிலீஷ் பொயிட்டிக் லைன்ஸ் அண்ட் தமிழ் லிரிக்ஸ் ஆர் தி சேம் திஸ் மே ஹெல்ப் தி டீச்சர் Uh, who teaches poetry to make the students enjoy the poetic form comparing the poetic lines with uh, uh, the uh, such uh, mother tongue film songs uh, makes the students uh, to understand the forms uh, figures of speech metaphors and expressions used by the poet uh, films immediately are uh, narratives uh, but uh, students may not uh, see popular movies as anything other than uh, simple ent- entertainment uh, however uh, by teaching students to read and uh, compare movies literature teachers can show students uh, that their favorite movies have some of the same lyric qualities as the books uh, they read and by drawing this comparison between book uh, and the film uh, student will grow in their appreciation of uh, both media film can be an interesting way uh, for teachers to connect uh, sometimes theoretical or abstract course concepts uh, to a world outside the classroom uh, however teachers uh, need to do some advanced work on uh, Uh, take into consideration some possible pitfalls in, in order to ensure that the learning is a learning experience for students thank you thank you thank you so much next i would like to invite ms ranjani yes ma'am uh, good afternoon ma'am so, am i audible ma'am yeah yes you can proceed ma'am um actually i couldn't on my camera ma'am due to some technical issues uh, pardon me ma'am continue ma'am please end your paper within 3 minutes okay ma'am sure 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 ma'am uh, good afternoon to one and all present here i am ranjini assistant professor vb vani parmal college for women virudhunagar and my topic for presentation is quest for identity a comparative study of margaret atwood surfacing and carol shields the stone diaries and then canada is a country in which the problem of defining identity becomes a prominent concern and canadian literature refers to all literary writing produced in canada including the work of immigrant writers and certain temporary residents as well as literature from regions which in the past were politically separate from canada Margaret Atwood explores and explodes patriarchal structures of power and dominion in interpersonal male female relationships in the narrative quest of her women protagonists and typifies the emergence of the strong feminist poetics in the past 60s her novel surfacing depicts a lone woman's desperate struggle to attain the strength that would enable her to refuse to be a victim the narrator is constantly faced with the feeling of separation and aloofness from the outside world and her love marriage incomplete motherhood divorce together made a traumatic experience in her life and the loss of identity is also reflected in the career of her protagonist and she is a living dead she has no name no feeling and no desire to communicate with others the nameless protagonist of um, atwood embarks on such a quest at two levels the search for her real self which is a psychological quest and the other is called a social quest that lessens the alienation between her self and the real world and next uh, i'll come to the second novelist carol and shields uh, who was an american born canadian novelist and short story writer and her novels the stone diaries is epic in scale spanning from the protagonist daisy goodwill flets birth in 1905 to her death at the beginning of the 1990s through the personal lens of one person narrated with humor and pathos the stone diaries subtly tracks feminism throughout the century and through the life of one woman Daisy is a woman of an uncertain identity and her story in which Daisy is caught uh, is one that threatens the very essence of her identity a person arbitrarily named Daisy has a weak sense of self that increases her vulnerability to what oppressive social systems she struggles in her 80th year to keep things straight in her head 
and to keep the weight of of her memories evenly distributed to hold the chapters of her life in order although she recognizes and at times benefits from the freedom of identity based on process and instability she longs to a much greater degree for a transcendent frame of reference for interpreting her life daisy's sense of isolation and meaninglessness suggests that at least for some a stable and centered sense of self or necessary precursors to social engagement whether cultural or otherwise the final image that daisy presents of herself is as a spiritual wanderer without a homeland unable in death to trust the event of her ending just as she had been unable in life to trust the event of her origin and her conclusion captures the paradoxical tragedy of her story there's nothing to see from this window if we conceive of our identity as nothing we remain without the tools to create nothing comes of nothing and perhaps we had better speak again thus in the stone diaries the novel's experimental dissembling of the genre of photobiography it's focus on an average and usually forgotten middle aged women and the existential questions about the nature of identity and the definition of the self that lie at the heart of the work all come in for praise so on the whole the existential predicament is uh, strong and stable in both the novels of margaret atwood surfacing and carol shields the stone diaries and daisy struggle to find a place for herself in her own life is a parading of the unsettled decades of our era thank you ma'am thank you ma'am i would like to call upon kp vinila good afternoon ma'am am i audible ma'am yeah, yes you can continue ma'am yes ma'am please sum up your presentation in 3 minutes yes good evening everyone i am vinila working as an assistant professor in the department of english at triple b college uh, for women my topic for the presentation is psychological drama of sheila's behavior changes in defining contextual and collective identities in one child by jory hayden uh jory hayden is a specialized and a high school teacher who has recorded her problem in the classroom in the series of blackbuster books since 1979 she currently lives in northern wales where she continues her working a child brain brains according to the scientist is similar to that of the sponge a gangster will absorb every detail of so absorbed by the environment much as the porous object absorbs liquids one child is a moving story about six year old girl whose innocence is threatened hayden a caring instructor asserts sheila the protagonist in resuming her regular psychological path sheila is introduced as an emotionally troubled and obvious child who has accidentally burnt her three year old neighbor she is brought to hayden because she is the head of the school's special education division hayden despite her as a small nutrient little fragile youngster with unfriendly eyes when she was little hayden recognized her as an emotionally troubled child who is not receiving sufficient care at home she la brought up at the point that she was seeking Vanilla, ma'am, you are stuck up with your presentation. Any network issues? Intelligence. As she replied. Yes, you can continue. She she accepted herself as a young child, and most significantly, she was content with it. This clarifies the reality that children seek simply love and comfort rather than the worldly luxuries that adult crave. Sheila believed in the survival of the fittest, and she had the innocence of the kid. kid by the maturity of an adult. She had the clear understanding of the things which was frequently the naked truth. 
when she, children like Sheila are denied access to the most necessity of their existence, it may appear that they are being treated unfairly in the comparison to the other children. But they will earn for it, and if they do not receive it, the children will fall to stealing. After all, we are all social animals, and it is never the fault of the children if their parents fail to teach them good and bad habits. Sheila grew up without mother and, and with a drunken father. I conclude my presentation by saying the psychoanalytic critics identify the psychic context, the literary work, at the expenses of the social uh, historical context, and prevailing the individual psychodrama about the social drama by a class conflict between the generation siblings or between the complete, uh, completing desires within the same individual, then the larger one conflict between the social classes, for instance. They show how modern subjectivity observes and at times subvents the sex gender system patterning by revealing how it is constructed by the sex gender system. They demonstrate how from the beginning the novel pitied the socially unknown and compelled self against one of the suffers from an even sized up the problem brought by and constraint. Psychological drama, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, complex post-traumatic disorder and tendency for further victimization as an adult for all the possible outcomes of sexual harassment in children. Sexual harassment includes grooming children's instead exposure and exposing them to the pornography. Because teasing isn't limited to the family, children should be taught age approximate sex education as well as good and bad touch from the early age. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. Next, we would like to have Taslima Yasmin, assistant professor from Madhur, to present her paper. Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I may add audible, ma'am? Yeah, yes, very well. Thank you, ma'am. I am S. Daslima Yasmin, working as an assistant professor of English at Kodar Mahedin College, Adhram Batinam. I am going to present a paper on Depiction of Nigerian Women in Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Select Novels. The contribution of Nigerian women was incredible to the literary development of the country in all the journals, journals of literature. The first published Nigerian women was Flora Naupa. Efuru in the year 1966 was her first novel which redefines the place of the women in the structure of belongings and that set the tone for those of other female writers. In comparison to the female writers of old generation, the new generation female writers have arguably gained more reflectiveness, especially writers like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who won the Orange Prize for her novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, in the year 2007. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie portrays the place of women characters of the Nigerian society in her works. The works of Adichie are set in the colonial and post-colonial Nigeria before, during and after the Nigerian civil war and some of its parts are set in America. Nigerian women in the works of Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie face numerous challenges as they attempt to establish their place in the society. Various research have been done in the field of African literature and on the works of African female writers, but this paper explores portrayal of Nigerian women with reference to the selected works of Adichie. The portrayal of women in the works of Adichie is relevant to feminism, racism and womanism too. In the works of Adichie, women relentlessly struggle to achieve much desired freedom from the rules of tradition, socio-political and economic disempowerment, male oppression and racial distinction. In the materialistic atmosphere of 21st century, every human being and especially women are searching their identities and independence, mentally as well as physically. Her first novel, Purple Hibiscus, portrays Nigerian women characters are affected by violence, gender discrimination, and trauma. Women are being tortured and passed through emotional trauma. Female children are seen as lower to male ones. The novel uses a women character, Kambili, who is, the, uh, who is, who is there to tell the story. Other major women characters are Beatrice Kambili, Beatrice, which is Kambili's mother, and Ifeoma, Kambili's aunt, and the market women. 
the protagonist of the story and these other characters provide the portrayal of women who are affected due to violence gender discrimination psychological pain and end slavery committed in their lives Eugene believes his children Jaja and Kambili to be devoted servants of Catholicism who excel at schools various Okonko another character in the story expected his son Nove to become tough and fear fearful person Eugene uses violence to compel Kambili and Jaja into following religion as a reference for a well mannered life in the process of shaping children's future and in her second novel half of a lesson which portrays nigerian women characters as struggling to keep their families hopeful even when the country is going through a civil war in half of a lesson women are depicted as resolute and progressive they give direction when and where necessary and guide their men and society in time of difficulties Adi Chief this novel describes yet another type of struggle from which the female characters seek their freedom just as in purple hibiscus the atmosphere in half of a lesson is very stifled and sheer destruction Adi Chief's second novel therefore records the multiple struggles of women to free themselves from sexual abuse exploitation corruption humiliation civilian attacks mass evacuation depression hunger disease and even death among the preceding conditions sexual assault against women remains the most harrowing and the most shameful of women's experiences Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I would like to con- conclude, ma'am. To put in a nutshell, this research work studies the Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's three major novels, Purple Hibiscus, Half of Ellison, and Americano. It's a woman's character's portrayal under the light of feminism. Adi Chief's women fight with full of dignity and come out as warriors to see better future of Nigerian women. Adi Chief's novels are instruments of self-recovery and of healing for the abused women in Nigeria who may have undergone some traumatic experiences in their marriages. However, Adi Chief projects womanhood in a positive light. She upholds female potentialities which the patriarchal structure has repressed. This reveals that Adichie and her female characters form the progressive voices calling for change in the way society treats women and the marginalized. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I would like to call upon Kushi, student from Jammu and Kashmir, to present her paper. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, you can continue. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Kushi, student of semester second from JCW Parade, Jammu and Kashmir. So my topic is English to English, the mindset. English to English is the made, uh, movie about new generation who feels proud in speaking English and prefer to be in that company where allies speak English only. So Shashi is a housewife. She is literate but not English speaking lady. Her children hate her and her husband ignores her only because she does not know English. Once she visited her children's school, there her children advised her not to speak to anyone because she does not have knowledge of English language. Anyhow, Shashi managed the thing in her own way. Meanwhile, Shashi get invitation of her sister's daughter marriage. fixed in america so she has to go and she goes there in america so she impressed everyone there by her cooking skills so she and her nice become good friends she suggested her to join an english speaking institute and so she joined slowly and slowly so she began to understand english language in institute she got many friends and she learned many new things from them now the day of competition of course is coming near and the wedding day is also coming closer so she balanced both the places she is cooking delicacy at home and in learning and is learning english at institution her family arrived for wedding now the chance in appearing in final exam is bleak she denied her teacher that she would not come for final exam 
but she did one thing good for herself that she invited her teacher and colleagues for wedding on wedding day everything goes well during fest time when everyone sat to share wedding delicacy someone invited shashi to express her view point on marriage shashi spoke with confidence in english everyone was shocked and impressed even her husband and children astonished to listen her english speech after her speech her teacher applauded shashi and conferred her a certificate that certificate does not matter whatever shashi expressed in english was her certificate through this movie director wanted to convey one should learn english but a um, but a hindu uh, hindu language hindi language is far more better and sweeter than foreign language we should need to shed this prejudice from our minds thank you yeah thank you so much next i would like to call drishti mukherji from west bengal to present her paper yes ma'am uh, am i audible yeah yes you can proceed okay um ma'am i am going to share my screen uh is my ppt visible okay good afternoon everyone first of all i would like to thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my paper here the title of my paper is nothing remained but a blasted stump an eco critical reading of frankenstein we will start with a brief introduction mary shelley wrote frankenstein as a part of a ghost story writing competition and he wrote this novel at the age of 18 before writing frankenstein mary shelley had already experienced the torment with the early deaths of three of her four children this novel shows how victor tries to create a new life almost usurping the female power and thus challenges the natural law and suffers the consequences throughout the novel nature plays a very important role which highlights supernatural in natural eco criticism and a brief introduction to the theory william brooker coined the term eco criticism in his 1978 essay literature and ecology an experiment in eco criticism The ecocritics study the works to find out representations of nature in writing, adverse effects on nature, nature in its violent form, and role of human in destroying nature. Now we will start with the discussion of nature in Robert Walton's letters. In most of the cases in the novel Frankenstein, nature is in a bad mood. Robert Walton in the first letter. feels happy and delightful amidst the icy landscape because as an explorer he is in sheer excitement of uncovering new land nature is filled with frost and snow and walton is suffering from loneliness the cold breeze which delighted him earlier now appears as dreadfully severe in the next letter nature is again icy cold and in such an ominous setting Walton meets Victor Frankenstein who is also devastated due to the chilly cold weather nature in the first volume of the novel though victor is a man of science he loves nature he wants to learn the mysteries of creation and the secrets of nature here mary shelley introduces a stormy weather the thunder and lightning has burnt down an oak tree This destructive image foreshadows something uncanny in his unnatural obsession with occult sciences. It is from this nature that he channelizes the energy of electricity from lightning to raise the dead. Victor finds the possibility of creation in this destructive image but actually it will be disastrous for him too. Victor wants to create new life and that is why he collects dead body parts. He tries to create new life by violating the law of procreation and nature is the only witness to his labor. In a perfect gothic setting the monster is born. Again there is winter sign of ominousness. Mary Shelley's writing I am quoting it was already 1 in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes and my candle was nearly burnt out. 
when by the glimmer of half extinguished light i saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open unquote the moonlight is dim and yellow which indicates the fatality of victor's creation after receiving the news of william's death when victor arrives at geneva again nature is worse and the flash of lightning now reveals the truth that the monster has murdered his own brother william now nature in the last two volumes of the novel nature is again restless in the second volume now victor prefers loneliness because he considers himself responsible for the death of william and justine nature makes victor happy and when he is away from nature he feels discomfort and depressed the monster begins his tale in a stormy weather the same nature gives shelter to the creature also he learns so many things and now feels happy with the arrival of spring but at the same time when he was driven away by delacy family he again feels isolated and tormented after the murder victor identifies the monster in the same pale yellow light of the moon in the conclusion of my paper i must say that nature in the novel appears as a fragile moral concept of ambiguous implication the monster represents the secrets of nature mary shelley though victor's closeness to nature brings in the vogue of romantic movement of the late 18th to mid 19th century thank you well presented ma thank you next i would like to call arzu haji ample research scholar from shaurashtra university gujarat good afternoon all i am arzu haji from saurashtra university rajkot gujarat uh, my paper uh, first of all i would like to thank the organization for providing uh, this uh, opportunity to me uh, my paper is titled as shatranj ke khiladi the timeless film of indian cinema uh, we know that films that are often considered as uh, visual texts and literature are part and parcel of society in which they are produced so there are few indian films that have truly reflected the time uh, in which they are made and because of its capacity uh, to catch audience uh, attention of audience till date uh, they are called uh, timeless films the ni- uh, 1977 film shatranj ke khiladi by uh, one of the uh, in- cinema astro uh, satyajit ray is one of the timeless films of indian cinema talking about brief of the film the film begins in one of the evenings of 1856 when british india british east, uh, east india company was uh, trying to uh, colonize india and their last uh, aim is to capture avadh uh, and uh, seize uh, and capture the king or uh, king uh, the nawab uh, wajid ali shah um, in the film we see two characters meer and mirza played by sanjeev kumar and said jafri uh, these two are arist- aristocratic uh, landlords they are playing chess uh, constantly they are uh, playing chess and they are not paying attention to their uh, their, their duties towards their families and homes uh, on the other level uh, east india company is also trying to uh defeat uh, the king and seize the, capture the city uh, there uh, over so we can see that the chase the game of chess is play, playing on two levels and at the end we see that uh, chandra uh, captain uh, of the east india company is, has captured the uh, king uh, and uh, this meer and mirza are still playing chess but at the end we see them quarreling and at the end they are ashamed of their deeds and they uh, they accepts the reality they accept the reality that they can't even cope up with their life their own life and their wives so how they could cope up with the, their duty towards india there are few elements that uh, makes it a period film uh, the film provides a kind of paradigm to study a political instability of the period due to internal con- conflict and due to external conflict of political structure we can sense the future of kingdom uh, there are many scenes where king is highly immersed in a poetry literature drama and painting all these things instead of paying attention to his own uh, statesmanship 
so uh, even when, at the end when he is captured we see we can listen him uh, murmuring his own po- po- poetic lines when he says that chhod chale jo lakhnav nagri kaho hal adam par kya guzri that can be loosely uh, translated as as i left my beloved town of lakhnav look what i have to endure so this king is highly immersed in uh, art literature painting and music so while analyzing the film we can accurately find that the subplot of this political move is not only important for a historical perspective but it also important to dig out the political condition of that uh, that time so th- this film is kind of allegory uh, that talks on the uh, on a uh, one level it talks about game of chess but on the larger level it is uh, actually allegory of uh, uh, britishers uh, who are trying to capture india and uh, ray tried uh, ray uh, it is ray's only only hindi film so uh, as ray uh, and ray has uh, traveled across the country and to london to capture the exact scenarios uh, plots costumes languages uh, to portray all these things exactly on the screen so it can be stated that the film is exactly extremely riveting of that uh, it doesn't provide us a single uh, opportunity to take, to take our eyes off the screen in for a, even a single minute uh, and the, every single frame of the film reminds us about the bygone era so it can be in conclusion it can be said that it can uh, be stated that this historical drama offers us a vision of india a uh, standing on the brink that would be sooner captured by the britishers the film is absolutely political that pictureizes the pe- uh, particular period and uh, it shows ray's ingenious use of chess as a mot- metaphor that, par- <laughs> that parallels the cunning moves of the east india company to seize the nawab of avid although the po- plot deals with the heavy issues ray deals it with the light touch without using a single dramatic scene or any villains or any heroes the film is beautiful beautifully shows uh, as uh, the particular passage from history but ray's master skill has translated it an evergreen saga ray's skillful or uh, treatment to the subject and important commentary on the semantic systematic aristocratism of uh, british india in india and his adaptation of premchand's story into full fledged political historical film it is indeed a tragic tale of the particular period of india that has acquired uh, an timeless place in the history of india thank you yes, thank you thank you so much for giving us a different view next i would call upon e amuda phd research scholar from chennai ma'am good evening ma'am are my audible yes you can proceed yeah ma'am i share my screen please make it into 3 minutes yeah 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 more presenters are waiting and we are already running short of time it's 4:45 please stick on to the time ma'am is it is it visible ma'am is it visible Yeah, it has started sharing, but we don't see the PPT. Okay, ma'am. Anyway, I'll do it, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Ma'am, shall I start? Yeah, please. Yeah. Good evening to all. My topic is a study: the novels of Kaveri Nambisan from a feminist perspective, as her women characters are portrayed as strong individuals. In this paper. I I have a plan to explore the novels of Kaveri Nambisan from a feminist perspective. So uh, here I am going to discuss our uh, two important novels of Kaveri Nambisan, which as portrayed a woman co- characters are strong as well as individual. In, the first novel is The Scent of Paper, and then the second one is The Hills of Angeri. The first novel, The Scent of Paper, the protagonist Nanji is depicted as entering a Balyana clan and establishing herself as a confident and influential woman. 
when we are talking about a hills of angeri here the author narrates the tale of nalli it's like a autobiographical novel who managed to strike a balance in her life by asserting her independence even when within the confines of community ties here the author kaveri nambisen women characters display an unwillingness to remain trapped in the dilemma of dependency or subordination and then uh, we will have a analysis of the novels the hills of angeri uh, the author narrates the story of nalli a village girl who dreams to become a doctor and also build a hospital in her village along with her childhood friend jai here we could uh, find the patriarchy um, see though she belongs to a uh, uh hills of angeri she wants to become a doctor but her grandfather is not willing to she he is not uh, permitted to be a doctor as a nalli so nalli is depicted as being very attached to her village especially the hills she believed that myth or story that begins or develops in angeri revolves around the hills that just as the title implies the entire plot revolves around the angeri hills and its village Nalli's father though he he is a headmaster of a school he wants his daughter to study medicine but Aja's grandfather refuses to not to permit her to go for her dream so here we can see a patriarchal figure holds on to the old belief and practices that a woman should be confined to the kitchen but when we are comparing to the words of a um, gayatri uh, gayatri in a word uh, article can the subaltern speak observes that between patriarchy and imperialism subject constitution and object formation the figure of a woman disappears not in a pristine nothingness but into a violent shuffling which is displays figuration of the third world woman caught between tradition and modernization and then in uh, nambisan a doctor by profession she wants uh, she wants nalli to had a defined a goal early in life and had set her mind on becoming a doctor the villagers adore nalli who despite growing up in a village surrounded by people steeped in ancient culture and traditional values when we are moving to the second novel by kaveri nambisan the scent of pepper here the author narrates the story of a family it is a moving epic of the life and times of nanji here the character nanji throughout the story every character all characters of naka very nambisan is related to as well as connected to the novels by marrying a kalyanda family uh, she has an agreement to continue all the works at uh, home Uh, what we call as a domestic and then as a result nanji exhibits a strong sense of duty and unshakable relationship with her surroundings throughout her life nambisan has represented nanji's character so beautifully that she acts as a magnet drawing the readers attention to her strength integrity and practical approach to life in her works kaveri nambisan construct a world in which she seeks to free her characters from their marginalization her character fight against being marginalized in order to obtain emancipation and create their identity especially the female characters who are highly active and know how to keep their individuality as well as their contribution and uh, duties to their own world nambisan expresses a concern for women's persecution while also acknowledging that resistance to oppression is not overlooked in their fictional world to be conclude my part uh, nalli in nambisan's the hills of angeri being a doctor by profession however she portrayed as being financially independent and so in a position to blossom into a full fledged person with a self respect and emotional ideals that are balanced by social obligations and then when we are moving to the other one the scent of paper here she has uh, given as a hard worker as well as a powerful woman in the society both the characters can be seen as a helping them, themselves and evolving as women of integrity and professionalism in their own right and can be compared to anita desai's main character where shall we go this summer as they share a desire to free themselves for all social and familial entanglements thank you thank you thank you so much i like to invite m ganjini from sdmp vaishnav college women 
from paper to present the paper. Yes, ma'am. Yes, shall I begin, ma'am? Because somebody is still presenting. Um, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, good evening to everyone. I am Evangeline Nightingale, working as an assistant professor in the Department of English in a well reputed institution called uh, SDNB Vaishnav College for Women, Crompet, Chennai. And the title of my paper is An uh, In Depth Review of the Indescribable Grace and Feminine Gentility as Manifested in the Novels uh, The Scarlet Letter and the Dark Holes No Terror. So let me begin uh, uh, my presentation. I'll only take uh, five minutes and leave the platform for the other presenters to present their papers. And uh, so we all know uh, what kind of society that we all live in. It's a gender biased society. And uh, though many may claim women have achieved equality and equal rights in many areas of their lives, I would still say that uh, uh, women are still being treated as the beasts of burden and objects of pleasure, right, groomed right from their childhood to be uh, sold into the hands of the patriarchal society. That is still there. And generally, women are considered as a weaker sex and inferior to men. And uh, with a lack of space to raise their opinions and or to, to, to voice out their opinions, um, they, they tend to become voiceless throughout their lives. And not only that, and uh, they, even their, their duties are so very confined within the, uh, the domestic sphere of being in the kitchen, cooking, taking care of their children and doing household chores and so on. And we can see how their, uh, their roles are very much restricted and limited um, uh, you know, within the confined atmosphere because they are labeled as uh, marginalized by the dominant ones. And uh, But I would like to assert the fact that the society's way of uh, perceiving women as uh, marginalized or as a subordinates wouldn't make them one because I feel that women are something more and, and they, they are capable of achieving something more than what the society have taught them to be. So in both the novels have taken for study, the protagonist women characters there, they have proved that they can achieve excellence beyond the skill of a man. And not only that, especially without the support of their male counterparts, they were displaying their feminine gentility and indescribable grace as a strength to overcome any kind of conflict or any kind of tribulations that they are forced to encounter, that they are forced to uh, you know, experience. And so I would like to give two examples to, to substantiate how this uh, indescribable grace and feminine gentility has been manifested in the characterization of two of the women characters, that is Hester Prin and Sarita. So uh, to begin with, I would like to say, uh, I would uh, like to quote from uh, um, the Dark Holes No Terror. There is this protagonist woman called Sarita. She is a doctor by profession and her husband is a, uh, is a professor. So initially when the novel begins its course, everything seems to be so very normal and uh, life is so very beautiful for the, the, the two of them. And what happens is uh, the moment Sarita is given all the attention by her neighbors and her, when her dignity as a doctor is uplifted by, uh, you know, as uh, in the society, and uh, there comes a conflict between the husband and the wife. So uh, it, 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 it's more like uh, the husband, he, he is not at all interested in uh, his wife getting appreciations and adulations from the outside world. So what happens is in the during the night hours, he, he, he turns out to be a complete sadist and he tries to sexually assault her. But uh, during the daytime, he turns out to be a complete stranger and he acts like as if nothing has happened the previous night. So this is happening. And this treatment, it, it goes on and on and on. And uh, Sarita, uh, there are, uh, she, she, she attempts to talk to her husband and to, uh, you know, uh, to blurt out the truth to him saying that she is not able to stand the dichotomy in his character and uh, but she is not able to do so. So what really happens is like for a feminist reader, she might stand as a uh, uh, representation for the marginalized society because she's not uh, able to raise her opinions against her husband. But I see her differently. And why do I see her differently? It is purely because I would say that she is intelligent enough and she is wise enough to, to have kept her opinions from letting her husband know about it. And uh, if she, she could have just directly gone to her husband and uh, inquired about the previous night tortures, but she is not doing that. She has not done that in the novel, but instead she is keeping quiet. And uh, what I would say is that if she had reacted, things, things would have gone very different because uh, she would have lost the love of her husband and she would have uh, destroyed the peace that held the family together. So these things could have happened, but she is remaining quiet. But, but just because she has remained quiet, can we call her a subaltern or can we call her, can we, can we call women a, a marginalized person? If we cannot do so. Because I would say that a woman, she very well knows how to tackle the, the problems that comes uh, in her family and especially within the family sphere. And she very well knows how to get back, uh, uh, you know, her husband's love. So this is one thing. On the other hand, we have another character in uh, Scarlet Letter that is Hester Prynne. One ma'am has already mentioned about uh, that uh, the, the protagonist character. So here again, we see that uh, this protagonist character, Hester Prynne, uh, she is ostracized. She is banished from her society for committing adultery. But the saddest part is the punishment goes to Hester alone and not to uh, the man. 
and the for the reminder of her lies she is sentenced to wear the the mark of shame that is a scarlet with the a on her bosom and just imagine as a lonely woman because she lives a life uh, a secluded life completely away from any kind of human interest and any kind of uh, human relations and with a child in her arms and as a lonely woman she is able to establish herself well with whatever slender means that is available to her so that was so surprising because as a woman she is able to bring up her kid without the support of the man who has a temp- did her to the grievous fall so that is so very uh, something uh, uh, you know so amazing so very amazing about women so uh, ha- here in these two characters we can see how the indescribable grace and feminine gentility has been manifested in these two women characters because uh, um, uh, in in both the novels we can see the gender conflict uh, uh, being so very intense but i would say that the women's strength the female strength here is much more than that of the male's character so as a result what happens is the the male protagonist he begins to lose his dominant position so though we might say um women uh, can be i mean women are uh, you know we women might be considered as a ge- weaker gender but uh, at the way i see it and the way the writers have seen women in their writings in their novels uh, i would say that women have plenty of power so uh, it's actually uh, um, you know it's uh, the the paper is completely it's for the women's empowerment and i would say as a woman i feel proud and uh, many of the presenters here have talked about women and i i i really feel proud of them too so that that's how i would like to conclude my paper and thank you so much for patient listening thank you thank you next we would like to have reshma raju from kanyakumari to present her paper Reshma Raju, ma'am, are you there? Okay, then we will just move on to the next one. Danya K. Aston, professor from Guru Nanak College, Chennai. Yes, ma'am. You can start presenting. Yes. Yeah. Good evening to one and all present here. On to the time. Thank you. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Good evening to one and all present here. The title of my paper is The Significance of Constructing a Non-Hierarchical Worldview in Eco-Poetry Using Prospopia by Analyzing Dennis Lavato's Aware. So I'd like to start the presentation by uh, talking about uh, the need to construct a non-hierarchical worldview in eco-poetry. to construct a non hierarchical world view so throughout the centuries we as human beings have not just undergone a change as a species but we have also changed our environment in a way that benefits us with all the scientific and technological advancement today we have reached a position where we can use science to improve and to modify not just our environment but also nature in a way that we desire in this process we have started assuming that everything on the earth exists only to uh, serve us and very often we fail to attribute any significance to the non human nature outside its utility uh, we we have also uh, forgot that we ourselves are a part of nature's creation and we have started separating ourselves nature from uh, us it has always been man versus nature man versus wild etc so this separation and this false sense of superiority endorses binarism and this thinking is the root cause for the n number of problems environmental challenges that we are facing today so hence it is important for us to disrupt the uh, binarism for a better future and the role that eco poetry plays in disrupting this binarism is immense as i have put it on my slide uh, eco poetry presents nature as a separate and equal other it uh, it highlights the non human dimension of the text and it conveys how human beings can experience their lives in a non binary holistic fashion eco poets uh, use a eco poets use a particular technique called prosopopia in their poems in order to break this binarism so what is prosopopia prosopopia in simple terms it's synonymous to personification where you uh, imagine the object speaking or acting you attribute human qualities emotion and personality to the non human so the reason why the eco poets use a uh, prosopopia is they believe that it enables us to identify ourselves with the other and uh, they believe that it will enable us to uh, empathize with the other but critics like paul de mar uh, 
accuse prosopopoeia for its imaginary status that is uh, in these poems the poet becomes a visionary poetic visionary who can hear the voice of the object or a no, or any non human so the even though the poem even though in the poem the non human becomes a subject it is only through the imagination of the poem poet or the poet persona do we get the perspective of the non human so in this way it is the human that retains the centrality of the poem even though the subject of the poem is a non human and this is why paul de mon says that uh, it 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 furthers the split uh, even while it tries to uh, break the binarism hence this is a very problematic trope that's what his argument says but i i would say that even though his argument seems very convincing i would say that we cannot uh, apply uh, his argument to uh, all the works like for example if we take the works of poets like dennis lavoto gary snyder or other such poets we definitely cannot apply a uh, his argument to their poems because they have a political motive behind political motive uh, for using this particular technique so dennis lavoto as most of you would have known is a british american poet she is one of the poets who try to construct a non hierarchical world view through her poetry i have used uh, the poem aware from her uh, book this great unknowing last poems i don't think i have the time to read the poem or to explain it uh, i have put it on the slide so please take a minute and read the poem in this poem uh, she the poet persona frames herself as an intruder who intrudes the conversation of the wine leaves uh, this demonstrates a radical change in attitude towards non human she projects the non human as an autonomous free spirit with rights and values the wine leaves value privacy as much as we do most importantly the poet persona is able to recognize and acknowledge that they are capable of communicating this recognition happens only when she realizes that she is surrounded by nature that is beyond her understanding so this awareness is very important for us in today's world to value and to appreciate the non human and to understand that the non human is as alive and animate as we are but unfortunately our knowledge and our attitude towards the non human depends entirely on the way our culture perceives and our culture cap and and our culture has captured it for us these narratives define our understanding of the nature like maithili ma'am rightly pointed out uh, when she was talking about language literature and culture the change in one will definitely reflect a change in the other so these poems will definitely enable us to recognize the emotions rights and values of the non human nature even when it seems incom incomprehensible thank you thank you tanya ma'am next we would like to have darshanyani research scholar from madurai ma'am uh, good evening ma'am so everyone uh, good morning uh, i am audible ma'am Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You can. Ah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good evening to and all present here. So I would like to thank you all of you. Uh, so uh, I uh, I am going to present here uh, conflicts between reality and illusions. Kamala Mark and Ayer's uh, novels. So Mark and Ayer's statement is a proof positive that a sensibility which in uh, for a writer solutions is more definitive. offer is our higher identity than nationality the most sticking features of mark and ayer's fiction is the concept of cultures continuity in the din and bust of social economic and political changes in modern india so a yeah, unitary complex of uh, interacting assumptions modes of thoughts uh, habits uh, and styles uh, which are uh, connected in secret as well as over ways with the practical arrangements of your society and which because they are not brought to consciousness so and then so that uh, the theme of mark and ayer's fifth novel a handful of rice in 1967 picks up the thread of uh, freedom and responsibility as uh, represented in her very first novel nectar in save so 1957 the forces of changes that have been sweeping across india are too strong to be ignored so and the mark and ayer's characterizations is clear in the light of the culture and the social 
process and achieves a meaning within the mode of life that she depicts so mark and ayer's characters in a return of society can progress to an awareness at least partially of the positive freedom as the ideal state of their consciousness within the circle of tradition and duty and then uh, the ent- i mean okay the transference displacement and alienations uh, constitute the post colonial experiences of not only of the india's uh, settled or born abroad uh, but also of the indian in india due to the western impact so uh, uh, she does not uh, shows favor either to the east or the west uh, rather she brings to light the various point, points of weakness and the strength of both the cultures through the ices of the east she looks at the west and uh, through the ices of the west she looks uh, at the east so thank you ma'am i am audible ma'am yes ma'am ah thank you ma'am thank you thank you for all thank you next we have s vidya phd research scholar from puducherry okay. good evening to one and all present here the title of my paper is sexual exploitation in humanness of social and political instruments in rastakunda vishwanatha shastri we read the cows are coming so uh, sexual abuse is a vehement against the men women are the victims of harassment and it is still a prevalent problem in this particular community it is a deprivation of women rights that requires a social protection violence has many forms of sexual exploitation of its both physically and mentally rastakunda vishwanatha shastri do where the cows are coming discuss about a woman named mashema who is sexually maltreated by a landlord she is a lower class woman who is brought beaten by her master she is a victim to the social and political power of the upper class landlord this paper throws light on the injustice done to lakshmi by rajayogi padanyaram it discusses on women insurgent against power she underwent psychological problems due to the excessive pressure she was considered as a mad at the beginning and later people started to treat her as a god the author rachakanta vishwanath shastri has sharply designated the journey of her character lakshmi from being a mad mother to goddess marini mahalakshmi The exploitive system is clearly illustrated in this novel and it also depicts the social and political conditions that prevail in the society during the period. Rachakunta Vishwanath is a Telugu writer whose writing mostly focuses on the marginalized class people. The novel was translated by Aladi Uma named Sridhar from Telugu to Govilashtami Jagrada into English as Vive the Cows of Amma. The translator Aladi Uma named Sridhar composed many conservative works of English translation. The upper class landlord has a great standing in society and Radhavadi Padanyaru was one of them. Lakshima belongs to the subordinate community. She was sexually stressed by the master and was abducted by him. As a woman, she suffered a lot and many women considered her not as a feeling but as a golden idol of Radhavadi Padanyaru. She also resembles to them as if she is the originator of the universe. She belongs to the lower class but she is audacious to fight against anything. So, sexual harassment is a violence against women. and this novel discusses about the overpowering and exploitation of women she was silenced for a long time when she was sexually distraught but when the injustice was done to her son she could not tolerate it but become fierce uh, education culture and birth of wealth lacked to lakshmi he never had a plan to marry till she saw lakshmi in a village club house so uh, tragedy in human life is indiscernible when she was considered substandard political impact also affected her a lot radhavaki twisted the plot that kada people has influenced defend it so that they lied that lakshmi is guilty i believe it was clearly stated to the officials in the secret special report that it was not a political fight that people naturally protested against the cruel manner in which a lower caste person was subjected by an upper caste man with the evil intention of ruining her that everyone naturally felt that the local police had wronged the people who had filed cases were refraining from taking action against the crime committed and also by making up the security cases against those of his life and most importantly that the lower class people were in about were unhappy about this uh, so everyone has a misgiving but nobody has a proof that radhavi has abducted her 
in her family members to make fight and then started to fight against him but he killed all the family members so in this case is everywhere he says the people has written this on him and so they carry things about him radhabani says that he would by the false statement and most of the questions that it is not political problem but a social one and with a proper proof they stopped the action radhabani tried his best to come out of the issue but the lower class people gave him the same the lower class people gave him his fortune because lakshmi is one of them and she needs to get the justice the collector said to him if you don't appear to have taken proper action we will be forced to resign from our job so this response from that issue actually made it to start uh so we can in this novel we can see that the fierce struggle of women is exploited too when she attacks radhabogi like a female bima and the servants gather to celebrate sita said that she resembles like a female nasima and in this novel the author has presented two category people so the two category people are highlighted in the novel the author has mentioned them as people who eat and people who are eaten so the servants and the lower class people are not treated like servants Often the comparisons over the mythological character, and this kidnap was almost compared with Ravana or the Sita. Could you please sum up your paper? Ah oh, yes, no, my dear. So thus the novel ends with the open end whether the sun was found or not. Lachima who went in search of him to the mountain never returned. Thus the paper attempts to throw light on how Christian crime turns into a political one. He used his influence to tackle women in a violent manner, and so his troubles get worse. Lachima tolerated his stimulating behavior, and she protested when her son was when her son was violated. Rajapogi has uh, used his political influence as an escapism, but at the end, death was the punishment for his crime. So, thus, the author has presented the women character who fought against abuse and exploitation and attacked victims. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Next, we have a Divya Bharati. Assistant professor from Trichy to present her paper. Ma'am, please stick on to three minutes. Okay, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, audible, and your screen is visible. Please continue. Stick on to three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. The paper uh, entitled "Context-Based Teaching Grammar: An Experiment." It helps English language teachers to teach grammar in a more interesting way. The experiment. by me a divya bharati assistant professor department of english shri madandavan arts and science college trichy i have chosen reported speech as a grammar component to conduct my experiment there are many approaches among them i have chosen a pragmatic approach to teach reported speech uh, to the students of third b english the experiment is an attempt to prove how pragmatics can be helpful in teaching context based grammar pragmatics of course we know the study of language in social context the aim of the experiment the main aim is to help the learners to move from rule based grammar to context based one and to shift their focus from words to sense while transforming uh, reported speech and to help them to communicate in idiomatic english and to create in the minds of the learners the impression the good impression that grammar is a solution and not at all a problem A detailed survey was conducted. The books of uh, Pitcock, uh, Renan Martin, and Raymond Murphy were studied thoroughly, and uh, these uh, books proved to be a traditional and structuralistic approach. And this experiment proved to be a practical one, and uh, how we can teach grammar in our context. So the experiment started with a diagnostic test, and after conducting the test, I came to know that students uh, were conditioned to use. only words in the transformation they concentrated on the words and they practiced that transformation was done only on the words so it turned out to be a verbatim transformation i have conducted some six uh, sessions for interactive sessions i used some of the exercises to make them uh, use sense in their transformation so their focus was gradually shifted from words to sense the interpretation was made about the interactive sessions they gradually unlearned their previous learning of rule based uh, reported speech and they have started learning context based one and cognitive dissonance proved to be an intrinsic motivation they had this conflict in their mind whether to follow the previous learning of a uh, rule based one or the new one the context based one and they have obviously chosen the second one and students realized that language is the network of choices and they made choices in a right way 
and they understood that the sense is more important in reported speech than the words and finally i have conducted an achievement test their response was noted and interpreted and i have collected feedback and i made a comparative study between diagnostic test and achievement test and out of 20 students 16 students got the sense in achievement test and it, in a heterogeneous group it proved to be a great success to conclude the intervention which i made proved to be a success as we go by results so the results are encouraging now we can have much scope to explore other components in grammar uh, to teach in a pragmatic approach and students now aware of the value of grammar primarily as a solution yes thank, thank you. you all thank you so much for a short and crisp presentation next i would like to call j priyanka research scholar phd from puducherry j priyanka from puducherry okay we will move on to the next next we have r sneha from tiruchirappalli am i audible yes ma'am audible ma yes ma'am ma am i audible yeah yes you can proceed yes ma'am shall i share Yeah. Hope my screen is visible, ma'am. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ars Neha, third year English from Kaveri College for Women. Autonomous Tuchi. My topic is uh, exploring ecofeminism in Kamala Markandeya's lecture in the scene. Ecofeminism. Ecofeminism is a branch of feminism that shows the connection between the woman and the nature. The term ecofeminism was coined by French feminist Francio de Eboin. Ecofeminism shows the connection between the suppression of the female and the exploitation of nature. Ecofeminist uh, eco writers convey that uh, the natural qualities of the women and the feminine qualities of nature are possessed by the males, which had resulted in the domination. Ecofeminist philosophy extends uh, extends the family of feminist critics of socialism of domination. Ecofeminists consider land as women because of its fertility that gives the life, and it was owned by the men as a property. Because of this, a uh, feminist made a comparison to understand the similarity of the nature and the uh, sorry similarity of the nature of man dominance over female and the dominance of the land. Kamala Markandeya, she was a great Indian woman writer. She was born in nineteen twenty four in India and died on May sixteen two thousand four in England. Her surname was Kamala Purnia and her married name was Kamala Taylor. She was awarded the National Association of Independent School Award in 1967 and the Asian Prize in 1974. These were some of the works of Kamala Markandeya. Kamala Markandeya's Nectar in the Sea is a story about a woman, Rukmini, and her family. Ecofeminism in Nectar in the Sea. Kamala Markandeya's Nectar in the Sea is about the life of Rukmini. At the age of twelve, the ecofeminist protagonist Rukmini married to a tenant farmer Nathan. She had a six hours of journey on the bullock cart to reach her husband's house. She shows some concern for the animals, which was narrated by the author Kamala Markandeya as poor beasts. They seem glad of the water, for already their hides were dusty. Rukmini was uh, very much fond with nature, and in the courtyard of her house, she grows some vines. pumpkins planted beans sweet potatoes brinjals and chilies and uh, even she helped her husband in the fields and uh, she has bullocks and milk goat 
uh, here the environment helped the female protagonist rukmani to earn some money and she shares a special bond with the nature when arjun set about the construction of tannery rukmani becomes very sad and she does not like that because the tannery brings uh, more harm to the village and the environment will get polluted the plants will be affected and the price of good goods will be uh, get raised but uh, some were happy with the, the tannery because they will get some money in the tannery so rukmani felt uncomfortable with the construction of tannery she changed uh, her mind because of her family will have a fine wage because rukmani's son arjun and uh, thambi were uh, went to tannery for working due to poverty but uh, very soon they were thrown out by them during the month of june uh, the monsoon rain uh, made a huge disaster all the paddy and other harvests harvests were completely destroyed and the fields were uh, completely covered with water and they do not have any other source for money so they were uh, on the verge of starvation after eight days they went to the field and uh, clear the water from the flooded fields and uh, they caught some fish there and uh, they thought those fish will uh, uh, serve them as a food and their house was completely damaged so rukmani used the coconut leaves to cover the decaying mud walls uh, of the thatched cottage and uh, she strengthened the mud uh, mudded walls by applying the wet clay and again there was a suffering for the family that uh, there is no rain in the village uh, they all suffered from drought the water level was completely uh, dropped and uh, the paddy was dried up and the harvesting uh, harvesting season came uh, but uh, there is no proper growth of paddy due to hunger rukmani's son raja steal uh, the calf skin from the tannery so he was killed and uh, kutti is also died due to malnutrition so environment uh, plays a crucial role of giving monsoon and uh, drought it also played the role of protector and the life giver when nathan and rukmani went to city to meet their son murugan they dis- disguised by the machinized city life they started missing uh, the village life where they live in the direct contact with the environment thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am next we have k vijay lakshmi research scholar from madurai good evening ma'am maitri ma'am good evening patiently you are uh, the conducting the session thank you my topic is aftermath of colonialism in no longer at ease by chinwa hb am i audible ma'am Yeah, yes, you can proceed. Yeah, it shows the impact of colonialism in Igbo society. It affects the customary culture, tradition, religion. The Western impact disturbed African customary society. They lost their identity. The missionaries forced to the conversion. They selected the Igbo society to assist them. At the same time, they opened doors for education, trade, law, and order. The tradition and culture convictions are replaced by materialistic methodologies. they influenced by the modern logos there was a rivalry between moral convictions and new belief system obi okankwa the protagonist of the novel portrayed as a typical example of cross culture this novel demonstrates that the individual and its society are equally responsible for molders their culture patterns the igbo people social occasion became the christian prayer meeting their attention shifted to education from religion they adopted the new identity and culture thus no longer at ease displays the conflict of customary and modern values in the destiny of partitioned nigeria the central character obi okankwa a modern nigerian with western education values grandes goals in view of a european vision of life to change this native society the parts of imperialism undermine the social state of nigeria as a fair Nigeria's mankind was wrapped up by the plots of imperialism that brought about an ethical decay. As we clearly present the society as one that has positive characteristics of its own. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we have P. Kavita, research scholar from Sri Minachi Government Arts College for Women, Madurai.
Arul Dev P. Kavita. Right, we are moving on to the next one. M. Parkavi, Research Scholar from Sri Sharda College of Education, Salem. Yes, ma'am, I am here, ma'am. Yes, you can. Yeah, it's spark coming, ma'am. Sound correct, I'm sorry. Yes, you can. Um, good evening, one another present here. Uh, I am Parkavi, a research scholar, Sri Sharda College of Education from Salem. I would like to uh, tell about my present my paper titled The Importance of Digital Competence in Using Mobile Technology as an introduction. COVID-19, the biggest pandemic crisis, locked the houses globally. Many departments, offices, organizations, including education, railways, agriculture, medicine, affected, remain closed long time. Universities and colleges began to teach or encourage, encourage online teachings, especially through mobile phone. Mobile users gained more benefits, even though the situation is critical from primary to higher secondary teachers started classes with smartphones. Thus, mobile phones given a large performance during COVID-19 pandemic, though it benefited more. On the other hand, it created many problems because of lack of digital competence. Many students and teachers struggled when handling the mobile devices for teaching learning process. So what is digital competence? Digital competence involves the confident and critical use of electronic media for work, leisure, and communication. These competencies are closely related to logical and critical thinking, high-level information, management skills, and well-developed communication skills. Challenges and issues with mobile learning. It is important to consider the issues when using mobile devices and designing the learning environment. Example, networking availabilities, knowledge on e-applications, uses, safety issues, blocking, unblocking, personal data lock screen to secure students and teachers important forms. To avoid and make learning effective, creative, and innovative teacher, teacher need to acquire the competencies, information, communication, content creation, problem solving, and safety. Many research work has shown that the mobile technology is a great tool in our teaching and learning experience. Many who use it only uh, to increase efficiency and not necessarily effectiveness. Though it, uh, technology is powerful platform and it will be used in a lot of a great sectors, uh, great ways to make teaching and learning effective denotes what can be done and what cannot be done is limited. Basically, belongs to creativity of the user. The teacher definitely need digital competency because the mobile phones include so many applications and each has its own features. Applications are different with its functions to know about it. Teachers should be aware of users and its functions. It demands or requires some technical skill along with normal teaching. That is traditional teaching. Smartphone contains audio recording, live polling tools, creating of videos, chat, and online discussion forms. QR code to get through. Teacher should be aware of digital competency for effective learning outcomes. To conclude, there's mobile phones playing an important role in all over the world, especially in India. Nowadays, digital teaching, mobile learning, mobile computing, flipped classroom and cloud computing preferred mostly rather than tra traditional way of teaching. So that digital competency is very essential part in today's classroom teaching for innovative and effective performance of students' learning process. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. And this digital today has made connection between so many of us. Okay, thank you. Next, thank you. we have our Rogini second MA literature from Lady Dog College, Madurai. Good evening, everyone. This is our Rogini of second MA English literature from Lady Dog College. And I would like to present my presentation for presenting my paper. Please stick on to time. Okay, ma'am. Then I'll be presenting like this, sir. That there is no issue, ma'am. So my topic for my paper is Voice for the Voiceless. It's a study on the book Truth About Me, a Hijra Life Story by A. Revati. And A. Revati is a transgender person. And this book can be considered as an autobiography of her. So this book is something, a courageous expression of a transgender person. It shows the growth of her from her childhood to till date. Now she's working as a social worker in an association named Sangma. So in the beginning of her life, she struggled a lot when she found that, that 
she is a transgender the quest for her identity and the crisis which she faced in her life and her drives that is her emotional as well as sexual drives everything is very transparent in this work so this work claims every human that we should give them the respect which they deserve because giving respect to a transgender is nothing about something medical or physical it is all about a human rights issue so it is better to treat a person as a third gender than but calling them as a third gender so we can find many instances in this book where she tells everything very clearly like the abuses she faced from the society her own family and even from the government officials so for obtaining her license she wasn't allowed she wasn't allowed to assert herself as a transgender rather she was given the license in her original name that is dorai sami so born as a man and then got caught the feeling of a woman and then living a life of someone who can never be determined who she is that is the tragedy that is the trauma of her life so the motive of my paper is that we all should be able to know about the trauma the tragedies which is undergone by a transgender person like her and that's all about it thank you thank you i hope we have shushmi mariam vargis from konsu among yes. administrators yes ma'am yes. you can do your presentation yeah in the 3 minutes time yeah ma'am um am i audible yeah yes you can proceed let me share my screen is it seen yeah it will be yeah. visible ma'am please stick on to time yeah i'm susmi mariam i thank you all the organizers i applaud bodhi and nes college for this kind of conference i am susmi mariam assistant professor of department of science and humanities nehru institute of engineering and technology coimbatore so my i the i selected the topic exploring language learning and literature in the context of pandemic as the deadly pandemic ravaged our society the public coped in widely different ways some locked down in isolated communities some throw fluent safety restrictions and many of us uneasily went about their normal routines covering their faces to protect against the disease on a draconian lockdown we were resigned to a life locked inside for several months and pushed into a role we weren't prepared to play through literature and culture we can gain a historical perspective and also to make sense of this disease that's having such a big impact on our lives right now pandemics impact on institutions and people's lives is explored can be explored through literature dr westwater professor of italian and director of uh, italian language and literature program introduced a new class on pandemics in italian literature she says the next generation of pandemic literature is already being written the transformation this transformation fits a literary tradition of using art to reflect on societal upheaval these moments of collective trauma tend to fuel cultural production she said i have a feeling that there will be a flowering of art and literature and music in reaction to this disease as artists reflect on wherever they on where we have been and how we move forward covid 19 has had a major impact on people around the world but how is the pandemic changing our language and the way we communicate after collecting personal recordings from people at the beginning of this crisis and then throughout for at least two years and doing research in pandemic focused 
longitudinal study dr susanna wagner dr betsy sneller of michigan state university college of arts and science said on 5th august 2020 literature is to give voice to people's experiences is an opportunity for people to take a little quiet time to think out loud and to process all the changes big and small that they are going through in the pandemic when you are wearing a mask have you noticed that you use your eyes or your hands to express things that you would have normally done with a smile social isolation is very difficult for a lot of people and our goal is to build a feeling of solidarity through literature we were told to shelter in a place and work from home but online learning only works if everyone has the means and access to a private room a computer and a good internet connection virginia woolf's book virginia woolf's book a room of one son came to my mind as we switched on to this online mode of learning though the pandemic has caused us to be more physically separated we are connected more than ever online this confinement created new ways of connecting that highlight our humanity language classes are most effective when students are exposed to the second language frequently the online format made class participation and class presentations very challenging english as a second language embracing a process a uh, em through this online mode of learning we embrace process oriented pedagogies and for a higher level of technology integration among uh, english as a second language teachers who have adequate professional development opportunities and support preparation of online lessons often involved a huge amount of extra preparation time stress levels have been strongly affected by the changing dynamics of teaching and learning webinars the increased use of technology has resulted in professional development opportunities for teachers around the world both as presenters and as participants we teach who we are so there is an importance for contemplation reflective practice and spirituality in this kind of principle we teach who we are so this offers an original perspective on teacher identity Ma'am, focusing on sorry for the interruption yes thank you so this is a very vast topic actually i let me uh, conclude with this because uh, this is such a big topic it's so relevant uh, it started only last year but it covers a wide range of uh, uh, subject matters wide range of uh, it touches all the aspects of our life so so much of theory and so much of practical lives have been into this Um, yeah yes agreed ma'am agreed it's in need of the art to discuss this topic also yeah. but so uh, uh, there are three points i thought of highlighting that is digital genres and practices second point language for specific purposes pedagogy in the digital age third point language for specific purpose research in the digital age thank you ma'am Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for Thank understanding. You. Thank you. Yes. And now we have V Anushya Devi, research scholar from Shivina Chikomat Arts and Arts College for Women, Madurai. Please present your paper. Good evening to all. This is Anushya Devi, Shivina Chikomat Arts College for Women. Could you be more audible, Anushya Devi, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Yes, start speaking. Then only we can assist you. Okay. The title of my paper is Capital. No, you are not audible. You are not audible loudly. Sorry, ma'am. Good 
screening ma'am okay continue ma continue okay. the title of my case is capitalism duty for younger special subclass it is not a theory this type of life of post colonial as the same as the colonial one उसमें This novel, the case of Blade, is Jiji was the youngest post model. This novel dramatizes and confronts the debate of capitalist exploitation of the masses by those in privileged positions in independent Kenya. This novel revolves around 519 politics, economics, culture, land, history, and the role of the church in Kenya's struggle for independence. This in this novel, the right advocates with glo- uh, uh, advocates true global independence for Kenya in particular and for Africa in general. But he sees no difference between colonial and post-colonial scenario. The writer does not support capitalism as an abrupt government government system for Kenya and Africa. This novel, Petals of Blood, explores such uh, themes such as the value of Western education and the significance of Christian faith and the effect of colonialism and neo-colonialism on the lives of Kenyans and the disillusionment of independent Kenyan leaders. In order to describe the atrocities of post-independent Kenya, the writer uses the experiences of key figures among the people, such as Munira, Karinga, Abdullah, and Wanja, to portray the plight of the ordinary people in general. Likewise, the writer uses the actions and the misuse of the privileged group to describe the injustices of those in authority. These are expressed through the characters like Raira, Sul, Rigo, and Sulina. But in, the right, uh, in this novel, the writer records uh, cases of corruption and capitalist exploitation of the people by those in authority, with honest and true deeds. The capitalist, uh, uh, the capitalist, or described as powerful businessman who displays real, but uh, small businessmen like Abdullah and Wanda, and Rob Peterson's man. For example, in the case of Abdullah and Wanda's business, we can see their hard work and effort they put to develop their business. They also have the plan to add new expansions in their in their shop, but their dreams are short-lived, and they are uh, soon shattered by the threat of uh, local authorities to action the land by uh, action the land of Yakinwa. That uh, who is on the ground? So Wanda has to buy buy back her family land, and she, she does not uh, she does so at a great expense. She and Abdullah sell their New shop to Vigo, one of the capitalist exploiters, and she uses her she uh, uses her a share of the proceeds to buy back the land. Once again, they wish to develop their business, but they are denied the right to develop the uh, develop their business. But uh, and we soon learn that in order to uh, in order in the order of city council go, go, uh, city council, the permit has been granted to Vigo. This tells how the how those in privileged position rule over others. The exploitation and greedy accusation of wealth by the privileged at the expense of the expense of the people is indeed a nationwide problem. For example, Abdullah's attempt to do business are unsuccessful because he cannot face aggressive tough competition. The capitalists use various means to escape from the fear. Do we further comment on the type of accommodation Abdullah enjoys in this case of exploitation by the government officials? The writer emphasizes the helpless, a helplessness of the poor masses, uh, poor people, at the hands of those in authority, especially women at the hands of those in authority. In a, in many cases, the treatment constitutes sexual harassment. This is especially the character of Wanda, even as a schoolgirl, uh, she is sedu- uh, uh, she is uh, seduced by the married man, who turns out to be the dishonorable Sumeria in the later part of the novel. The, uh, the people of uh, Ilmuruk undergo the strain of a uh, long trot and unable to tolerate the hardship. They decide they decide to let the government share their fate and come to their rescue. They decide to contact uh, contact the government through the MP uh, Rayram. But again, during the journey, jo- Joseph falls ill, and uh, we find Wanja and others seeking help in Lucy home, where some of the men uh, t- tie their hands and behind them and lock them further in the dark. 
the only way uh, is for Avanja is to go to bed with Kimeri again. The, uh, she gives uh, this. Uh, she gives it uh, into Kimeri's demands because uh, because uh, she fears that her refusal will end in Joseph's death and that the mission will fail and everyone will blame her. Another uh, revelation Yugi makes about the plight of the black, especially the young women, is that they are in a, invariably forced into prostitution by economic factors. The right to present a uh, present a responsible uh, uh, people in authority and thus in position of responsibility who have more or less betrayed the cause for which they have been placed in such a position of authority. Raira, MP for Elmer Oak, is presented as an irresponsible MP and he is the symbol of the other equally irresponsible MP. Raira only visits the constituency when seeking votes in election. This is also a problem. He collects money from some people of his con constituency to use for uh, for a water project in Harambi. That's never the uh, of the uh, of the ground. But he can continue to use his uh, money to get uh, to get the loan for his selfish money. In the capitalist system, it is normal to eliminate those who defend the cause of the poor, and Deriva Raida is again the symbol of the meanness of those in authority and who did not hesitate to kill any enemy by fair or rude, rude means. This explains why Derry considers the lawyer as an enemy because it, Could you please sum up your presentation? After uh, African countries gained independence from their colonial masters, people have expected a happy life in African societies, but, but, but it is not, uh, not the case. On the contrary, Africans have made life unbearable for, uh, for others through their selfish desires. Uh, by uh, illustrating all these uh, literary uh, nuances, the writer, uh, and the writer asked the, um, asked the, asked the people to, uh, to not, not to... Not to yield to the uh, need of uh, not to yield to the uh, need of the capitalists. He asked the uh, uh, people to revolt against the uh, fate against the capitalist group. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anisha Devi. Is there any presenter left without presenting? Are you there waiting with us? If there is anyone, you can just let us know. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, hope all the presenters have presented your Completed your presentation? Yes. So we are moving towards the end of the session. Just two lines from me. I feel the search is the distance between an idea and its realization. This is creating a new knowledge, a transformation, I would say. Today, the presenters from Malaysia, Jammu to Kanyakumari, Maharashtra, Haryana, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat clearly shows us that literature transcends boundaries. Seeds of research on multi-literature domains like eco-criticism, eco-masculinism, theater, legalization of prostitution, search for identity, etc., etc., were sown through this international conference. This was made possible in collaboration with an academic institution and an international journal. Thank you, team members from NES Ratanam College of Arts and Science Mumbai and Bodhi International Journal. And acting as a chairperson online or offline, a literature platform always brings in ecstasy and a good feel on sharing and enhancing one's literary knowledge. I personally thank members of NAS Ratnam College of Arts and Science Mumbai and Bodhi International Journal, Dr. Balakrishnan, for this opportunity to join through the online platform for enhancing knowledge. 
and a special mention to all the paper presenters you did well and you have given uh, thought provoking ideas of research domains and wishing you all a grand success in all your future endeavors with this i end my note and that is the announcement for the participants a feedback link has been shared will be shared in the chat box it is mandatory that you fill in the feedback form any other uh, over to the organizers if there is any other informations to be made it could be done thank you for the opportunity given thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am thank you for the good section so we have come to the end of today's session participants the feedback form is on the chat box please ensure that everyone have to fill the feedback form so tomorrow's conference uh, will be uh, processed as per the in invitation schedule so follow the invitation schedule uh, tomorrow the conference will start at uh, morning 10 o'clock as per the schedule the program will be organized participants please ensure that everyone have to fill the feedback form it is on the chat box please fill the feedback form it is on the chat box after completing the feedback you can leave the meeting thank you thank you matli ma'am and thank you jitin for wonderfully conducting the whole program for comparing the session thank you all thank you sir shall i leave sir shall i really leave yes ma'am you can leave